Welcome to this course on Python from in 28 minutes. I am Ranga Karanam and I have been programming for more than a couple of decades. At in 28 minutes, we ask ourselves one question every day. How do we create more effective courses? Our success on Udemy with more than 150,000 students is a result of this pursuit of excellence. I love programming and I would want to help you develop a love for programming as well. In this awesome course with more than 100 steps, you will take your first steps with Python. You will discover how to solve problems using Python. We would solve more than 200 exercises and puzzles to help you understand and learn Python. In this course, we would be using Python 3 and we will be using PyCharm as the IDE. We would start with the basics of programming. We'll understand what are variables, types, methods, loops and conditionals. We'll take a step-by-step -step approach to solving problems by breaking them down into smaller problems. We'll also understand the basics of object-oriented programming with Python. We'll look at different data types in Python as well as what are the different data structures it supports like list, dictionary, set and tuples. We will look at a few inbuilt Python modules as well as we will discuss how to do awesome exception handling with Python. The course takes a hands-on approach with a number of tips, puzzles and exercises. This course comes along with a 150 page PDF guide. The PDF guide would help you to install Python it contains the link to our GitHub repository and for each of the sections in the course, it contains the step-by-step -step details as well as all the code examples that we use during that particular section. The PDF guide serves as a companion for you throughout the course and helps you solve problems. I am excited to bring this course to you. If you are as excited as I am, go ahead and click the enroll button or you can take a test drive by using the free preview feature. I'll see you in the course. Welcome back. In this video, let's learn how to make the best use of the 150 page course guide. You can download the course guide by going to the top left corner and checking out the resources section. You should be able to download the PDF from there or you should be able to click the link and be able to look at this PDF. This PDF contains all the details about the course. How do you install the tools that are needed? What are the different sections in this specific course? And also the code that is used in each of the individual sections. I would like to congratulate you again on making this choice to learn from in 28 minutes. You are joining a set of 150,000 learners who are having awesome learning experiences. This PDF guide is just the next step in providing you with an awesome course experience. The PDF guide contains step-by-step -step details of each section as well as the code for each of these sections. So if you are doing a specific section and you are having a problem with any of the pieces of code, you can look at it in here. So you can take the code from here and make sure that you got it absolutely right. I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun in this course and I look forward to seeing you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's install Python and get up and running with it. Installing Python is really a cakewalk. The PDF guide has instructions on how you can install Python and how you can launch up the Python shell. It's actually quite simple. All that you need to do is type in python download and go to this page. Once you are on this page, you can download the python version for your specific operating system. In this course, we would be using python 3. And if you are on windows, all that you need to do is say download, go to windows and make sure that you are downloading a 3 dot star version. So the latest one which I see here is 3 dot 7. That's good. You need to Download the Windows x86 64 executable installer. Make sure that you are choosing the right file. 
So executable installer is what you need to choose and click on it. And this would start a download. If you're on Mac, all that you need to do is go to the Mac OS X link and download the latest 3.7 or the 3.6 release. So you can download Mac OS 64 bit installer. So if you click this, this would start a download. Once we have downloaded the exe or the package file, you can browse to it in your download folder and install it by double clicking the exe or the package. So just double click on it and the installation should launch up. A quick word of caution on Windows, make sure that you have the checkbox add Python 3.6 to path checked. So this checkbox in here add Python 3.6 to path make sure that you check this box by default it would be unchecked make sure that you check it and then click install now i would recommend you to take all the defaults and go ahead keep clicking next and next and next until you see the success screen once you have installed python we can launch up the python 3 shell if you are on windows you just need to type in cmd command if you are on mac launch up terminal once you have launched up your command prompt or terminal all that you need to type in is a very very simple command if you're on mac type in python 3 and you should see something like this come up if you're on windows or any other operating system then the command you need to type at the command prompt is python you don't need the 3 so for mac it's python 3 for windows and other operating systems it's python once you type that command in you should see Python 3.6 present in here. Any version of Python 3 should be good for doing this course. Once you do this, then you're all set. This is how you launch a Python shell. Whatever you're looking at here is a shell. And over here, you can type in commands. So I can say print 5 into 4. And it shows 20. You can execute the code and the shell would immediately give you output. Using the Python shell is an awesome way to learn Python. And that's what we'd be doing in the first few sections of the course. If you are able to successfully get here, you're all set to go on further with this course. If you're having a problem and you are not able to launch up Python, you can try installing the whole thing again. And if you're on Windows, make sure that you check the add Python 3.6 to path checkbox. I hope you had a nice time installing Python and I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Why do you think I love programming? I love programming because I think programming is cool. It is a lot of fun and I love solving problems. The combination of solving challenges while having a lot of fun is awesome. In this course, we'd want to help you to develop a love for programming. If you had bad experiences, in learning programming earlier forget about them start afresh and i promise this will be an awesome roller coaster ride let's take a step back and think what are the important things you would need to learn to be a great programmer as a programmer you'd want to solve problems you want to get the computer to do things for you to be able to do that you need to have problem solving skills you need to be able to look at a problem and identify the important programming concepts that are important to solve the problem. And then you need to be able to use the language specific syntax to be able to express your solution in a specific programming language like Java or Python or Scala. While all this looks complex, we would make it very easy for you. We would take you through these steps for a variety of programming challenges. We will start with simple challenges like multiplication table and gradually increase the difficulty level over the duration of the course. One important thing you need to remember is that learning to program is a lot like learning to ride a bicycle. The first steps are the most difficult ones. Once you get over these initial steps, it becomes a lot of pure fun, just like riding a bicycle. Are you ready for your first programming challenge? Let's get going now. I'll see you in the next step where we would start with our first programming challenge. Congratulations.
and good luck. Welcome back. In this video, we would want to introduce you to the first challenge that we would be solving as a part of this course. The first problem that would be solving is a multiplication table. So we would want to print the multiplication table for 5. So this is the format that we would want to print the output in. So we would want to print 5 into 1 is equal to 5 and so on up to 5 into 10 is equal to 50. So this is the challenge and what are the important concepts that we would need to solve this? Here are some of the important concepts that we would be using to solve this specific problem. We would learn about what is a statement, expression, we would learn about variables and we would also learn about if statement, for loop, methods or functions. So those are all the concepts that you would learn while we are attempting to solve the multiplication table problem. All these concepts would be introduced to you one by one as we go step by step solving the challenge. I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. The challenge which we set ourselves is to print the multiplication table. So we would want to print a multiplication table of this kind. In this video, let's discuss how to break this problem up and where do we start. So what do we start with? That's what we would want to discover in this short video. Typically when we do programming, we have problems. Solving the problem typically needs a step-by-step -step approach. You identify some problems to solve and then go about solving them. So think about this. What would be the sub-problems that you would want to solve when you would want to print a multiplication table? How do we break it down and where do we really start? Here are a few things that I have identified. One of the first things that we can do is get the computer to calculate 5 into 5 or 5 into 6. The second thing that we can do is to try and print this entire thing. So I would want to print 5 into 5 is equal to the cal calculated value. So whatever value is calculated from here, I would want to use it and print it in here. So we would want to first calculate, then print. And what we want to do is not just print 5 into 5 is equal to 25, right? So we would want to print from 5 into 1 to 5 into 10. And to be able to do that, we would want to do something similar to this 10 times. Not exactly the same thing because we don't want to print 5 into 5 is equal to 25 10 times. We would want to print the entire table with different values over here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on. Let's start with that kind of a game plan and let's see where it takes us. I'll see you in the next step. We would focus on calculating 5 into 5. Welcome back. In this step, we will focus on calculating 5 into into 5. So we would want the computer to calculate 5 into 5 and print 25 for us. How do we get the computer to do that? How do we get the Python shell to do that? That's what we would be looking at in this specific step. I've launched up Python shell. You can see that by these three small arrow marks down here. So I'm inside the Python shell. Make sure that you have launched up Python shell and you are inside the Python shell. If you need help with this, you can look at the previous video where we discuss about how to launch up the Python shell. We would want to calculate 5 into 5. How do we do that? Let me try 5x5. Five, 5x5. Five. Five mm -hmm. It says invalid syntax. This is how programming languages complain. When they don't understand what you are typing in, they say error. Here what it says is a syntax error. So it's saying whatever is in here. So it's saying whatever is in here, I'm not able to understand that. The reason why it complains is because X is not a valid operator in Python. The way you can do multiplication in Python is by using star. So 5 into 5 is 5 star 5. And you can see now the result being printed. It says 25. Let's do something else. 5 into 6, 30. There are a wide range of other operations. 5 plus 6, 11. 
5 minus 6, minus 1. 10 divided by 2, it says 5.0. So it's calculating the value and printing it down here. There's one interesting operator, 10 star star 2. So 10 star star 2, or let's try 10 star star 3. Try and guess the output. Think what the operator is. The operator is to the power of. So 10 to the power of 3 is 10 into 10 into 10, which is 1000. So what we are looking at are several operators that are supported by Python. So we looked at star plus minus. This is division and this is to the power of. Another interesting operator is called modulus. 10 mod 3. What is the remainder when 10 is divided by 3? What is the remainder? It's 1, right? So 10, 3 into 3 is 9. So 10 minus 9 is 1. That's what is being printed in here. So until now, we looked at a few examples of the operators. All these things that we executed until now are called expressions. So 5 into 5 is an expression. 5 into 6 is an expression. 5 minus 6 is an expression. The two things which we operate on are called operands. Here, both the 5s are operands. Star is a operator. So star plus minus slash star star are all the operators which are supported by Python. And 5 and 6 here are operands. 5 and 6 here are also called literals because those are constant values. These values are not going to change. Here 10 and 3 are literals. 10 and 2 here are also literals. The cool thing about all these expressions is that you can even have expressions with multiple operators. So I can say 5 plus 5 plus 5, which is 15. So this is an expression which has three operands and two operators. You can even have expressions with multiple operators. 5 plus 5 star 5. I would recommend you to stop the video in here and try and play with a few expressions of your own choice. So try and play around with the expressions and try and understand the output which is coming up. Now, I hope you had a chance to play around with a few expressions and let's now look at a few exercises for this specific step. The first exercise is to write an expression. So you'd want to write an expression to calculate number of minutes in a day. So you want to calculate how many minutes are there in a day. That's exercise number one. And the next one is calculate number of seconds in a day. Think about it. So I would want to find out number of minutes in a day. How do I do that? And how do I want to calculate number of seconds in a day as well. So how do I do that? So those are the two exercises I would leave you with. We will discuss solutions for these exercises in this video. But one of the most important things that you need to understand is you need to try to solve these problems by yourself. So try and see how you can do it by yourself. If you are able to work it out, that's fantastic. But if you are not able to work it out, that's part of the learning process. So the best way to learn is to try to solve it yourself and see how I do it. So that's the best way to learn. I would recommend you to try spending some time trying to do this exercise. And I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at the exercises from the previous step. We wanted to calculate the number of minutes in a day. How do we do that? Think about it. How do we do that? You can pause the video in here and try solving it on yourself before you proceed and see the solution. Think about this. How many number of hours are there in a day? 24. And how many minutes does each hour have? It's 60. So if you want to find out the number of minutes in a day, it's 24 into 60. Isn't that simple? It's 1440. Let's go to the second exercise, which is to find out Number of seconds in a day. How many seconds are there in a day? How do we do that? You can pause the video in here. You can actually use whatever we have learned here to try and calculate it. The number of hours is 24. The number of minutes in an hour is 60. 
and the number of seconds in a minute is 60 as well. So, it's 24 into 60 into 60, 86,400, right? So, these are two interesting exercises to see how expressions are really useful in our day-to-day -day life. So, think about a couple of other scenarios where you might be using expressions and try to do calculations around them. And I'll see you in the next step where we would look at a few puzzles. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a few puzzles related to expressions. Before that, let's revise some of the terminology that we had learned earlier. So, 5 plus 6 plus 10. This is an expression. In the expression, we have operands. 5, 6 and 10 are operands. The plus here is a operator. You can have multiple operators in an expression. And we also talked about the fact that these 10, 6 and 5 are called literals because those values will not change. Let's look at a few puzzles. Think about what would happen when I do something of this kind. 5 star dollar 2. What would happen? Yep, you are right. It would throw a syntax error. So, whenever a programming language does not understand the code you type. Here, the expression I am typing is 5 into dollar 2. It does not really make sense, right? So, even when you look at it, you can say, what, what are you typing? So, even the programming language does not understand that and it throws an error. So, whenever you do something which a programming language does not understand, what does it do? It throws an error. Here, it's a syntax error. 5 dollar 2. What would happen? Error. All right. So, let's say I'm typing in 5 plus 6 plus I'm not leaving any space between the operand and the operator. What do you think will happen? Okay, it does calculate. So, in an expression, the space which we leave is not really mandatory. I was leaving it so that it's much clearer for you to read. So, 5 plus 6 plus 10 is easier to read than this, right? So, here, this is a little difficult, little more difficult to read. Now, let's look at the next puzzle. So, 5 by 2. 5 divided by 2. What would be the output? 2.5. If you are coming from other programming languages like Java or C, this might be a surprising result because if you do that in Java or C, you would get 2 as the output. Here, both the operands are integer values. Integer values are those that do not have a decimal attached to that. So, this is 5, 6, 10, 20, 25. So, even though I am performing an op operation on an integer value, the result is a floating point value. It's a decimal value. It's a 2.5. Python does what is expected. 5 by 2, I would expect it to return 2.5 and that's what Python returns. Now, next puzzle. 5 plus 5 into 6. What would be the result of this expression? Will it be 5 plus 5, 10 into 6, which is 60? Or will it be 5 plus 5 into 6? 5 into 6 is 30, so 30 plus 5 is 35. So, will it be 60 or 35? Think about it. It's 35. How Python decides this is based on something called precedence of operators. So, among the operators, star star, which is power of, star, which is multiplication, division, and modulus. These operators have greater priority compared to plus and minus. So, all these four operators that we talked about in here, so this is to the power of star, division and modulus, these operators have greater priority than plus and minus. So, in this expression, star has a higher priority, so it's executed first. So, 5 into 6 is executed first, 5 into 6 is 30 and 30 plus 5 is 35 and that's the result. I would Recommend you to try a few expressions and see what would be the results and see and understand how precedence works. I'll give you a simple exercise of so 5 minus 2 into 2. What would be the result of this? Will it be 6 or will it be 1? It's 1 because star has a higher priority. 2 into 2 is 4. 5 minus 4 is 1. Let's say I would want to execute 5 minus 2 
into 2. So I would want to have 3 into 2, that is 6 as the result of this expression. How do I change the precedence? You cannot really change the precedence, but you can add parentheses or brackets. So what I can do is do something of this kind. Parenthesis has the highest precedence. So what happens is 5 minus 2 gets calculated first and the result of this expression is 6. One of the things which I like about parenthesis is it makes the expression even more clearer. So even in situations like this, 5 minus 2 into 2, you know that the result is 1, right? So even when you know that a specific operator has higher precedence, you might want to add a parenthesis to make sure that the expression is even more clearer. So anybody who looks at this, it's much more clearer than this. In this step, we looked at a number of puzzles related to expressions. In the subsequent steps, let's move on to other sub-problems. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we learned how to use expressions to calculate values like this. 5 into 6 is 30. What we would want to really do is we would want to be able to print 5 into 6 is equal to 30. If I do this, what I would get is a error. Now, in this step, we will look at how to get 5 into 6 is equal to 30 printed out to the console. How do we do that? Let's get started with trying to print a simple thing. So let's say I want to print hello. As soon as I type in hello, I get an error. Until now, what we did was we were trying to type in expressions and we were printing the values of them. However, hello is not really an expression. It's text. So this hello is typically called a string value in programming languages because it represents the text H-E-L-L-O. This is different from a number 5. So 5 is a number. However, hello is a piece of text. Now, I do want to print a string hello. How do I do that? There are a number of inbuilt functions in programming languages to help us do that. One of the inbuilt functions in Python, which helps us to print hello, is print. Can I do print hello? Does Python allow that? Let's see what would happen. Nope. It gives an error. It says missing parenthesis. So what should I do? Print, open parenthesis, hello, close parenthesis. Will this work? Nope. Again, an error. The reason why this one failed is because you'd want to indicate that hello is a string. How do I indicate that hello is a string? By putting it within double quotes. Aha! Finally, I would see hello printed out. So, the things which we have done until now is we typed in print, open parenthesis, a double quote, hello, and another double quote, close parenthesis, to be able to print hello to the output. If you are confused by this whole thing, you will not be alone because there are a lot of things which are happening behind the screens, behind this simple statement. Whatever we are doing in here is called a statement. It's a line of code that we are executing. As part of the statement, we are calling a function. So this print here is a function. And what are we trying to print? We are trying to print hello. The hello which is present in here is called a parameter or an argument. So the way you can call functions typically is very simple. You need to use name of the function followed by parenthesis. Within the parenthesis, you need to pass in the parameter here. The name of the function is print. We would want to print. What do we want to print? We want to print hello to the output. So we say print hello and within double quote because hello is a string. Print a string hello. That's what we are doing until now. Now let's get back to what we want to do. We would want to print 5 into 6 is equal to 30. 
pause the video in here and try and think how you can use print to print 5 into 6 is equal to 30. The most basic version would be something of this kind, right? So print 5 into 6 is equal to 30. So here we are putting the entire value as a string. So 5 into 6 is equal to 30. The entire thing I am putting it as a string and doing a print around it. And this prints 5 into 6 is equal to 30. One of the things that you need to understand here is we are not really calculating 30. We are not saying 5 into 6 and we are not calculating 30 in here. We are hard coding 30. We are directly putting the text 30 in here. That's called hard coding. In a future step, we will look at how to actually calculate the value and put it in here. In this quick step, we learned how to print 5 into 6 is equal to 30 in a hard coded way to the console. In the next step, we'll look at a few exercises and puzzles regarding what we have learnt in this specific step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we learnt how to print 5 into 6 is equal to 30. It was not a perfect solution because we hard-coded everything. What we did was we used an inbuilt function print. We passed in a string parameter to it and we invoked the function print. In this step, let's look at a number of puzzles related to inbuilt methods and parameters and strings. For example, let's say I do print 5 into 6. So, important thing to remember is 5 into 6 is within double quotes. So, print 5 into 6. What would be the output? Think about it. It just prints this string 5 into 6. Let's say I print it exactly as it is, however, without the double quotes. 5 into 6 is an expression. So, what will be the output? Yep, it prints the calculated value. So, if you call print with an expression, it prints the result of the expression. However, over here, what we did is we put it within double quotes. When we put something within double quotes, it becomes a piece of text. So it would be printed as it is. The other interesting thing to note is that in Python, you can either use double quotes or you can even use single quotes. So in Python, single quote is valid and double quote is valid for a string. So you can see that 5 into 6 is printed as is. Now, let's look at a few other inbuilt methods in Python. One of the inbuilt methods in Python is called absolute ABS. This is one of the inbuilt methods and to this you can pass a numeric value. So I can say absolute and pass 10.5 as a value to it and it prints the absolute value. That's basically the integer value. That's 10. So if I call absolute 10.5, the result would be 10. How do I call absolute 10.5? Think about it. Try and pause the video in here. I would want to call the absolute method passing 10.5, a number, as a parameter. How do I do that? You can pause the video in here and try it. Will this work? Nope, this will not work. The way you can call it is by open parenthesis 10.5, which is the value I would want to pass, and close parenthesis. So here we are passing a numeric value to absolute. Right. If I pass in a string value, will it work? It says absolute function will not work with a string. Absolute only works with numeric values. Let's say I would want to call a function called power. So I would want to find out 2 to the power of 5. So I would want to calculate 2 to the power of 5. In Python, there is a function called POW, which stands for power to which you can pass two parameters and calculate it. How do you do that? You can pause the video in here and try how you can do that. So I would want to call the power function and I would want to pass in two parameters, two and five. Will this work? Nope, this does not work as well. So power two comma five. That's the syntax and you'd see that 32 is printed. So two to the power of five is 32. Let's see another example. 10 to the power of 3, it's 1000. So this is a alternative to doing 10 star star 3. Right? This also prints 
thousand. Similar to this, there is a function called power to which you can pass in two parameters, ten comma three. Let's say there is a function called max to which I can pass in any number of numbers and find out which is the maximum among them. So how do I call it? So I would want to find out the maximum of thirty-four, forty-five, and sixty-seven using the max. How do I do that? Think about it. It's simple, right? So I need to say max. 34 45 67 right similarly there is also a min function which finds the minimum so min 34 these are some of the inbuilt functions in python and we saw how to call the inbuilt functions by passing in a varied number of parameters one of the important things for you to note is python is case sensitive so let's say i want to calculate power of 2 comma 5 so this would give me 32 no, but if i say capital p instead of small p in here that would be an error because all the function names are case sensitive in python so later we would look at what are variables we will look at what are classes and stuff and you would see that everything like that in python is case sensitive the only thing which is not really case sensitive is your string values, right? So we, earlier we looked at printing the value of hello. So print hello, this prints hello. So inside here, inside the text, you can use any case. So this would print hello with a small case. Or you can make this O or capital O. That's fine because this is just a value. So inside the values, the case will not matter and it would print whatever case you have in the value it would print it to the console but inside your function names in class names variable names you need to be very particular about the case the other important thing is space typically does not really matter so i can add space here and here and still you'd get the same output however in the case of a value in a string value the space does matter if i say hello world it would print hello world with a space in between and if i do hello world with three spaces it would print space as it is in your method calls or in your expressions space does not really matter however inside the string values space does matter the last thing which you would want to look at in this specific video is something called escape characters let's say I would want to print a double quote in this. So in print hello, I would also want to print a double quote. So if I do this, what would happen? Aha, it says error. If I want to print a double quote inside a string, I need to use something called an escape. So this slash here is called an escape. Now if I do this, it would print hello followed by a double quote. So this slash in here is called a escape so you can use slash to escape the double quote the other reason why you would want to use a slash is when you would want to print a new line so let's say i want to want to print hello world and i would want to print hello on one line and world on the next line in that case slash n is another escape character so hello world so you can see that hello is on one line world is printed on the next line the other important escape character is hello slash t so it's slash t which prints a tab so you can see that there is a tab space between hello and world another useful escape character is slash slash so if i want to print a slash then i would need to put slash slash then you would see that it prints hello slash world so what think about what would happen if i put six slashes you can pause the video in here and see think what would be the output yep you're right it would print three slashes one of the things with python is as we discussed earlier it does not matter whether you use double quotes or single quotes so you can use a string with single quote and if your end characters are single quotes then the double quote does not need to be escaped so you'd see that this would print hello double quote and you'd see that if I use a double quote, 
as my string representation then inside it I can use single quote without a problem so I can say hello single quote world the problem would come if I use double quote in which case I would need to escape it so one of the best practices that people typically do in Python is when you are creating a string literal if the string literal contains a single quote then you can use double quote to delimit so let's say I would want to print hello world right so I can use double quote as the delimiter that would ensure that my string is simple however if my string contains double quote let's say this is what I would want to print then I'll use single quote as the delimiter in all other situations it does not matter what you use you can either use a single quote as a delimiter or a double quote as the delimiter in this video we looked at a wide range of things related to strings we looked at things related to inbuilt methods how do you pass parameters to a method and we also looked at the escape characters until the next video bye bye welcome back in the previous step we learned how to print a hard coded 5 into 6 is equal to 30 in this step let's try to replace this 30 with a calculated value so we don't want to hard code 30 in here but we would want to calculate 5 into 6 and replace that calculated value in here let's look at how to do that in this specific step let's start with a simple example let's say I would want to have a calculated value as part of a string so over here I would want to have a value which is calculated so let's say I would want to have 5 into 2 calculated and I would want to use that value in here how do I do that so I would want to be able to say value and 5 into 2 and I would want 10 to be printed in here the way we can do that is by saying value dot format 5 into 2 so all that I'm doing is print value the important thing is dot the format is a function on the string so on the string there is a function called format to which I'm passing 5 into 2 an expression make sure that you have the matching number of close parenthesis and when you print this you would see value printed as is right we were expecting 10 to be printed but it's actually printing value how to get 10 to be printed in here the way we can do that is by having an open brace close brace and within that you need to put the index of the value that you would want to put in here so here the value is the first parameter the first parameter typically is at index 0 so value 0 and then it's printing the calculated value it's doing 5 into 2 and printing value 10 in here to understand this further let's make it simple so to the format I'm passing in three values 10 20 and 30 so this is index 0 this is index 1 this is index 2 typically in programming languages when we count values we start from zeros if I want to print the first value I would need to pass in an index of 0 so if I do this you would see that the first value is printed 10 however if I want to print the second value I can pass in an index of 1 so this is printing 20 which is the second value so what the format function does is it looks at this string and looks at anything within an open brace close brace and having an index in them so it looks at what is the index so the index here is 1 so it takes the second value and replaces that so it's printing value 20 so th stop pause the video in here and try and print the third value what should be the index think about it yep you are right it should be 2 now going back to our problem print 5 to 6 is equal to 30 how do we do that so what we want to do is print you would want to say 5 into 6 is equal to 30 but over here we would want to replace this with calculated values so how do we do that we would say format and pass in the three values right so 5 comma 6 comma 5 into 6 so this is index 0 this is index 1 this is index 2 
So let's try and replace instead of 30, I would want the calculated value of 5 into 6. How do I get it here? I can say the calculated value 2. So I'm saying 0, 1, 2. So is equal to 2. What happens? 5 into 6 is equal to 30. Now let's see if I can replace 5 as well with the index. What should it be replaced with? Pause the video in here, try and replace it. What should it be? It should be 0 and the index of this is 1. Now you would see that 5 into 6 is equal to 30. The great thing about this is now I can replace the values so 5, 7 and 5 into 7 and 5 into 7 is equal to 35. Now I can do the same thing with 8 as well 5, 8 and 5 into 8 is equal to 40. So we are now able to print 5 into 6 is equal to 30, 5, 7 is 35, 5, 8 is 40 and so on very, very easily using the print method. In this step, we started with the hard coded version of print and we ended up with a version of print where everything is a calculated value. We are not hard coding 40, 5, 8, 5 into 8 is being calculated and that is being put into the print. In the next step, let's look at a couple of simple puzzles related to what we discussed until now. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this small video, let's look at a few puzzles related to the format and the print methods. This is what we did to print 5 into 8 is equal to 40. So let's say I'm passing in additional values, right? 5 into 8, 5 into 9, and 5 into 10. What would happen? So here I'm only referring to 1, 2, and 3 values. So index 0, index 1, and index 2. So these are the values I'm referring to 0, 1, and 2. I'm not referring to these values at all. So these two values are not used at all. So what would happen? Would this throw an error? Think about it. Would this throw an error? it does not throw an error. So the additional values which are passed in are conveniently ignored. Let's say I'm going to put in here instead of 2, I'm going to put 4. What would happen? Think about it, pause the video in here and try and guess what the output would be. Yep, it says 5 into 8 is equal to 50, which is not correct, right? It's not correct, but that's what we asked it to print. So 5 into 10 is index 4, so 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So 5 to 10 is the value at index 4, and that is what is replaced. So this 5 to 10 would be printed instead of this. So 5 into 8 is equal to 50 is what is printed. Now, let's take a different scenario. So let's say I'm removing all the parameters. I'm saying 0, 1 is equal to 4. So I'm trying to print a value at index 4. However, I'm only passing two values to it. What do you think will happen? Aha, uh -huh. error. It says index error. It says you are asking me to fetch the fifth value, that is the value at index 4, but you are only passing in two values. How can I do that? So what does the programming language do? What does Python do? It says index out of range. You are doing something wrong. Let's look at a few more things related to other data types. So let's say I would say 0, 1 is equal to 2 and I would pass in 2.5 and 2 comma 2.5 into 2. So these are integer values, right? 2 is an integer value. However, 2.5 is a decimal kind of value. So it's typically in programming languages, we call this floating point value. And if you do this, what would happen? You can see that it prints 2.5 into 2 is equal to 5.0. So this approach of printing things with print works also with floating point values. It not only works with integer values, which we had in here, but it also works with floating point values. Now, are there other things that this would work with? Yes, it would also work with strings. So let's say over here, I would want to say, my name is and I would want to replace it with the value that is being passed. I can say my name is Ranga. 
And what would happen? This thing will be replaced by whatever is passed in here. If even if you pass in other values, it would only pick up the one with the right index. So if I'm saying my name is one, what does it pick up? Think about it. What does ha what happens? Yep, you are right. So this is the index zero. This is index one. So that value is picked up. In this quick video, we looked at a few things related to the print and the format combination. We saw that if you call the format with excess number of values, then it's fine. It does not complain about it. However, if I refer to an index 5 and there are only three values that are being passed, the format function would throw an error. The last thing which we looked at was the fact that the format function also works with floating point values as well as string values. Isn't that cool? Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. We are slowly making progress towards our eventual aim. We would want to print the 5 table. Right now, the way we can print the 5 table is start with 5 to 1 and then say instead of 1, 2 and 3 and so on and so forth. So what we are doing in here is we are modifying the statement that is being executed. In this statement, we are printing 5 into 1 is equal to 5. And over here, to make it 5 into 2 is equal to 10, we are changing 1 to 2. Over here, we are changing 2 to 3. How do we make it even more simpler? In this statement, we are using constant values. We are using literals. The value of a literal cannot change. This is 1. This is always 1. This will never become a 2. Instead of that, can we use something that can change? Let's say, instead of 3, can I say, use an index and a index over here. And based on the value of the index, the value of this statement might be different. Will I be able to do that? That's the question we'd be looking at in this specific step. So what would happen if I replace 1 with index and 5 into 1 with 5 into index and do it? Let's see what would happen. It gives a error. It says index is not defined. Let's try and fix this. Let's say index is equal to 2. What would happen? Let's try and execute the same statement again. I'm add, using the up arrow and down arrow to navigate. Press enter. Aha! You can see that index is equal to 2 and this statement is printing 5 into 2 is equal to 10. Let's try something else. Let's make index is equal to 3. What would happen? The same statement I'm executing now, it's now printing 5 into 3 is equal to 15. So what content this statement prints changes based on what is the value index is referring to. Over here, index is referring to a value of 3. Here, index is referring to a value of 2. How can you check the value that index is referring to? Just type in index. You can see the current value it's referring to. So the current value index is referring to is 3. And therefore, when I say print, it uses 3 as the value for the index. So here it prints 3. Here it prints 5 into 3, 15. And if I change index to 5, what would happen? It prints 5 into 5 is equal to 25. The index over here is what is called typically a variable. In Python, it's also called a name. So index is a name or a variable. You can see that the value it's referring to can change over a period of time. Here index is referring to a value of 2. Here, index is referring to a value of 3. Over here, index is referring to a value of 5. Now, think about how you would print the entire table. So if I want to print the entire table, all that I need to do is start from 1, execute the same statement, 5 into 1 is equal to 5. Next, change the value of index to 2 and then print the same statement. Now, index is equal to 3 and print the same statement again. So what we are seeing is with the same statement, with the same method call, 
with the same code we are able to print different values the index in here is what is called a variable a variable is nothing but a name given to something the variables make the program much more easier to read and it makes the program more generic in the sense that based on the value of index this can print different things so this can print from index is equal to 0 to index is equal to 10 whatever multiple of 5 that you would want to print now let's try and do a simple exercise with variables I would want to create three variables I would want to create three variables a B and C I'd want to initially give a value of 5 to a 6 to B and 7 to C so a is given a value of 5 B is given a value of 6 and C is given a value of 7 once you create three variables with those things I would want to print a output of this kind 5 plus 6 plus 7 is equal to 18 except that I don't want to use the constants I would want to use the variables a B and C think about how you do that and pause the video in here now let's look at the solution for that so I said we would want to create a is equal to 5 B is equal to 6 C is equal to 7 isn't this easy creating variables with Python is very very easy so a now refers to a value of 5 B now refers to a value of 6 C now refers to a value of 7 so print what we want to print is a plus B plus C 5 plus 6 plus 7 is equal to the value of that so I would say so 5 plus 6 plus 7 is equal to we would want to print the value of 5 plus 6 plus 7 so if I'm hard coding this is the way I would do it right but we don't want to hard code what we want to do is we would want to use the variables so what I'll do is we need to say format and over here I can pass in the variables a B C comma a plus B plus C will this work nope this will really not work because it's not using the variables it's using the constant values how do I use the variables in a print statement think about it the way I can do that is by saying 0 1 2 and 3 let's print this and now you'd see that the same value is printed however we are using variables how do you confirm that we are using variables let's change the values of a b and c so I'll make a as 6 b as 7 C as 8 and let's see what would happen now with the same statement it's printing 6 plus 7 plus 8 is equal to 21 you can see the magic of variables in here right so based on what values these variables are referring to you can see that the output of the print statement is different and that's the magic of variables in this step we learned how to use a simple variable we saw that variables make the code much more generic and easier to read in the next step let's look at a few puzzles to get a in-depth understanding of variables until then bye bye welcome back in the previous step we were introduced to the concepts of variables we saw that variable is a name given to something and they make the program easier to read we created variables of the kind i is equal to one and after that i can print the value of i that's one or i can say print i into two this would print what would what do you think it would print i is one so i into two is so this is what we looked at in the previous steps we saw that variables allow us to create statements which use them and these statements become generic so I can say i is equal to 4 the same statement if I execute print i is into 2 it would print 8 i is 4 so 4 into 2 is 8 in this video let's look at a few important things that you need to know about variables 
we will start using the puzzles format to learn more about variables. I have not really created anything of the kind count. Now, if I type to type in count, you'd see that count is not defined. So, before using a variable, you need to have it refer to a value. If you have not defined a variable before, then you cannot use it. Same is in the case of a print count. So, if I say print count, it does not know what count is. So, it would throw an error. It's saying count is not really defined. I have no idea what count is. So, you need to tell what count is. So, you need to say count is equal to 4. And then if you say print count, it would print 4. So, you cannot use a variable without defining it. So, this statement which we are doing in here, i is equal to 1, where we are first time creating a variable called i, is called a definition. So, the first thing, first time you are referring to a variable and assigning a value to it, Python will create a variable in its memory. Without a definition, you cannot use a variable. Other important thing about a variable is its case sensitive. What do I mean? So, if I say count with a capital C, you can see that here we are using count with a small c and I am trying to print count with a capital C over here. Will this work? Mm -hmm. It's saying count is not defined. Variables in Python are case sensitive. So, if you say count with a small c, then it's always count with a small c. You cannot use count with a capital C. The last thing which we want to discuss in this video are rules to naming variables. Can I have one count is equal to five? Can I have a variable of this kind? Nope. Invalid syntax. All variable names should either start with an alphabet, that's count is equal to five or underscore. So, you can say count is equal to five. So, these are the two valid ways. So, either it should start with an alphabet, I mean this can be a capital alphabet, a small alphabet or you should start with an underscore. Any other character is not a valid thing. So you cannot say one count or you cannot say two count. You cannot start it with a number. However, in the variable name after the first letter, so after first letter, so first letter is the alphabet or underscore. Starting the second letter can be an alphabet, underscore or a numeral. So, starting the second letter, you can have numerals as well. So, you can say C123456 is equal to 5. So, this would create a variable with the name C12345 and it is referring to a value of 5. So, to summarize, the rules for naming variables are they should start with an alphabet, a capital or a small alphabet or a underscore. Starting the second character, it can be a alphabet or an underscore or a numeric value. These are the valid variable names. In this quick video, we learned two important things. Number one, a variable should be defined before it is used. Number two, there are certain rules that you need to adhere to when you are naming a variable. If you don't follow those rules, then you would get a syntax error. We would discuss about a few more things related to variables in the subsequent videos. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this quick tip, we would look at an important concept in Python or for that matter, any programming language. It's called assignment. So, what we did in the previous videos is we created variables. We said i is equal to 5. So, what we are doing in here is defining a variable called i and also we are making it refer to a value of 5. The thing is, you can create other variables using whatever value i is referring to. So, I can say j is equal to i. What would happen? j would start referring 
to the same value that i is referring to this statement is called assignment what is happening in here is i is referring to a value of 5 so what would happen here is j would also start referring to a value of 5 so if i say j j would print a value of 5 if i say j is equal to 2 into i what would happen if i say j what is the value that is printed 10 so now j is referring to a value of 10 the important thing to understand is the fact that this is different from mathematics in J mathematics typically when i say j is equal to i what would happen it means j and i are equal that's not how it would work in programming languages when you execute a statement of this kind what happens is the expression is evaluated the expression on the right hand side is evaluated what is the current value that i is referring to it's referring to 5 what happens is 2 into 5 is evaluated and j would start referring to that value so instead of referring to the earlier value j would now start referring to the new value 2 into i if i say j is equal to 3 into i what would happen 3 into i is calculated and j would start referring to that value so if i print the value of j now it would show 15. the important thing to understand is when you are doing assignment what happens is the expression on the right hand side gets evaluated and the left hand side variable would start referring to that value is this a valid statement 5 is equal to j can i use a constant on the left hand side the answer is no it says can't assign to a literal 5 is a literal it's something which is a constant value always whatever you do on the left hand side statement of an assignment should be a variable so i can say j is equal to 10 then the value 10 is what is being referred to by j now let's create a couple of variables num1 is equal to 5 num2 is equal to 3 now i would want to add these and create a variable how do i do that you can pause the video in here and try to do that so what i would want to do is i would want to add these two and create a variable let's say the name of the variable should be sum how do you do that the way you can do that is by saying sum is equal to num1 plus num2 what would be the value that would be referred to by sum it's referring to a value of 8 now you can pause the video in here and as an exercise you can create three variables a b and c assign a value of 5 to a 6 to b and 7 to c and what you need to do is to create a variable called sum containing the sum of all these three variables okay i hope you had got a chance to do that so a is equal to 5 b is equal to 6 c is equal to 7 now how do i calculate the sum sum is equal to a plus b plus c isn't it very easy now let's see what is the value that is referred to by sum it's 18 that's the sum of a b and c now one of the important things about variables is the fact that you can start using variables inside our print statements right so we wanted to print let's say i would want to print 5 plus 6 plus 7 is equal to 18. we can start using the variables to print them so we can use the format 0 1 and i can say 2 and here i can say 3 and i can use the a b c comma sum so this is 0 1 2 and 3 you can see what would be printed oops this is not the way it is right so i need to actually use the format function so dot format oops dot format and 
Okay, so now it prints 5 plus 6 plus 7 is equal to 18. In this quick tip, we learned how assignment statement works. What happens behind the screens of an assignment is if a variable by that name exists, then the value it refers to gets updated. So if you look at num1 right now, it's having a value of 5. And if I say num1 is equal to 10, what would happen is num1 would start referring to a value of 10. The other thing which could also happen is the variable might not exist. So let's say number 1. So if there is nothing with number 1, you can see that number 1 is not defined. And when I say number 1 is equal to 15, what would happen is two things. One is number 1 is defined. So number 1 variable will be defined and it would be referring to a value of 15. So if I print number 1 now, what would be printed? 15. So assignment actually does multiple things. If the variable is already defined, it would change the value it is referring to. If a variable is not really defined yet, then it would create the variable and have it pointing to the value. The other thing which would also happen is evaluation of expressions. So if in assignment, on the right hand side I have an expression, then you would see that the expression is evaluated and the variable starts referring to the value of the expression. The other thing which we learned is that on the left hand side of an expression, you should always have variables. You cannot assign 5 is equal to j because 5 is not a variable, it's a literal. Okay, there you go. These are some of the things which we learned in this video. Until the next step, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, we'll give you a small tip, but a very important tip related to printing values. Until now, we have been using format method to format and print the values, right? So we wanted to print 1 plus 2 plus 3 is equal to 6, and we wanted to use A, B, C, and sum. So this is how we did it. So we used print on this string we call the format method and passed A, B, C, and sum as arguments. That's what we did to print the values. However, the thing is, once you have variables defined, so once you have A, B, C, and sum as the variables, there is a little bit more magic you can do in a much more simpler way. That's where we can use something called a formatted string. So instead of doing this, I can say a formatted string. So if I do this, so it's the syntax is very simple, right? Open parenthesis, F, and double quotes. So this is not printing anything. So if I want to print the value of A, so I, can, I want to say value of A is, and I would want to print here the value of A. The way I can do that is by saying, within braces, put the name of the variable. You can see that whatever you put within braces is replaced by its value. So the value of A is 1. So you can say value of A is 1 is printed. So you can see value of B is B. The great thing is you can even have expressions in here. You can say sum of A and B is A plus B. So within the braces, I'm having an expression A plus B. Oops, sum of A plus B is 1 plus 2, which is 3. This is very handy, right? So this reduces the amount of code that you need to do. This is one of the new features in Python 3. So with formatted strings, you can easily print strings with variable values. Now, let's get back to this. Pause the video in here and try and think how you'd print this statement using a formatted string. Pause the video here. Okay, I hope you had a chance to do that. So the way you would do that is by saying print f. You can see how easy it becomes. A plus b plus c is equal to sum. That's it. 1 plus 2 plus 3 is equal to 6. So the entire statement over here is now a very simple statement like this. So the formatted string is a very useful thing. And from here on in this course, we will always use 
formatted strings. Until next step, bye bye. Welcome back. After a series of tips about variables, assignment, and a wide variety of stuff, let's get back to the problem at hand. We would want to print the 5 table from 5 into 1 is equal to 5 to 5 into 10 is equal to 50. And the best solution that we have right now is to create a variable and keep changing the value of the variable. So index is equal to 2 and I can say print this. So this would print 5 into 2 is equal to 10. Index is equal to 3 and 5 into 3 is equal to 15. So can I do this in a loop? Can I do the same statement again and again in a loop? That's what we would explore in this specific step. One of the things you can already notice is the fact that I'm saying index is equal to 4 and then I'm saying print this. Can I actually do something to make sure that this statement is exactly the same all the times? So here what I'm doing is index is equal to 1, index is equal to 2, index is equal to 3, index is equal to 4. Think about what we are doing in here and think if there is an easier way to do this. Instead of using different expressions on these lines, can I use the same statement on these lines? You can pause the video in here and try and come up with a statement which when I execute will change the value from 2 to 3, from 3 to 4, 4 to 5 and so on. Pause the video in here. Okay, I hope you had a chance to do that. The way you can do that is by saying index is equal to index plus 1. What would happen? Index plus 1, 4, 4 plus 1. What would be the value that index would be referring to? It would be referring to a value of 5. So now, if I do it, it prints 5 into 5 is equal to 25. Now, if I do this again, it's now referring to a value of 6. So, if I execute the same two statements again and again, I can print the whole thing, right? So this is what loops help us to do. Loops help us to execute the same statements again and again. And in this step, let's look at a simple for loop in Python. Whenever we run a for loop, we would want to be able to say, I'd want to run it from one to 10, 1 to 20, and so on. And there's a function in Python which allows to create the range from which you would want to use the loop. So I can say range 1, 10. And the way we can use that in a for loop is very simple. The syntax of the for loop is for i in, so this is the name of the variable, for i in range 1 comma 10. So what we are saying is for i in a range of values from 1 to 10, what you need to do is in Python, you need to put a colon. So you put a colon and in the next line, give two spaces. So give two spaces. We'll talk about what is the importance of this space a little later. For now, give two spaces and then you can say print i. So what we are doing is for space i, space in, space range, and open parenthesis, 1 comma 10, close parenthesis, a colon in here, and print i. Let's see what it would print. When you press enter twice, you would see that it prints from 1 to 9. So it's printing all numbers from 1 to 9. This is called a loop. So when we run a loop from 1 comma 10, 1 is inclusive, 10 is exclusive. What does that mean? Exclusive means this value is not really included. So 10 is not really included. So the loop runs from 1 to the value before 10, which is 9. So that's why you're seeing values from 1 to 9 printed in here. So the syntax for for loop is very, very simple. For name of the variable in the range. So I would want to print from 1 to 10. 10 is exclusive, so we are actually printing from 1 to 9. And you follow it up with a colon. And in the next line, I left a couple of spaces. This is called indentation. We'll talk about indentation a lot. 
when we talk about puzzles related to for loop. For now, give indentation and hence we can print i. How can I extend this concept to our problem? So what we were doing earlier, we were doing this earlier, right? So print 0 into 1 is equal to 2 dot format 5 into index 5 into index. Let's use a formatted string right now because we understood the concept of a formatted string. So it would sound f instead of 0, it's value 5. And over here, we would want to use the index variable. And over here, we would want to say 5 into index. It's an expression. So I can remove the format method call completely. So this would print 5 into 7 is equal to 35. Now, I would want to print this statement for different values of i. How can I do that? I would recommend you to pause the video here and try it as an exercise. So the way it would work is for i in range, we learn the fact that it's 10 is exclusive. So I'll say 11. So it will print 1 to 10 colon and two spaces indentation. And I would say print. Let's print this. So print formatted string in a double quote. What we would want to print? Let's start with just printing i. So we are printing a formatted string i. And you don't need a semicolon in Python. So just print enter twice and it's printing from 1 to 10. What we want to print is 5 into 1 to 5 into 10. Let's go back to the for loop. Let's go back to the print f5. We would want to say 5. You don't need a variable over here actually. 5 into i. Let's see what would happen now. Aha, 5 into 1, 5 into 2 and so on and so forth. Now, can you pause the video and ha here and try and get it to print 5 into 1 is equal to 5 to 5 into 10 is equal to 50? Okay, here we go. Here's the solution. So print 5 into i is equal to 5 into i. Right? As simple as that. And now we are printing the complete table. So we are printing the entire thing from 5 into 1 is equal to 5 to 5 into 10 is equal to 50. So you can see how easy it is. We are using a for loop. What the for loop does is it for each value in the range 1 to 10. So i with a value of 1, i with a value of 2, i with a value of 3 and so on and so forth. It executes this simple statement. I hope you had an interesting experience solving this problem until now. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we took a major step in our programming career. We wrote our first for loop with Python. In this video, let's try a few puzzles to understand the for loop even further. So the syntax of the for loop that we looked at earlier was for i in range, which range 1 comma 20 or let's say 1 comma 10. And we said a colon here and we said you have to give a little bit of indentation and you can print i. So this is what we used and I pressed an enter again to end the for loop, right? So we saw that it's printing 1 to 9. We said 10 is exclusive, so it's not included. So that's why it's only printing up to 9. That's the basics we learned in the previous step. Now, let's try a few other things in this specific video. Now, if let's say I execute for loop and I don't give a colon here, what would happen? There's no colon after the range function call. What would happen? In Python, this is invalid syntax. Colon is a mandatory thing in the syntax of a for loop. Let's say I give the colon and I do a print directly here. So I'm not leaving a space at the start. I'm directly doing a print i. Let's press enter now. Oops. What does it say? It says indentation error. It's expecting a indented block. Some of the other programming languages use open brace and close brace as delimiters. However, 
Python uses indentation to identify which code is part of a for loop. So if I'm executing for loop, then I have to use indentation. I have to leave at least a single space and then I would say print i. And you'd see that this line alone is now part of the for loop. It's executed as part of the for loop. Now, let's say I would want to execute two lines of code as part of my for loop. How do I do that? So I can say print i and again a space and I'll say print two star i. So I'm saying print i, print two star i, right? Let's see what would happen. Press enter, enter again. Now you can see one, two into one, two, two into two, three, two into three, and so on printed to the console. So what is happening is these two lines of code would be part of the for loop. So the for loop is executing both these lines of code for each value of i. For i is equal to 1, these two lines are executed. For i is equal to 2, these two lines are executed. You can try having 3 or 4 or any number of lines as part of your for loop. One of the things you can also do for a for loop is for i in range to comma 5. Let's say I'm starting with 2, I'm ending at 4. I can print the value of i directly in here. So in a for loop, if you have only one statement to execute, then you can do this as well. So you can say print i. What would happen? Press enter twice, you'd see that this code executes. However, this is not considered to be a good practice. Typically, this is the kind of code you would see. So even though you want to execute just one statement in a for loop, you would use print comma i. So this is typically how the code is written. Another best practice which is typically followed is until now we have been using only two spaces. But typically, the best practice is to use four spaces. This would give clear indentation of the code. Anybody who looks at the code clearly understands that this print is part of the for loop. This is not just a for loop. Later we will talk about if blocks, a lot of conditional things. We'll talk about other loops in all kinds of loops and in all kinds of conditions. It's recommended to use four spaces to indicate that something is part of that specific loop. Until now, what we have done is we printed all values from 1 to 10, right? For i is range 1 to 11, print i. Let's say I only want to print the odd numbers. So I would want to print 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. How do I do that? The range function offers an option. You can say for i in range, we said 1, 11. You can have a third parameter, third argument called a step. So what happens is it starts with 1 and at each loop, it increments it by 2. So 1 becomes 3, 3 becomes 5, 5 becomes 7, so on and so forth. So colon, print i. And now you'd see it prints 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. This third argument over here is called a step. So this is the start, this is the end, and this is the step. So starting from start, each loop, the value is incremented by step. So 1, 1 plus 2, 3, 3 plus 2, 5, and so on, until the end value, 11, is reached. In this short video, we looked at a variety of puzzles with the for loop to understand it better. Until the next video, bye-bye. Welcome back. After making the first use of the for loop, and in the previous video, we looked at a number of puzzles related to the for loop. In this video, let's look at a few exercises related to for loop. Let's start with the first exercise. Earlier, we printed all the odd numbers. We printed odd numbers from 1 to 9. Now, I would want to print the even numbers up to 10. So I would want to print 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. I would want to use the for loop to do that. How do I do that? You can try and pause the video in here and see if you can work out the solution on your own. The solution is very simple, right? So instead of starting with 1, I would start with 2. 
So, if you start with 2, the starting value will be 2, each time it would be incremented by 2 and 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10, that is what will be printed. So, let us do that, print i and you would see 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10 printed, that is easy, right. Now, I would want to print the numbers in reverse. So, until now, we looked at how to print 1 to 10. So, I in range 1 to 11, we would print from 1 to 10. However, I would want to print in the reverse 10 to 1. Think about how you would do that using the range function. I would go from 10, 9, 8, so on up to 1. How do I do that? It is using the range function, right? So, the starting value we want to start with is 10. As we discussed earlier, the end value is exclusive. So, if I want to print from 10 to 1, I would want to print one value after that. So, I would need to give 0 in here. So, I would want to print from 10 to 0. However, the most important thing is the step value, right? Usually, the step value is positive, but what we want to do in here is after 10, we would want to go to 9. So, I would give a step value of minus 1. And now, I can say print i, enter, enter. And now, we are printing from 10 to 1. Isn't this fun? I mean, I love the range function because it gives you so many possibilities of things that you can do. I would want to print the squares of the first 10 numbers. So, I would want to print 1, 2 square 4, 3 square 9, 4 square 16 and so on and so forth. How do I do that? So, we would start with the usual for loop for i in range 1 to 11. Over here, I would need to just say print. I would want to print the squares, so I will say i star i. Isn't it easy? Now, let us print the squares in the reverse order. I would want to print from 100 to 1. How do I do that? Easy, right? So, you need to start with 10. You would want to go up to one, 0 because 0 is exclusive. So, we would want to go up to 1. So, we put 0 in here and we would want to do a minus 1. And what do we want to do? We want to do a print i star i. What would happen? 100 to 1. So, 10 square, 9 square, 8 square, 7 square and so on. The same thing, I would only want to print the squares of the even numbers. So, I would want to only print the squares of even numbers 10, 8, 6, 4 and 2. How would I do that? Yep, you are right. So, I would need to just, instead of minus 2, instead of minus 1, I would need to say minus 2, right? So, oops, a mistake. Let us print i star i. That is it. So, it is printing squares of even numbers. So, I will leave it as an exercise for you to print squares of odd numbers. The last thing that we would want to look at in this specific video is printing other tables. This is the code that we used earlier to print the 5 table. The first thing that we would want to do is instead of the 5 table, I would want to print the 6 table and the 8 table. How do I do that? Pause the video in here and try it as an exercise. Yep, it is actually quite simple. So, instead of 5, you would need to replace it with 6, right? That is it. It prints the 6 table. If I want to print the 8 table, it is again very simple. Instead of 6, I would replace it with 8 and that is it. We have the 8 table down here. In this video, we had a lot of fun with the for loop. I hope you had a good time learning about the for loop and I will see you in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. It must have been a roller coaster ride to solve the 5 multiplication table until now. If you are new to programming, then there are a wide range of topics and concepts that you would have learnt during this small journey. So, in this quick video, let us revise the important concepts that we have learnt during this small journey, right? One of the first things we started learning was literals. So, 1, 11, 5, over here, these are all called literals because these are 
constant values. These values don't really change. I in here is a variable. It is referring to different values at different points in time. At the start of the loop, it refers to a value of 1. At the end of the loop, it would have a value of 10. So I would have different values at different points and therefore it's a variable. Range and print are inbuilt Python functions. What we are doing here is we are calling range function. It's an inbuilt method with two arguments. We are passing two arguments 1 and 11. And this is how we would invoke a method. So the way we would invoke a method is by method name within parenthesis pass the arguments that you would want to pass. So here we are calling the range method and over here we are calling the print method which is inbuilt into Python. This whole thing which is present in here is called a statement. This specific statement is invoking a print method. The other statements which we looked at earlier was an assignment statement. We said index is equal to index plus 1. We would want to evaluate the value of index plus 1 and have the index variable refer to that value. This statement is called an assignment. One of the first things which we really started with was an expression 5 into 4 into 50. This is an expression and whatever you have in here are called literals or operands. So these are the things on which the operators are executed on. The star here is an operator and 5, 4 and 50 are operands. The last thing which we looked at was the for loop. The syntax of the for loop was very simple. For name of the variable in what range do you want to execute the loop in followed by a colon followed by statements you would want to execute in the for loop with a indentation for the sake of indentation we left two spaces in front of the print statement so that's in a nutshell what we have learned over the course of our first exercise I hope you had a great time doing this exercise. I'll see you in the next exercise. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. This is where we ended up in the last section. We were able to print the tables of 5, 7, 8, 6, a variety of tables. And this is how we printed the 8 table. Now, if I want to change the code to print 7 table, then the way we would do that is by 7 into i, right? So this, while simple, is not still as friendly as you would like, right? So if I would want to be able to print a 7 table, it would be awesome if I would be able to say print multiplication table and say 7 and it would print the 7 multiplication table or I would be able to say print multiplication table of 8 and it prints the multiplication table of 8. To be able to do that we would need to create things called methods. Methods make the code reusable and we would be able to invoke methods very easily by passing things called arguments. In this specific section we would look in depth into methods. We would create your first method. We would create methods using parameters. We would pass arguments to those methods and invoke them. At the end of this section, we would also look at return values. So the objective of this section is to be able to create a very dynamic method that would enable us to be able to call things like print multiplication table 7. I'll see you in the next step. We would start on that journey. Welcome back. Welcome to the wonderful world of methods. Methods are one of the most important building blocks in 
programming. In this specific step, we will create a very simple method to print hello world twice. Now, you would want to print hello world twice. How would you do that? So it's very simple, right? So print hello world and execute the same thing again. It's printed twice, right? So I would want to have a method which prints the hello world twice. How do I create it? That's basically what we would look at in this specific step. Whenever we talk about methods, we would need to give a name to the method, right? So the, we are already using an inbuilt method in here. It's print. So print is the name of this method. Similar to that, we would need to give a name to our method. Let's say the name we would want to give is print hello world twice. So let's say that's the name that we would want to give to our specific method. The syntax to create a method in Python is very, very simple. So to the name of the method, just add in parenthesis, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, and at the start, just put something called def. So we are defining a method with the name print hello world twice, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, followed by a colon. This is similar to the colon which we used when we used the for loop. One of the most important things in Python is we would use space as the indentation. So I'm leaving four spaces because that's the standard we said we will follow. Even if you leave one space, it's sufficient, but we would use four spaces as the standard. So I'm leaving four spaces in here. And now we are defining what to do in this specific method. What do we want to do? We want to do print hello world. And what do we want to do? We want to do it twice. So I'll again leave four spaces and say print hello world and close the method and press enter again. What we have done here is defining a method. We are saying this print hello world twice method, this is the code inside. So these two lines are the code inside this specific method. Print hello world twice is the name of the method. Print hello world, these two statements which are present in here are the body of this specific method. Now, I would want to call this method. So I'd want to execute the print hello world twice method. How do I do that? Is it sufficient if I say print hello world twice? Oops, it says function. So it says there's a function defined with that specific name. But what we want to do is we would want to execute. We would want to see hello worlds printed. How do we execute a function? How do we execute a method? Very simple. Add parenthesis and enter. Now we are able to execute the method. So what we have done here is we have defined a method called print hello world twice. From now on, whenever I would want to print hello world twice, all that I need to do is call this method. Print hello world twice and it would print the method in here. Now, I would leave you with two exercises based on whatever we have learned. Number one, write a method called say hello world thrice. It should print hello world thrice to the output and also invoke it, execute it. That's exercise number one. The exercise number two is to write and execute a method that prints four statements. I have created my first variable, I've created my first loop, I've created my first method. I'm excited to learn Python. So you need to print these four statements on four consecutive lines. So that's the exercise. Write these methods and I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. Welcome to the exercises. So we wanted to create a method called say hello world twice. It should be easy, right? So let's go back. So what we want to do is to define a method called print hello world thrice. And let's define it. Print hello world, print hello world, print hello world. Press enter again. That's it. We have defined a method called print hello world thrice and execute it. That's it. 
we are printing hello world thrice. The other method which we wanted to create, mm -hmm, it should be easy as well, sir. Write and execute a method that prints following four statements. One of the important things that you need to decide here is the name of the method. I have not really given it to you. So it's up to you to decide what the name of this specific method is. So you could have called it anything. So let's just say print your progress. Let's say that's the name of the method. So before that, I would need to give a def. At the end of it, I would need to give a colon. The method code, we would have, just before it, we would have spaces as the indentation. And after that, we would say print your statement one, next is statement two, next is statement three, next is statement four. I mean, I'm not typing in whatever was there, right there. You'd be able to do it yourself. And that's it. So I would say print your progress and we are able to execute the method. Now, you can pause the video in here and try another exercise. I'd want to print statement one, statement two, statement three, statement four on different lines using just one print statement. How can you do that? Try to pause the video in here and try it. So I want to use just one print statement and print exactly the same output as it is in here. Let's try it now. So def print your progress. Print, I can say statement one slash n escape characters. Did you forget about them? Slash n. If you remember them, that's good job. Slash n statement four. Now I just press enter. Now I can execute that. Oops, print your progress. Statement one, two, three, and four. One of the important things that you need to always remember is the difference between defining and executing a method. When we are defining a method, we are defining the body of the method. So what we are doing is we are starting with a def keyword. So def is a keyword in Python. I'm defining a method. And in the method, I'm having four lines of code. This is called method definition. So what we are defining is, okay, when somebody says print your progress, this is the four lines of code that you need to execute. That's what we are telling the Python interpreter. Over here, what we are doing is called execution of the method. We are saying execute the code of this specific method. What happens is all the code inside this method is executed. It's run by the Python interpreter and you would see the output in here. You are seeing statement one, statement two, statement three, and statement four. I hope you are having fun creating these methods. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we created methods. We said print hello world twice. And this prints hello world twice. This is the method which we created. We will start this video with a specific tip and then we would jump into something called arguments or parameters. What we are using right now is something called Python shell. The important thing about a Python shell is if you close this window, if you exit out of the Python window, if you say exit, go out of it and come back, then you would see that the definition of print hello world twice is lost. So remember that and if you want to be really safe, just scroll up, just drag and scroll up and copy the code and keep it. So before you exit, just copy the code and have a copy of it so that when you re-enter shell, you'd be able to copy it in. Now, that tip X aside, the thing which we are doing in here is print hello world twice. But then we did print hello world thrice, right? Three times. Let's say I would want to print it five times. What would I need to do? I need to write another method where I would print hello world five times. Doesn't that seem monotonous? Instead of that, wouldn't it be great if I can say print hello world and I would want to print it five times and it would print hello world five times wouldn't it be great that's what we would do in this specific step the five which we are passing in here is called an argument so we are invoking this method with five as the value before we would be able to invoke a method 
passing a value, we would need to define it. So how do we define a method to accept a argument? The way we would define a method to do that is very similar to the earlier method. So def name of the method inside the parenthesis we are going to give a name. So I would call this number of times. So the name of the parameter I'm defining in the method. So inside the method we define parameter. So the parameter which we are using in here is called number of times. We are saying this method print hello world uses a parameter called number of times. One of the things is if you have a little bit of experience with other programming languages, some of them would require you to say this is an integer, this is a string and all that kind of stuff. With Python, you don't need to define a type. So all that you need to say is number of times and put a colon and over here now I can for now just say print hello world and after that I would say print number of times and press enter enter so now we are defining a print hello world method we are not exactly implementing the logic which we wanted for now we just printed hello world and number of times which is passed in now let's try and execute this what would happen if I say print hello world aha error it says print hello world missing one required positional argument number of times it's saying hey you have created print hello world with a parameter you're not passing anything in here and that's not cool go ahead and pass something now let's call it again and let's now pass in a value so let's say I'm passing in 5 print hello world 5 and now you'd see hello world and 5 being printed so hello world and number of times is 5 that's cool isn't it so now we are able to define this method to accept a value and print it so now you can pass any value to this 10 100 and you'd see that being printed in here as well that's cool isn't it now you can pause the video in here and try and think of a solution where you can define this method to print hello world as many times so if I say print hello world 5 I want to print hello world five times how can you do that think about it pause the video in here and try it as an exercise I'm sure it's a very interesting exercise think about something called loops this was one loop that we discussed and probably you can use that to solve this problem try it as the exercise before you look up the solution now let's go ahead and see what the solution for it is so we would want to define the method print hello world number of times as with any method the inside the body of the method we would want to start with spaces that's one of the things you should always remember whether you're talking about a for loop whether you're talking about a method you should give spaces at the start to indicate that that is the content of that specific method so now I've given spaces and now I would want to print hello world but before printing hello world I would want to have a for loop so I would say for I in how many times for starting off what I'll say is for I in range of 1 to 10 oops I made a mistake you know what the mistake is try and debug it and think what is the error I missed a colon that's a mistake so for I in range again the important thing is starting from for so you can see that the I've given spaces one two three the same as these spaces that I've given for four and then inside the for loop I would want to execute this code so I would give even more spaces because I would want this code to be inside the for loop so what we are doing in here is we are typing in print and I would say hello world enter and again enter for now what we are doing is we are printing hello world 10 times let's execute it pass 5 oops another error it's saying name range is not defined think what is the error I made think about it it's very important that you would be able to debug things right so the important thing over here is 
the name of the function is small r so in range 1 to 10 and print hello world make sure that you have three cut 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 make sure that you have four spaces here and eight spaces before print and press enter enter and now let's try it again okay there you go success so print hello world 5 is now printing the hello world 10 times however what do i want to do i would want to do it only five times how can i do that think about it how can i do that for i in range one two let's start with number of times this is not perfect but let's start with it okay number of times make sure that you are giving the right amount of spaces press enter again and now execute it again you can see that it's printing four times only it's not printing five times the reason why it's not printing five times think about it because number of times is exclusive so it's not included so what i can do think about it i can say number of times plus one over here so def print hello world i can say for i in range number of times plus one print hello world and let's see what would happen now it's printing five times if i say seven seven times isn't that cool isn't that very very good function now so it's saying print hello world five times and we are printing hello world five times print hello world seven times and it's printing seven times all that we had to do was very simple def is the same as any other method name of the method we included a parameter called number of times we use that in the range function and did the print one of the things that you need to always be cautious about in python are the indentation over here the for loop is part of the method body so we have a indentation the print is part of the for loop so we have another indentation over here in this video we learned how to pass arguments to a method in the method we are defining a parameter and we are using it in the body of the method and when we are calling the method we can pass it as a argument so we are passing five as an argument seven as an argument in here and we are able to use that and execute it in the body of the method isn't that cool i'll see you in the next step until then bye, -bye. welcome back in this video let's look at a few exercises related to the method parameters the first one is to write a method called print numbers that would print all successive integers from 1 to n there is a simple catch over here there's a small mistake that i did try and catch it and ex write a method which would print numbers from 1 to n the second one is to write a method called print squares of numbers that prints squares of all successive integers from 1 to n you can pause the video in here try and execute the exercises and then look at the solution what we want to do is we would want to start with the exercise number one print numbers one of the important things is if you are programming in other languages and you are used to using this kind of a convention to name your methods print numbers remember that that's not how python programmers name their methods the way they would name it is using print underscore numbers so they don't use camel casing so in python typically we don't really use camel casing the way we would name our methods is print numbers and un print underscore numbers this is considered to be more readable than this it's kind of a debatable topic but let's not worry about it print numbers what we want to do is we would want to pass n so we would want to pass an parameter n and we are going to define a method so for i in range one to n plus one oops again the same mistake colon now i would want to give more spaces and then i would want to say print i let's now execute print numbers 
print numbers 5 1 2 3 4 5 isn't that cool it's very simple right so all that we needed to do was just loop around and print the numbers now def print squares of numbers right so squares of numbers is that the exact name that we had yep print squares of numbers n and what we need to do over here is the same range however we want to print the squares so i need to say print i star i isn't that cool the typical mistake is the indentation so one indentation here and two indentations over here so four spaces and eight spaces let's print squares of numbers print squares of numbers of five one four nine sixteen twenty five cool right so that's what we wanted to do in this small video we looked at a couple of exercises related to parameters for a method we defined methods with parameters and we passed arguments to it one of the thing that people usually confuse with is argument versus parameter right one of the things you can remember is inside the definition of the method it's called a parameter so n here is a parameter because it's used in the definition of the method but when you are passing a value here five five is a value passed the value passed to a method is called an argument so when you are invoking you use a argument when you are defining a method when you are defining the body of the method you would use a parameter the thing is this distinction is not really really important for a beginner either the parameter or an argument can mean absolutely the same thing don't worry about it in the invocation we would use a argument and in the definition we would use a parameter i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the previous steps we created methods methods with one parameter and we looked at exercises related to that in this step let's look at another important thing where you can create a method with multiple parameters how do i create a method with multiple parameters it's actually very simple let's take an example right here we are saying print hello world and we are saying number of times now this is cool but let's say i would want to print another string i would want to say print welcome to python 10 times how do i do that thing is i can create another method very similar to this right so def print welcome to python have number of times as a parameter and over here i can print welcome to python but is that what good programmers do nope good programmers try and make this method even more reusable so instead of doing this what we would try and do is create a new method saying print string so we would want to accept a string as a parameter so i'll say str is the string that i would want to print and number of times so print string hello world 10 times print string welcome to python five times so this is how the user of this method can use it so what's the trick in the definition of the method not a lot different from the earlier one so the loop remains the same for i in range number of times plus one one number of times plus one so earlier we did print hello world but now what we would do is print think about it what should it be it should be str because we would want to take the parameter and use it to print isn't that cool now let's see what happens now print string and hello world comma three times what would happen hello world three times now let's try and do welcome to python awesome isn't it that's very cool one of the important things to remember is let's say print string welcome to python error because it says i need number of times to be present in here so you need to pass in number of times four so now it says welcome to python four times now let's say 
you want to assign a default value for this so print string let's say the default string i would want to always print is hello world and number of times i would want to also default to 5 so if somebody calls print string then i would want to print hello world 5 times in other languages it might be difficult to create methods like this but python on the other hand makes it very easy how can i pre define a default value i can say print string str is equal to hello world so what we are doing is we are saying str if if somebody is not passing str then take the hello world and the other thing is number of times is equal to phi and now i can define the rest of the method for i in range 1 to number of times print str be careful of the indentation 4 spaces 8 spaces and that's cool now i can say print string what does it print hello world 5 times if i say print string welcome to python what does it do it prints welcome to python 5 times if i say welcome to python eight times it would print it eight times isn't that cool in this specific video we looked at passing multiple parameters we looked at a method which accepts two parameters we saw how easy it was to define a method like that with python after that we looked at passing default arguments what are we doing in here are called default arguments we are saying str the default argument is hello world here number of times the default argument is 5 i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back let's get back to the objective of why we started with creating methods in this section we wanted to create a multiplication table and we saw that each time whenever we need to create a new multiplication table we needed to make a change in the program so we needed to make this 7 for example and this is not something we liked and that's why we started investigating about methods in this step let's create a method for this multiplication table so how do we create a method very simple right def we need to give it a name so let's call it print multiplication table and we need to pass in a parameter so which table do you want to print that's the parameter that we would want to use here and over here four spaces let's type in for i in range of 1 comma 11 oops as usual i missed the colon so let's go ahead and now leave more spaces i'm leaving eight spaces in here and now i can type in print so you can see that the seven table is printed but instead of here it's printed as table as it is why is it printed as table because we did not use the curly braces around it let's try and put the curly braces around it for loop of table if we want it to be replaced by a value of table what do we need to do we need to put it in the curly braces isn't it cool let's now execute it now you have the entire print multiplication table now you can do print multiplication table 8 9 whichever one you would want to do and you would see that the code works as it is i would want to create even better print multiplication table method i would want to be able to control the starting point as well as the ending point i would want to be able to say print multiplication table 7 from 1 to 20 print multiplication table 7 from 2 to 15 and so on and so forth how can you do that you can pause the video in here and try it as an exercise now i'll show you the solution for that so table comma start comma end 
and what I'll do is in the for loop I use the start here and end plus one. End is exclusive, so I would say end plus one. And now I can say print f table into i table into i. Isn't this awesome? Now I can say print multiplication table and I can say 7 comma 1 comma 6. So I want to print 7 table from 7 into 1 to 7 into 6. That's exactly what we get in here. The other thing that we can obviously do is have a default value for the start and the end. So if let's say the default value for start is 1 and the default value for end is 10, what would happen now? After typing in this code, now if I type in this, I would get by 7 table from 1 to 6. If I just pass in 7, then I would get the print multiplication table from 1 to 10. So the 7 table is printed from 1 to 10 because those are the defaults that we have set in here. Now you can actually distribute this method and your friends can use it very easily by calling that specific method. I hope you are having a lot of fun solving these problems. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. One of the important things that you need to understand in Python is that indentation denotes blocks of code. So if you want to put something in a for loop or if you want to put something outside a for loop, just with indentation, you'd be able to do that. In this video, let's explore indentation in depth. So let's create a simple method. So let's start with def method to understand indentation and colon. Inside this, I'm giving a space because I'm giving four spaces at the start to say all the code here is part of this specific method. So if I would want to now write some piece of code in here, let's say I would want to execute a for loop for i in range 1 to 11 and over here. I'm giving even more spaces to print i, right? This would, we know what would happen, right? So when I execute this code, what, what do you think will happen? It prints 1 to 10. This is something which we have been seeing until now. Now, let's change a little bit in this method. And let's say for i in range 1 to 11, I'm saying print i, I'm pressing enter, and I'm just giving four spaces and saying print 5. So what do you think? Print 5, would it be printed one time or 10 times? Think about it. Let's execute the method now. You can see that 5 is printed only once because we have given four spaces, which is the same indentation level as the for loop. The print statement is not considered to be part of the for loop. It is considered to be outside the for loop. Let's change the definition right now. So de method to understand indentation and let's say for i in range 1 to 11, print i and I'm giving same spaces as print i and I'm printing print 5. Now what, do, what would happen? Think about it. So if I execute the method now, you'd see that 5 is printed inside each loop. So that's why you're saying 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4, 5. So what is happening here is this print 5 is being considered as part of the for loop. If you want something to be part of this loop, then it should be indented. If you don't indent it, then it's considered to be outside the loop. So whether you are talking about loops, whether we are talking about if conditions, whether we are talking about methods, indentation is very, very important in Python. In this video, we tried to understand the importance of indentation. 
in python we indicate a block of code by having all lines of that block at the same indentation level there are no specific delimiters like other programming languages there are other programming languages which uses open brace close brace but in python nothing like that it's just indentation which signifies whether something is inside the for loop or outside the for loop i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at a variety of puzzles related to methods one of the things which we did earlier was we created a method called print string where we had default values for the parameters so we said the default value for str is hello world the default value for number of times is 5 this is cool because this allows us just to call print string and it would print hello world five times but let's say i would want to print hello world but i would want to print it six times how do i call it pause the video in here and try and think about it i would want to print hello world but i would want to print it six times will it work if i say print string six what is happening what is happening is six is being passed as the first parameter so six is matching against str and it's using six and it's printing default number of times which is five what we want to do is we would want to use the default string hello world and print it six times how do i do that one of the ways you can do that in python is by using something called named parameters you can say number of times is equal to six this is a named parameter in languages like java there is no provision of doing something like this so print string number of times is equal to six mm -hmm. hello world is printed six times what we are doing in here is instead of define depending on position what we are saying is the name of the parameter we said print string number of times is equal to six so instead of using the default for number of times we would be using six for str we would continue using the default Name parameters is very useful when a method has a number of parameters and you would want to make it very clear which parameter you are passing the value for. It makes it sense to use named parameters. Now, let's call print string with 7, 8. What happens? You'd see that 7 is printed 8 times. So, over here, what is happening is str gets a value of 7 and print 7. Print is defined for a string, so it does not have a problem. So, instead of the str, I can send a string, I can send a number, even I can send a float. So, I am able to print 7.5 8 times. Because inside the method, I am just doing a print and print works with any type. Let's look at number of times. What would happen if I say 7.5 and pass in 8? I'm just kidding. I just, some string. So here the method accepts number of times as a parameter. But one of the most important things you need to note is how number of times is used. We are using it in the range method. In the range method, you can only pass in numbers integers you cannot pass in a string so let's see what would happen if i say 7.5 comma 8 it says error it says type error must not must be a string not int so you can see it's saying line 2 in print string it's saying there is a type error in here this cannot work in this specific way this would work but you cannot pass a string and expect it to be used as a number the simple rule of thumb in python is python by itself does not check for any type safety so if you have a parameter by default you can pass any type to it so you can pass an integer a floating point value a string a boolean value We'll talk about boolean values a little later true or false kinds of values 
so you can pass any kinds of values as parameters but it python will throw an error if the function which is using it expects it only of a specific type so the range function here it expects that the number of times is a number it expects that it is an integer value so in those kind of situations you would get errors but by default python does not prevent you from being able to call the function with a different type the last thing which we would be looking at in this specific video is the method names until now you would see the different names that we have given to our methods print underscore string print multiplication table print underscore multiplication underscore table print string this is exactly the format in which python developers name their methods this is kind of the convention using underscore to separate the words however there are a few rules associated with what you can name a method as and what you cannot name a method as one of the important ones are the basic rules related to variables right when we talked about variables we said a variable name cannot start with one so i cannot say one underscore print as the name of the method this would give us an error however you can start it with an alphabet or you can start it with an underscore but if you start it with a numeric value it would give an error but the second character can be a numeric value you can see that it's accepting a definition so if i say print something it would accept it as a proper method definition so as far as this is concerned naming methods is very similar to naming variables the other important thing regarding naming methods and variables is you cannot have a keyword as a variable name now what is a keyword when we talked about for loop we looked at this right so for i in range of 1 comma 11 we said oops colon print i so this is the code which we wrote earlier this for here is a keyword the in here is a keyword so for in when we define a method how do we define it we say def def and we give name of the method right this def here is a keyword later we would look at a few other keywords like while return if else else if you cannot have methods and variables with the same name as a keyword so you cannot have a def a method with the name as def as well so it would say error you cannot have a method with the name as in error you cannot have a method with a name as for because these are all keywords in python so you cannot have a method or a variable with the name as a keyword there you go that's a lot of stuff that we did in this specific video we started with talking about default arguments and we talked about named parameters before moving into the fact that in python there is no real type checking so once you define a parameter you can pass any type to it but the execution might throw an error if the method expects the argument to be a specific type the last thing which we looked at are the typical naming conventions with method names we prefer using underscores to separate the words as the name of the methods and we cannot use keywords as variable or method names we looked at a few keywords like def def which is used to define a method we talked about for in and other stuff as well i'll see you in the next video until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's try and understand the importance of return values from a method and we'll learn how to return a value from a specific method let's start with creating a very simple function so let's say i'm defining a simple method i'll call this product of two numbers and let's say i'm passing in a comma b and oops i missed the colon now uh, over here 
let's print a into b right so now i can use this method how can i call this product of two numbers one comma two what would it do it would print two to the output but can i take the product of these two numbers to a variable let's say i would want to use this in a calculation so i'll say product is equal to product of two numbers can i call a method and use the result let's see what's in product you'd see that it's empty so what is happening here is the product of two numbers one comma two is printing a value to the console but it's not really returning anything back so i'll not be able to use the value and do something later with it if you look at some of the functions which are defined in python for example one of the functions which is defined in python is something called max one comma two comma three it gives the maximum of all the values which are passed so it returns three if i return if i call it with four parameters it returns four the cool thing about this is i can actually take it into a variable so maximum is equal to max of this and later i can say maximum into five or i can print the value of maximum or i can do a calculation with maximum so if a function returns a value then we can take the return value and use it for other calculations this gives us more flexibility so instead of just printing a into b if this function returns a value back then it's much much more useful function because i can then take the value and use it now how do you define functions which return values let's look at that right now so the returning values from a function is very very easy so let's say product of two numbers and i would say a comma b i mean the example is trivial i mean product of two numbers you can easily do it by saying a into b but this is a very simple example so that we can focus on the syntax so let's say it's product is equal to a into b so i'm creating a variable product it would refer to a value a into b i'll use the same indentation and then over here i would want to return the product value back how can i do that i can say return product and now i can call product of two numbers two comma three it's returning a value of six or i can even say product result is equal to product of two numbers and i can print product result you can see that it has a value of six now i can do calculations with it as well you can see how simple it is to return values from a method right it's all about just a simple keyword return space product in this short video we looked at how to return values from a specific method we saw that it involves just a simple keyword return and returning the value back once we are able to return the value we can use the returned value to do whatever calculations that you would want to do until the next step bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at a couple of exercises about returning values from methods we'll write a method to return sum of three integers so write a simple method which accepts three parameters and it would return the sum of them back the second one is write the method which takes as an input two integers representing two angles of a triangle the two inputs are two angles of a triangle and you need to compute the third angle one of the important hints is the fact that sum of three angles in a triangle is 180 degrees so if i am passing passed in 50 and 50 then 50 plus 50 is 100 so the sum of it three angles should be 180 so 180 minus 100 is 80 so the third angle should be 80 degrees so you can pause the video in here and try those methods as an exercise 
let's get started we would want to calculate sum of three numbers right so def sum of three numbers a comma b comma c and oops colon and i can say sum is equal to a plus b plus c and over here i can say return sum and that's it now i can call sum of three numbers using one comma two comma three let's see what it would print it would print six so i can take it into a variable something is equal to sum of three numbers and i can then do calculations with something as well right so i can say something into five thirty right six into five which is thirty isn't that cool the shorter way of doing that would have been def sum of three numbers a b c and instead of having a temporary variable called sum i can say return a plus b plus c thing is when in the return you can use an expression as well so the expression gets evaluated and the value gets returned back so you'd see that the result will not change now as well so something into 5 would give you 30 back so this is even shorter way of defining the same method the second exercise is to write a method to take two in integers representing two angles of a triangle and compute the third angle how do we do that so def calculate third angle i'll give that as a name and i'll say first comma second colon over here you can create a temporary variable you can say third is equal to 180 minus first plus second or i can do return 180 minus first plus second do you think this would work give it a try do, if this would be the one which would be correct 180 minus first plus second if you don't have the parenthesis then you'd see that you would get an error so now i can say calculate third angle 50 comma 20 it returns 110 because 50 plus 20 is 70 180 minus 110 sorry 180 minus 70 is 110 in this short video we were looking at a couple of exercises related to return values one of the most important things that you need to understand is the fact that in your programming career you'd be writing a number of methods and it's very very important that you are comfortable writing a lot of methods and most of the methods that you write would return values back and that's the reason why we are creating a lot of examples of methods so that you get familiar with writing methods and in the subsequent sections when we create a lot of methods you are already comfortable doing that until the next video bye bye welcome back until now we had been using python shell to execute all our code in the real world we'll be using real python code written in variety of scripts before we would go into an ide and use the ide to write the script i thought it would be useful for us to understand how you can do python code without the benefit of an ide this will also help us understand the python environment in depth so in the next few videos we'll be looking at how to create a simple python script using any text editor of your choice notepad notepad plus plus or edit pad or whichever text editing software you are comfortable with so we'll create a simple script we'll see what's involved in executing it and what's happening in the background with it let's get started with creating a simple script file now i'm opening up one of the text editors i have it does not really matter which one you are using i'm going to create a new file and over here i would want to type in a simple python script or python piece of code right so print hello world does it get any simpler than this so all that i'm doing is print hello world i'm saving this and i'm saving it into a specific folder on my hard disk and i'm 
giving it a name first dot py. py is not really mandatory, but typically all Python files end with py extension. So I'm saying first dot py and I'm storing it to a folder that I know of. So make sure that you know which folder you're saving it to. Save it and after that launch your terminal. So launch up your terminal or launch up your command prompt from where you can run your Python shell. But the first thing you need to do is to cd to the folder where this Python script file is. In my machine, it's in the folder in 28 minutes courses notes Python recording. So I'm seeding to that folder and now I would use the same command which I used to launch up the Python shell. So if you're using Python 3.6 or whatever you you were using to launch up the Python shell, you would use the same thing followed by a space followed by the name of the script. So the name of the file first dot py. You can see that hello world is being printed. So let's now go and change the code. So first Python script. As simple as it. If you are familiar with other programming languages, then you'd know the fact that you need a class, you need to put the code in a class and all that kind of stuff. While Python supports object-oriented programming, it's not mandatory to create a class. You can almost see it as if you are typing commands starting from line one. So first command is this, second command is this. That's why we call it a Python script. Make sure that you are saving the code in here before you would execute it. Cool thing about Python is the fact that you can define functions anywhere. So I can say diff print hello world or we can actually do print string and we can say str comma times and over here you can now start writing your definition of the code. So make sure that you give indentation. So make sure that you are actually one, two, three, four, which is typically what we would do. So print string and I would say for i in range of one comma times plus one colon oops colon I leave enough space four spaces and now I can type in print str. Thing is you can also call print str print string and pass in hello world and say five times and you'd see oops hello world is printed five times so you can see how in a python script you can use inbuilt functions you can define methods and call it one of the important things that you need to note is the alignment so if you have the same alignment as the for loop, then this print string would also be considered to be part of the for loop. That's not what we would want to do. What we would want to do is we would want to execute that method. To be able to execute that, what I'm doing is I'm removing all the spaces before it so that this is considered to be similar to this. So just like this code is executed, this function is also executed and this contains the definition of the print string method. What I'll recommend you to do as an exercise is to add a couple more methods in here and start executing them. If you make a mistake in syntax of any of these stuff, so let's say I'm missing a parenthesis in here, what would happen? You can see that it says line to print there is an error, invalid syntax. So I would need to go in and say, okay, this is the line where there's an error. I can fix this or you can create an error and see what would happen. One of the important things you need to understand is fixing things. Whenever there's a problem, you'd want to be able to fix things. And one of the things you can try is remove specific things in your code and see what would happen. It says def print string invalid syntax. This would help you to identify errors at a later point in time. Cool, isn't it? In this 
small step what we did was we tried to create a simple python script and we ran it from the command line all that we needed to do was use the same command that we used to launch up the python shell and followed it up with a name of the file so we created a file called first.py so we were able to execute that and we were able to see the output on the console so let's quickly run it and you can see that this is working piece of code as an exercise try and add a few more methods and try to run those methods as well as part of the script and i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the previous step we wrote a python script and we executed it in this step let's try and understand what's happening in the background of all that so we wrote a simple piece of code using a text editor it does not matter which text editor we used using some text editor we created a py file we created first.py file and after that all that we did was do python3 first.py if you look at other languages like java for example there is a separate compilation phase and an execution phase but with python just this command does both compilation and execution we saw that as soon as we make a change and we run python3 first.py the change is compiled and executed as well in python there is an intermediate format called python byte code so whatever code we write is first compiled to byte code and then executed on the python virtual machine when we installed python we installed both the python interpreter and the compiler as well as the virtual machine so all these steps all the things that you see compile and run are run just with single command in python one of the most important things that you need to be able to understand about python is the fact that the byte code is not really standardized different implementations of python have different byte codes there are variety of python implementations like c python jython and pypy also called pypy the c python is a python implementation in c language jython is a python implementation in java language the byte code which jython uses is actually java byte code and you can run it on java virtual machine so the thing is python leaves a lot of flexibility to the implementations of python they have the flexibility to choose the byte code and they have the flexibility to choose the virtual machine that is compatible however the important thing is the byte code is tied to the specific virtual machine you are making use of so if you are using c python to compile the byte code you will not be able to use jython to run it you should make sure that whatever implementation you are using to compile is the same implementation you are using to run the code as well a lot of this sounds like boring theory don't worry about it as a beginner this might not be very important for you right now so it's very important for you to understand the process so whatever is happening is you are you are writing python code and when you run the command python3 first.py or the specific command that you are using what is happening is both the compilation and running so an intermediate format called byte code is created which is not really standardized in python and after that byte code is executed in a python virtual machine after that you see the output in here the idea behind this quick section is to give you a little bit of background on what's happening behind the screens i'll see you in the next section until then bye bye welcome back in this quick guide we'll help you install pycharm open up the pdf installation guide and you should have a installation guide section where you should see install pycharm community edition you can take the link from here or you can go to google and type in pycharm community edition download 
you can click the link which comes up first it says jetbrains.com pycharm download once you do that you'll go to a page where you can first choose your operating system so you can choose whether you are on windows or mac or linux once you choose that you can download the appropriate community version on the right hand side you see a community version and you can click the download once you click the download the download would automatically start you don't really need to do any of these stuff which is present in here if you are having a problem you can also use the direct link to download once you download pycharm all that you need to do is double click on the package which is downloaded so go to your download folder double click on the package follow the instructions and you can continue following all the defaults until you completely install pycharm when you launch a pycharm for the first time it should ask you for a theme where you can choose the default and after that you should see a screen like this pycharm you can create a new project or do something with it if you see the screen then you're all set to go ahead with the next step in the course pycharm is an awesome ide and i'm sure you'll learn a lot about it later in the course until then bye bye welcome back in this step let's launch up the pycharm IDE and let's create our first Python project with a Python script. We would want to be able to launch the Python script by the end of this step. Let's get started now. I'll launch up the PyCharm IDE. You'd see that it would take a little while to launch up at the first time and it would bring up this welcome screen. In this welcome screen, the important things that you need to focus on is the create new project. So what happens is we would want to create a number of Python files. All these files will be in something called a project. You can kind of think of a project as a collection of Python scripts or Python modules. We will talk about the exact terminology a little later, but to get started, let's create a new project. We will start by giving it a name. So what I would give is first Python project I'll put a 0 1 here and say create what PyCharm does is it would create a new project it's setting up the virtual environment to be able to run that after a little while you should see this tip of the day come up tip of the day is one of the features of PyCharm where it would give one tip whenever you launch it so if you are interested in the tips of the day then go ahead and see the tips or you can close the window or if you don't want these to be shown at startup you can say you can uncheck this checkbox and say close once the project launches up you can see a small window on the left hand side it shows the name of the project 01 first python project and right now there are not really any files in here let's now create our first python file using the ide so the way I can do that is right click new and you can say Python file and I'll give this a name of hello underscore world click OK and now I can go ahead and write my first Python program let's write a simple thing so let's say print hello world and save it you can do a right click here and say run hello world you can see the shortcut to be able to do that as well in here but for now let's do a right click and run hello world and you can see a small window coming up in here it shows the output it says hello world so what we did was created a file called hello world because we created it as right click new python file the extension py is automatically added in and inside that we wrote print and hello world and to run this all that we had to do was do right click run hello world and we were able to see the output in the console there might be a lot of things that you might not have understood during this specific step what we'll do during the subsequent steps is to look at each one of these things in detail we'll talk about the different windows you are seeing in here the run window the project window and also we will talk about other things about the pycharm id the 
the idea behind this step was to create your first Python project and create a simple script and execute it. And I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. Let's now start with a simple exercise. We created the multiplication table method in the Python shell. What we'll do now is we'll create the same thing but in a Python script of its own. You can pause the video in here and try and do it as an exercise. Okay, I hope you had a good experience doing that. If you are not able to go ahead and do that, this is how you do this. Right click, new Python file. What we want to do is multiplication table. So I'll call, create a new file called multiplication underscore table and say okay. And over here, we can define our method. So define print multiplication table. So which table start and end and colon. If you remember, we used the for loop. One of the things you can already see is as soon as I type in for f, PyCharm is showing for in here. This is called suggestions, auto suggestions. So as you start typing code, PyCharm would suggest you what you can do. So I'll say for and over here, I would say for i in range of start to end, what do you want to do? Actually, n plus one because end is exclusive put a colon in here and press enter one of the things you can already see is pycharm is indenting automatically we did not really have to type in spaces pycharm is automatically providing the four spaces at the start and i can directly type in the code which would be executed as part of the for loop what do you want to do you want to do print you want to use a formatted string and within the formatted string I can type in table into i is equal to table into i. So this would be replaces, replaced with whichever table we are passing in. i would be the index which is used in here. This is the variable here and table into i is calculated and the value would be replaced in here. We have defined the method. Now what I would want to be able to do is execute it. If I want to execute a method, if you press enter, the indentation would show you something here. So what I would want to do is not inside the for loop. So I would want to actually execute it. So I'll leave a blank line. I'll press enter again and press delete two times so that I can move the indentation back to the start of the line. Once we move back to the start of the line, we can write code to execute it. As soon as I type in print, you can see that there is an auto suggestion coming up. Print multiplication table and we can actually, you can see that even parameters are being shown. So it's saying end is unfilled, start is unfilled, table is unfilled. So let's say we want to print five table from one to ten. And let's do a right click, run multiplication table. You can see that there is an output which is being shown in the console. One of the most important things for you to understand is the indentation. Indentation is very important. If you write any code with the same indentation as the print over here, then it would be considered to be part of the for loop. For example, if I say print five, what would happen? This would be considered to be part of the for loop. And after each one of these things, you would see a 5 being printed. Or if I have print 5 indented at the level of the def, then this print 5 is considered to be part of the method. So it's considered to be part of the print multiplication table. So first it would execute this for loop and after that it would execute print 5. So if I save this and if, you, if I run this, you'd see that print 5 would now cons be considered part of the print multiplication table. So whenever I call the print multiplication table, the five table is printed. And after that, a number five is printed. In this step, 
we did a simple exercise to define the method for print multiplication table and execute it using the call. I will leave it as an exercise for you to try the default values and make multiple calls to the specific method. I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In the previous step, we saw that when we start typing code, IDE would automatically suggest things. We can probably, if you want to call print multiplication table, you'd be able to see the name of the method. It would show what are the parameters that needs to be passed to it, and that makes it easy to write code. In this step, we will explore one more important feature of IDEs. This is called debugging. With the debugging capabilities of the IDEs, you'd be able to run through code step by step. Let's do that and see what happens in this specific step. One of the things you need to do is add something called a breakpoint. Let's do that in here. So all that you need to do is click in here. So just click right beside the five. So we would want to stop the execution of the code at print multiplication table. So we would want to add a breakpoint. So just click there and you'd see the red thing highlighted in here, right? So that's basically what is called a breakpoint. And once you add in a breakpoint by clicking in here, what you can do is do a right click and say debug multiplication table. You can see the shortcut right here for your specific operating system. Right click debug. Once you start debugging, you'd see that a new window comes up at the bottom. This tool window is called debug. We'll explore that in detail a little later. Fair enough, let's focus on debugging this stuff. So what you'd see is this line is now highlighted in blue. What that means is this is the current line of execution. So what is happening in here is the script is executing. We are currently at line five and we are invoking the print multiplication table method. What we'll do in here is something called step into. We would want to execute the print multiplication table step by step. So what we need to do is we would need to do a step into. So just click the thing in here. You can also do a step into by going into run and choosing step into in here. What we'll do is we'll use it from the debug window. So I'll do a step into. And you can see once I do a step into that the parameters are passed. So you can see the values of all the variables in here. You can see the variables which are present right now are table, which has a value of five, start, which has a value of one, and end, which has a value of 10. And you can see that the line that is currently next for execution is for i in range start to end plus one. Let's now do a step over. The way you can do a step over is by this thing over here. If you do a step over, what would happen is this entire line would be executed and we would move execution to the next line. So step over. And now you'd see that there is a new variable present. There's a variable called i. i has a value of one right now. And let's do a step over again. And what happens now is the print statement is executed. Once the print statement is executed, the control goes back to the for loop. If you go to the console, you would see that this is printed. 5 into 1 is equal to 5. Let's go back to the debugger and let's run this line of code, the fur. So let's do a step over and you'd see that now the value of i becomes 2. And if you do a step over again, you'd see in the console that find to 2 is equal to 10 is printed. So basically what we are doing in here is called debugging. We are executing the program step by step. This is very useful in understanding how things work. So if we are doing something and you're not able to understand what's happening, then you can use this debug mode to be able to look at code in depth. You can see what are the variables, how the code is executing. I think debugging is an awesome learning tool and I would recommend you to use it 
as frequently as you can. You can either continue execution step by step by using step over or you can say step out and this would complete the execution of the method and take the control back to the script and after that if you do a step out again the entire program completes execution so if you go to the console you would see all the things that are printed inside the output let's now look at what is the difference between step over step into and step out in detail what i'll do is i'll make the same call five times so i'll have different tables executor 5 6 7 8 and 9 so we are calling the print multiplication table again and again inside our program right now let's now try and debug it right click debug so what would happen when i do a step into is we will go into the code of the print multiplication table so right now the execution is at this line so if i do a step into then what would happen is we would start debugging the code inside the print multiplication table on the other hand if i do a step over what would happen is we would complete the execution of the entire line and move into the next line we would not really go into this specific method into the details of that specific method let's start with doing a step over so i'm doing a step over right now f8 you'd see that the entire thing is executed and the execution now shifts to the next line so we are ready to execute line number six the entire method with call which happens from print multiplication table is now complete if you go to console you'd see that the entire five table is printed however now if i do a step into f7 what would happen we are going inside the code now if you see the variables you can see that we are now executing this call so we are co executing the call print multiplication table 6 1 10 and that's the variables that you'd see in here the other thing you can also see in here is the call trace you can see that we are executing multiplication table line number two and if you go here click here it would show the exact call that is being executed so it's showing okay we are executing this specific call 6110 and we are executing at this specific line right now now if we want to complete the execution of this method completely and get out so i would want to make sure that the entire method is executed and we want to get out in that kind of situation i would use a step out and if you do a step out it would complete execution of the current method and it would step out and now i would do a step over step over seven table is printed step over eight table is printed and i would do a step over again the nine table is printed and the program finishes execution so basically step over it would completely execute the current line and move on to the next line step into if there is a method call on the current line then we would start debugging the internals of that specific method the control shifts to the first line of that specific method step out is basically if your execution is in a specific method what happens is that complete method execution is completed and we would move on to the next line if you try and play around with this you'd be able to understand that very very easily from now on if you don't really understand any concept i would recommend you to try and debug it and try and make sure that you understand it before you move on to other stuff debug mode is very very useful as a learning tool i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back starting this video let's look at a few tips related to pycharm in this video we will look at one of the important things in pycharm which are called tool windows over here whatever we see in here is a project tool window over here what we see is a debug tool window if you do a right click run multiplication table then you would see something called a run tool window so all these tool windows provide us 
a way to execute different things. For example, using the project tool window, you can create new Python files, you can execute a search, or you can execute individual Python files or debug them or a variety of stuff. You can get a high level structure of how your project is, what are the different Python files which are present in there. The run window on the other hand shows the output. So when you run a program, what is the output that comes up? It also gives you the ability to rerun a program. So you can just use the green triangle button in here to run the program again. If you would want to remove the console or you would want to close it, you can just click the close button out here. So whenever you run a program, you open up the run tool window. It has provisions to clear the console and a variety of stuff. In the last video, we also explored the debug tool window in detail. So when we do a right click debug, a debug tool window opens up where we can see the current variables which are in range, we can see what is the output and we can also do other stuff. So we can do things like step into, we can see all the variables, the current call stack and all that kind of stuff. You can terminate debugging by click, clicking this, it will terminate the debugging. You can also see a list of breakpoints. So you can click this and see all the list of breakpoints which are present in the program. This also gives you the flexibility to mute breakpoints. That means you can temporarily disable the breakpoints so the program continues execution. The other feature with the debug window provides is you can evaluate expression. So you can click the, the window down here and you can say type in an expression. So let's say I would want to find out the value of table into 5. You can see the result in here or you can say table into 10 or you would want to execute a method call in here. You can do that as well in here. All that you need to do is type in the expression and press enter and you'll be able to see the value of that specific expression down here. I'll close this window. In this video, we looked at three important tool windows, project, debug and run. I'll see you in the next video where you'll learn a lot more about PyCharm. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the last few steps, we looked at different features of PyCharm. We looked at how to debug programs. We looked at different tool windows which are present in PyCharm. And in this step, we would be looking at a number of tips related to PyCharm, number of shortcuts related to PyCharm. You might be wondering, why are we focusing so much on the IDE PyCharm? The answer is very simple. At in 28 minutes, we think great courses not only teach you programming, but also enable you to be a productive programmer. And a big part of being a productive programmer is making the best use of the IDE. Let's say you're working on a Python project. What would you be using for most amount of time? It's your IDE. And if you're good at using your IDE, then you'll be really, really productive. And that's the journey we would want to kickstart by showing some of the important features of PyCharm. Let's start with some of the important shortcuts in PyCharm. Let's say I'm on this line and I would want to see the code of print multiplication table. Imagine that this is a big uh, thousand li line file and you want to see the code of the print multiplication table. The shortcut is Control B or Command B. So if you press Control B or Command B, you would see that we would go to the definition of the line. So let me just give a lot of empty space just so that it's clear. So Control B or Command B, just type it in here and you would start going to where the method is defined. The other way to do the same thing is just do a control or command and click the line of code. So once you press control or command and hover over any line of code, you can click on it. So you can click on it and you'd be able to see the definition. You can see that print multiplication table has parameters, table, start and end. And you can click it and you can go to the method. This is very useful when you are writing code. If you want to see the code for a specific method, all that you need to do is command or control and click it or use the shortcut command B or control B. If you're on Windows, whenever I say command, you should try and use control. Command is something which is specific to Mac. 
most of the shortcuts that use command in Mac are replaced with control in Windows. So if I say command J or command B, then on Windows, it's control B. All that you need to do is click the control button and press the alphabet B. The other useful shortcut when you are doing anything in PyCharm is when you type in any code, you can press control space. So if you press control space, then you'd see a list of options that you can use. So you can see when I type in print and press control space, you can see all the elements that might be the candidates for now. So I can see that there is a print method I can call or there is a print multiplication table method that I can call. I can choose any of them and I can type it in. So if you see it right now, it's suggesting me the parameter. So I'm saying nine, comma, the start is three, comma, end is five. So I would want to print the nine table from nine into three to nine into five. The shortcut is control plus space. The other important shortcut is control J or command J. If you type in command J, then you can see a number of inbuilt templates. So instead of writing the code fully by yourself, you can use these templates so if you do a control J or command J, you can choose, for example, if I want to type in a for loop, I can choose I trade. So it would print the basic template. Then I can say for I in range one, two, two. Or the other thing I can do is let's say I would want to execute this line inside of for. I can, I can do a control J or command J over here and choose I trade. And you can see that that line becomes part of the for loop. Let me do it again. What I'm doing is I'm putting the cursor at this line and pressing Ctrl J and I am choosing I trade. You can now loop around this. So I can say for I in range one, two, three. So this would execute two times. The other useful shortcuts are related to tool windows. So let's say I don't want to see the project tool window. I can press Control 1 or Command 1. And you can see that it disappears. Control 1 or Command 1. And you can have the entire screen for writing code. Once you would want to start using the tool window, press Control 1 or Command 1 again. And project tool window would appear. There are similar shortcuts present for run and debug windows as well. The run window shortcut is control four or command four. So you can see run window appears, disappears, appears, disappears. Control four or command four. And the corresponding shortcut for debug is control five or command five. Control five or command five. The other useful thing that you can do inside PyCharm is list to do's. In Python, any line of code which starts with a hash is called a comment. So what happens is if I put a hash here in front of this line, this line of code is no longer executed. So let's try that. So let's put hash in front of all these lines of codes. So I'm just putting a hash in front of these lines of code. And if you run this right now, you'd see that only the five table is printed nothing else is executed because this is called a comment. A comment is typically used to tell something about what you are doing inside the program. So over here, I can say I'm trying to print multiplication table phi. So typically, you'd put the comment before the line of code. So this is a comment explaining that I'm doing something. Typically, your comments would explain why you are doing something. If the code that you are writing is a little difficult to understand, you might write a few comments to make sure that other programmers are able to understand your code. You might also use comments to explain why you are choosing certain options. Maybe you have three or four options and you chose a particular way of writing the code. You might put a comment saying why you took that specific approach and why you did not take some other approach. Now, that introduction aside, one of the things that you can do as part of your comments is add to-dos. So you're writing a program and you would want to make sure that you don't forget something. 
you can put a to do as part of a command just put a hash to do colon and you can actually write a to do for you in here so i can say to do make sure i learn about if let's say that's the to do let's say i'll add another to do inside the hello world as well make sure that i learn about for in depth once you have a lot of to do's in your programs you can see all of them in something called a to do window the shortcut is control 6 or command 6 and once you press control 6 or command 6 you can see all the to do's listed in here you can see that in hello world.py there is a to do and multiplication table there is a to do this is very useful when you would want to remind yourself to make sure that you want to do something and if you want to look at all the to do's then we would use the to do tool window so the shortcut is control 6 or command 6 the next shortcut we will look at is called control 7 or command 7 if you press control 7 or command 7 you'd be able to see the structure of a program so you can see what are the methods which are present inside that specific file so if you have multiple methods you can see the structure inside that the structure view allows you to see all the methods you can directly navigate to a specific method and all that kind of stuff you'd see that the structure view would be very useful to us when we write much more complex files typically when we talk about python code files you'd be talking about a number of methods being present 10 or 15 methods being present in a single file so the structure view would help us to navigate through all that stuff the last shortcut that we are going to talk about is control shift a or command shift a if you press control shift a or command shift a a search comes up and you can type in what you want to do and you can execute that specific action so let's say i would want to run the program i would type in run and press enter and you can say that the program runs so it's command shift a or control shift a let's say i would want to debug i type in debug and enter you can see that now we are inside the debug mode if you want to comment this line of code control shift a and say comment and you'd see that that line of code is commented actually the shortcut to do that is control slash or command slash so you can just press control slash or command slash and every line would get commented and ide can make a programmer pretty productive and we wanted to show a little bit of magic around pycharm for you if some of these things were a little difficult for you does not matter at all i'm sure by the end of this course you would learn all the shortcuts and you would be able to understand everything that we looked at in this specific video about pycharm in this section we gave you a big picture overview about pycharm we ran our first python file we looked at a few different features about pycharm tool windows shortcuts and other stuff i'll see you in the next section until then Bye, bye welcome to this section where we would be talking about numeric data types and conditional execution we'll try and look at the numeric types including boolean data type and we'd also look at executing code based on conditions let's get started with the basic numeric data types earlier in the course we created variables of this kind number is equal to 5 value is equal to 2.5 the 5 here is a integer integers represent whole numbers so 1 2 3 4 5 6 or minus 1 minus 2 in python integers are represented by a type of int so the class for this particular thing is int if you type in type of 5 you would get int all the whole numbers all the integers are represented by a class int one of the most important things that you need to understand is that in python there are no primitive data types what does that mean that means that every value that you see in a python program is an object is an instance of some class that's the reason why we are able to do type of 5 and see int 
over here. In subsequent sections, we'll understand what is a class, what is an object, what is an instance. For now, the most important thing for you to remember is behind every value, there is a class. In Python, everything is an object, which is basically an instance of a specific class. Now, let's look at 2.5. 2.5 is a floating point value. So if I go ahead and type in type of 2.5, what would I see? You'd see it's of type float. So values of this kind are all floats. You have an integer value followed by a decimal value. You have a decimal point. So these are floats. When you perform an operation between two integers, there is a chance that the result of the operation is a float. So you can see 5 by 2, what is the result? It's 2.5. If I do 4 by 2, even then it's of a type float. So if you do a division operation among two ints, what is the result? The result is a float value. I can type in 4 by 2 and you can see the result. The result is 2.0 which is a float. In the earlier section, we looked at various operations that we can do over integer values, right? So we did 1 plus 2, which is 3. I can define two variables, i is equal to 10, j is equal to 2, and I can do i plus j or i minus j. I can do i divided by j and i star j. So these are all typical operations, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication. One interesting operation we saw earlier was i mod 2. What is the reminder when i is divided by j? All the operations that we looked at until now can also be performed on floating point values. So if I have a value 1 with a value of 4.5 and a value 2 with a value of 3.2, then I can do all the above operations on them as well. Value 1 plus value 2, value 1 minus value 2, value 1 divided by value 2, and value 1 mod value 2. You can do all these operations on floating point values as well. One of the things you are observing in here is the fact that value 1 minus value 2 is written in 1.2999999. Eight. So this is not really an accurate thing. That's one of the things you need to remember always about floating point values. Typically, if you are doing any highly sensitive financial calculation, you will not use floats to represent your values. You will use decimal when you want highly accurate calculations. The operations can also be performed between an integer and a float. So I can say i plus value 1 or I can do i minus value 1 or i divided by value 1. As you can see, the result of an operation between an int and a float is always a float. In this video, we looked at the two basic numeric types, int and float. All whole numbers in Python are represented by int. Other languages have types like short, long. Nope. In Python, you don't have any of those. And we use float to represent values with decimals. We saw the basic operations you can do between ints, between floats, and also combining both int and floats. Until the next video. Bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's do a simple exercise with numeric values. We would want to create a simple method called simple interest and pass three parameters, principal, interest, and duration in years. We would want to calculate the amount after the specific duration and return it back. You would also want to call this method with a few example values. For example, if you would want to call simple interest with $10,000 with an interest of 5% and 
and for five years. The correct answer would be 10,000. That's the principal. In addition to 10,000, you get the interest. The interest for one year is 10,000 into 0 0.05 because the 5 is the percentage of interest. That's 0 0.05. So that's 500 rupees per year and into 5, which is 2,500. So the correct result value would be 12,500. So this should be the value that should be printed. You can pause the video in here and you can try to write the program on your own. Now, let's look at the solution. I'll do a right click new Python file. I'll call this simple interest dot py. And let's go ahead and do our code. So we would want to create a function def simple interest. I think simple interest is not a really good name. So I'll say calculate simple interest. And I would pass in principal, that's the amount, interest, and duration. Let's put a semicolon down here. And over here, let's write the code. Now, total interest, how much would be the interest that would be charged? Interest into duration. Here, we are getting interest as a number. So we got it as 5. So to really convert it into interest, we need to multiply it with 0 0.01. So interest into 0 0.01 into duration. We need to also multiply by principal. So this would be the total interest. Total amount, what it would be? It would be principal plus total interest. And I can return total amount. That's cool, right? Now let's call this, calculate simple interest. Wanted to do it with 10,000, 5 and 5. Let's do a print of this. Let's run this. You can see that it's printing 12,500. That's cool, right? So we wrote a simple program, which simple method to calculate simple interest. We wrote a simple formula and we were able to do it. One of the things you would already see is the fact that I can actually uh, re replace the total amount completely. What I can do is do something called refactoring. What I do is right click, refactor, inline. So what it would do, what the inline does is it would remove the total amount variable and wherever total amount variable is used, it would replace it with principal plus total underscore interest. Let's see what would happen. Right click, refactor, inline. Okay, you can see that it's directly returning this back. I can also inline total underscore interest. Right click, refactor, inline. And you'd see that now it's returning principal plus the entire thing in one statement. One of the things I can always do is I can say principal into one plus this. What we are doing here is we are replacing it with, instead of doing a principal plus principal into interest, we actually took principal out and we said principal into one plus this calculation. Let's run this and make sure everything is fine. Cool, right? So we just wrote a very simple method to do a simple interest calculation. We also looked at how to refactor, how to remove unnecessary variables in our calculation. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this section, we are looking at numeric types. And in this video, we would be looking at a few puzzles related to these numeric types. We'll kind of look at a few corner cases regarding these numeric types. Let's create a simple variable i is equal to 1. What does this code do? i is equal to i plus 1. This is simple, right? i is equal to i plus 1. What would be the value of i after that? It's 2. There is a shortcut way of doing the same thing. i plus is equal to 2. What does it do? It increments the value of i by 2. Instead of that, I can also increment it by 1. i plus is equal to 1. What would be the value of i? 
Typically, in other programming languages, you can do something of this kind, I++. Do you think this would work in Python? Actually, no. There is no plus plus I or I++ plus plus in Python. In Python, if you want to increment the value by 1, I plus is equal to 1. That's what you need to do, and you'd see that the value of I is incremented. There are also all the corresponding operators. So you can do I minus is equal to 1. You'd see that the I value would be decremented by 1, or you can do I slash is equal to 1. This would divide it by 1. Actually, when you divide it by 1, actually nothing would happen. Or you can even multiply. So I can say I star is equal to 2. I becomes 2.0. One of the things you are already seeing is that whenever I do a division or a multiplication, an integer value becomes a float value. So now if you do a type of I, it would actually become a float value. It's no longer an int value. What you see here is also something called dynamic typing. In Python, the type of a variable can change in the program. Let's create a couple more numbers. Number 1 is equal to 5, number 2 is equal to 2. What would be the result of number 1 by, divided by number 2? You know it, it's 2.5, right? That's what we see until now. If you want only the integer value, so if you only want 5 by 2, 2.5, so you only want the result as 2, the way you can do that is by saying number 1, slash slash. So you use double slash and the value would be 2. So this is kind of the truncated value of 2.5. So number slash slash number 2, this is an operator which is kind of very specific to Python. So number slash slash number 2. You can also do something like this, right? Number 1 slash slash is equal to 2. What would happen? Number 1 is equal to number 1 slash slash 2. So 5 would be divided by 2 and that would be referred by number 1. So if I print number 1 now, what would you see? You'd see 2 because it would be having 5 slash slash 2. That's basically 2. The other operator we already looked at is 5 star star 3, right? This is power operator. So 5 to the power of 3, which is 5 into 5 into 5, which is 125. This can also be done by using POW 5 comma 3. So we have an operator as well as a method. The last things which we would be looking at are conversion functions. So if I want to convert an int value to a float or a float value to an int, how do I do that? So if I have a value called 5.6 and I would want to get an integer value out of it, how can I do that? It's by using an int method. Int of 5.6, this would return 5. It would truncate the value and it would return 5. However, if I would want to round it off, so 5.6 is more nearer to 6 than 5, right? So if I want to round it off, I can use a function called round. So round of 5.6, this would return 6. These are you convert floats to integer values. Either you'd use an int that truncates it or round which would actually take it to the nearest integer. So if I do a round of 5.4, it becomes 5 because it is more nearer to 5 than 6. Round of 5.5 would also be 6. The interesting thing is round can also accept number of decimals that you would want to have in the rounded value. So I can say 5.67 and I would say in the result, I would want one decimal. So it becomes 5.7. So the result would have one decimal value. So I can say 5.678. And I can say two decimals. It would be rounded off to 5.68. You can also convert an integer to float by using the function float. So float of 5, 5.0. In this video, we were looking at a few corner cases related to numeric values. We were looking at different functions that are present, different operators that are present with numeric values. And we looked at a few functions to convert into float and float to int. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. After looking at numeric types int and float in the last video, 
we'll now shift our attention to boolean data type in this step we'll introduce you to the boolean data type and look at a few examples of it now what is boolean right boolean is something which can be true or false in python true is represented by true and false is represented by false it's important to remember the fact that it's a capital t so if you do small true nope that's not right and same is the case with false so it's capital true capital false so this is usually used in cases when you have a boolean result right so is even is the number even or not so is even is equal to true is odd is equal to false what we are doing in here is we are creating boolean variables the boolean variables can contain two values either true or false let's create a simple variable i is equal to 10 i would want to find out if i is greater than 15 what do you think is the result false is i less than 15 what do you think is the result true so booleans are the results of the conditions so there are a lot of times in programs we would want to write conditions we would want to do something if a number is odd we would want to do something if a number is even and in all those kind of situations we would be using boolean variables let's now look at other operations that can result in boolean values we looked at greater than we looked at less than the other operations which you can do is greater than or equal to it's very simple right so if i is greater than or equal to 10 is that true yes but i is i greater than 10 it's false so greater than or equal to checks if the value is either greater than or equal to similarly is the case with i less than or equal to 10 i less than or equal to 10 true i less than 10 false the other operation you can perform is comparing the value of i if it's equal so i is equal to is equal to 10 is i equal to equal to 10 true i is equal to is equal to 11 false you need to distinguish the is equal to from the is equal to is equal to is equal to is a assignment operator what we are doing in here is we are making i refer to a value of 10 this is assignment however is equal to is equal to is comparison what we are doing here is we are comparing the value of i against 10 is the value of i 10 yes is the value of i 11 false this is typically a mistake which a lot of beginners do in this video we started looking at what is a boolean data type and we looked at a few examples of operations that can result in a boolean value i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the last video we were introduced to boolean data type and we looked at various kinds of conditions that result in boolean values in this video let's look at one of the places where we make use of booleans that's a if condition a lot of times you would want to execute code only in certain situations and in all those kind of situations you would use a if condition let's take an example let's say i has a value of 5 i would want to print something only if i is having a value greater than 3 how do i do that the syntax of if is very simple if followed by condition so the condition i want to check is i if i greater than 3 followed by a colon press enter leave four spaces as usual and now I would type print. I'll use a formatted string. I'll say i is greater than 3. Now I press enter twice. What do you think will be the result? It says 5 is greater than 3. Let's say i has a value of 2. What would happen if I execute the same statement? If i greater than 3 print this what would happen now you'd see that nothing is printed to the console so based on the value of i either this statement is executed or not that's what if helps us to do 
if statement is a very important part of programming because most of the times in programming you are writing conditional logic let's look at another example let's say i would want to do something specific if i is less than 10 so if i is less than 10 what i would want to do is print f i is less than 10 what would happen what what's the value in i 2 so if i press enter now what would happen 2 is less than 10 however if i change the value of i to 15 what would happen if i execute the same statement again you'd see that nothing is printed this line of code is not really executed the way you can think about a if is the line of code under the if is executed only when this condition is true if this condition is not true then this line of code is not executed at all a simpler way to look at it is if false print false this line will not be executed because the condition evaluates to false however if it's true what would happen whatever is printed in here so i'm saying true in here is printed out to the console let's now take two different numbers let's say a is equal to 5 and b is equal to 7 and i would want to compare them and print if a is greater than b so i would want to check if a is greater than b and if it's greater then i would want to print a is greater than b you can pause the video in here and try it as an exercise the way you can do that is very simple right so if a greater than b then print a is greater than b you'd see that nothing is printed because a has a value of 5 let's reassign a to 9 and execute the same statement again what would happen a is greater than b is printed right in this small video we were introduced to the if condition we saw that if condition allows us conditional execution of code only if this condition is true this statement is executed i'll see you in the next video where we would look at a few exercises with the if statement welcome back in this video let's look at a couple of exercises with the if statement let's say i have defined four variables a is one b is two c is three and d is four, five let's say i want to find out if a plus b is greater than c plus d i want to find out if some of the first two variables is greater than the sum of the next two variables if that is the case i would want to print a plus b is greater than c plus d to the console how do you write a if statement for that it's very simple right so if a plus b is greater than c plus d actually i don't need a parenthesis in a if in python so i can write something of this kind a plus b is greater than c plus d i would want to print a plus b is greater than c plus d what do you think will be the output yep you are right nothing would be printed because currently a plus b is 3 and c plus d is 8 so 3 is less than 8 so this will not be printed however if i reassign a to 9 and do this what would happen yep it would be printed to the console right this was a very simple exercise let's now take up another exercise let's say i have three angles of a triangle right so angle one is equal to 30 angle 2 is equal to 20 and angle 3 is equal to 60. i want to find out if these three angles form a valid triangle the hint is it's a valid triangle if some of the angles is 180 degrees so you can write a condition to check if these three can form a valid triangle if they do form a valid triangle print valid triangle 
you can pause the video in here and give it a try yep this is also very simple angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 is equal to 180 do you think this would work if angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 is equal to 180 I press enter nope this will not work because is equal to is an assignment operator it's not really a comparison operator what we would need to do is double is equal to if angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 is equal to 180 and now I can write the code in there so print valid triangle okay right now it's not a valid triangle because the sum is only 110 so let's change angle 2 and make it 90 now angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 would be 30 60 plus 90 which would be 180 degrees so let's execute the same code again mm -hmm. valid triangle this was a simple exercise to check whether a triangle is valid or not the last exercise is to check if a number is even or not so now i has a value of 2 i want to check if i is even if i is even i would want to print i is even how can i do that the hint is you can do that with one of the operators we talked about earlier okay i'll give another hint the hint is you can use the modulus operator it's very simple if i mod 2 so if the remainder when something is divided by 2 what should it be if it's 0 then print i is even what would happen i is even if i is equal to 3 if i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 print i is even nothing is printed to the console in this short video we looked at a few exercises related to the if statement i'll see you in the next video where we'll be talking a lot more about the if statement until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at the different operators that can be used on the boolean values these are called logical operators typical operators that you can do on a boolean values are and or not and xor let's look at all of them in this specific video so let's say we have a value true and the other value is false true and false is false so and is true only when both the booleans are true so true and true this would be returning true however if any of the boolean values is false then the result of this operation will be false so if i do true and false or false and true or false and false all of them return false so the logical operator and is true only when both the operands are true the next operation is or or is true if one of the operands is true so true or false is true false or false actually false or true is also true true or true is true and the last one is false or false is false so and is true and is true if both the operands are true or is true when one of the operands at least one of the operands is true not returns the opposite of the operand so not of true is false you can also call this like this not of true is false and not of false is true not of false is true again xor on the other hand is true when both the operands are having different values when one of them have a value of true the other one has a value of false xor returns true so if I have true and I do a XOR of true, what would happen? False. However, if I do a true XOR of false, what would I get? It's true. False XOR of true, true.
false XR of false is false. So, in summary, the operators which we looked at are AND, OR, NOT, AND XR. AND is true when both operands are true. OR is true when at least one of the operands is true. NOT reverses the value. So, it makes true as false, false as true. XR is true when both the operands have different values. One of them has a value of true and the other one has a value of false. Typically, these are all called logical operators. In the next video, let's look at a few exercises and puzzles related to these logical operators. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a few simple puzzles to look at the logical operators. Let's say i has a value of 10 and j has a value of 15. I would want to find out if both i and j are even. How can I do that? The way I can do that is by saying uh, if i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 and I don't really need an open parenthesis so I can say i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 and j mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 print i and j are even. What would be the output? Nothing. Because i and j are not together even. Right? This is true, but this is not true. So, in a end, if one of the statements is not true, then it will not print it. Both of these should be true for the statement to be executed. So, let's make j value as 14. Now, if I execute it, what would happen? Cool. I see i and j are even being printed. Now, I want to find out if at least one of i and j is even. How can I do that? Think about it. The way I can do that is by using a or. So, oops, let's try it again. At least one of i and j are even, right? So, it prints this. If i has a value of 15, what's current value of j? It's 14. So if I execute the statement again, what you'd see? You'd see that at least one of i and j are even because j is still even. Now let's make j odd. What would happen? j is equal to 23. What would happen now? Nothing will be printed because i has a value of 15, not odd. j has a value of 23, not odd. If at least one of them is even, then this statement would be executed. If both of them are odd, this statement will not be executed. This is when you would use an OR condition. Now, try and guess the value of this. If true XOR false, let's get the syntax right. If true XOR false followed by a colon, print, this will print. The question is whether this will be printed or not. With an XOR, this will be printed. The same would be the case if it's false XOR true. Right? So this would be printed as well. Now, what would happen if both of them are true? Will it be printed? Let's see. Nope, it's not really printed. So you'd use XOR in situations where you'd want one of the operands to be true and the other to be false. Let's say x has a value of phi and I would want to check if x if not of x is equal to is equal to 6. Print this. What will be the result of this? Think about it. What would be the result? x has a value of phi and I'm doing if not x is equal to is equal to 6. Print this. Will this get printed? or not. It's getting printed. Because x is equal to is equal to 6. This is false. Not of false is true. So this gets printed. However, if x had a value of 6, what would happen? This will not get printed. Actually, the thing is, there is a shortcut operator for this. x not equal to 6. 
So, if you want to check not of x is equal to is equal to 6, you can do x not is equal to 6 and you can say print this. Now, it does not get printed. If x has a value of 5, it get printed. Cool, is not it? So, this is a shortcut. So, x not equal to 6 is a shortcut for not of x is equal to is equal to 6. Now, let us do something interesting. I will do a int of true. Earlier, we understood that int is a function to which if you pass a value, float value, it would return an integer value. So, if I say int of true, what would happen? You can see that it is a capital T that I am typing in. It returns 1. If you type in int of false, what does it return? 0. One of the most interesting facts about Boolean stuff is anything which is non-zero is considered to be true. 0 is the only integer value which is considered to be false. So, if I have a value of x to be minus 6 and if I say if x print something, what do you think will happen? Will it be printed? The thing is it gets printed. That is one of the things you need to understand. Any non-zero value is considered to be true. The only value which should be considered to be false is 0. Be careful in your code if you are actually doing something of this kind. This will be true for negative values, positive values, all values except for 0. You can try the function bool to convert integers to a boolean value. So, you can say bool of 6, it returns true. Bool of minus 6, it returns true as well. Bool of 0, what does it return? False. So, except for bool of 0, all the other things, you would see that it would return true. So, we can use int to convert a boolean to an integer and bool to convert a integer to boolean. In this video, we started with looking at a few puzzles related to the logical operators. We looked at few things related to AND, OR, X or NOT. And at the end, we looked at how to convert a int to a boolean and a boolean to a int. Until the next video, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let us look at two other important components of a if statement, else and elif. Let us start with else. Let us take a scenario when i has a value of 2. What I would want to do is I would want to print, if i is an even number, I would want to print i is even. Otherwise, I would print i is odd. Earlier, we wrote code like this, right? So, if i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0, what does that mean? If i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0, then print i is even. We did this earlier. However, if this condition is not true, I would want to do something else. I would want to print i is odd. How can I do that? That is where else comes into picture. You can type in else colon and print i is odd and semicolon. So, you can see that i right now is even. Now, if I say i is equal to 3, then the condition of the if would be false. So, the else would be executed. So, if you look at it right now, what would be printed? It would print i is odd. So, the way else works is if this condition is not true, if the if condition is not true, then the code inside the else gets executed. The next thing which we would want to look at is elif. I would want to do something if i has a value of 2. I would want to do something else if i has a value of 3. And I would want to do something else if i has a value of 4. How can I do things like that? That is where elif comes into picture. So, if i is equal to is equal to 1, what do I want to do? I would want to print i is 1. 
actually in all the earlier examples i don't really need a semicolon because in python you don't really need a semicolon so if i is equal to is equal to one print i is one now i would want to have another check in here i would want to say else if i is equal to is equal to two so if i is equal to is equal to two then i would want to say print i is two else i would want to print i is not one or two so what would happen the current value of i is three so if i is equal to is equal to one print i is one else if i is equal to is equal to two print i is two else print i is not one or two what would happen think about it it prints i is not one or two so the way else if works you can read elif as else if so if this condition is true do this else if this condition is true do this else do this so if both these conditions don't match then this code is executed if either of these conditions match then that specific code alone is executed what we'll do now is we'll switch over to our ide and try a few programs with if and else if so i'm going to create a new python file right click new python file and i would say elif examples and i'll assign a value of i is equal to 5 and if i is equal to is equal to 1 colon print i is 1 elif i is equal to is equal to 2 print i is 2 else print i i is not 1 or 2 now let's fix the compilation errors there should be a colon here there should be a colon here right so make sure that you have a colon here the parentheses are not really mandatory so i can do this as well this is cool as well and let's run this program right click run elif examples and you can see the output is 1 i is not 1 or 2 so if i is 1 what would be the output it prints i is 1 if i is 2 what would happen this code is not executed so it would go here and it would print this let's see what would happen i is 2 is being printed in this quick video we looked at two important components of the if statement we looked at else and elif elif is like else if so if this condition is not true then this condition will be checked if this condition is true then this code is executed if this condition is not true then it would go to the else the interesting thing is the fact that you can have multiple elifs so i can have if something like elif i is equal to 3 and say here i is 3 and i can say here i is not 1 or 2 or 3 so you can have multiple elifs and else is the last thing inside the if block i'll see you in the next step where we'll talk about a lot of other stuff until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's do a simple exercise with if else and elif before getting to the exercise let's try and learn how to get a input from the user until now we had been hard coding all this stuff so we were saying i is equal to 2 or i is equal to 5 so we were hard coding all the values but now let's try and get some input from the user how do i get input from the user let's create a new python file and find out so right click new python file and i would say input as the name of the file and over here what we want to do is we would want to get a input from the user we would want to get input from the user and put it to a variable the way we can do that is by saying value is equal to input so input is one of the methods which is present in python i can call the input method with a 
prompt i can say enter a value what i'll do here is i'll print the value which was entered so i'll say print you entered space value let's see what would happen when we run this run input it's asking enter a value here so i would say test and it says you entered test one of the things about whatever value it's being captured in here is the type of that specific thing let's see what the type of it is so i can we do that we can say print type of value let's see what would happen run this again test so you can see that it has a class of string so this is kind of a text value let's run it again and enter a value i'm entering numeric value 12 let's see what would have happen even though i entered a numeric value it still has a class of str what i would want is i would want to get a number as an input the way i can convert a string to number is by using do you remember which function yep it's int function so what we can do here is we can say integer underscore value is equal to int of value so we can call the int function to get the integer value and now you would see that i would actually replace integer value instead of value and let's run this enter a value i'm entering 15 and now it says you entered 15 and the type is int the reason i would want it to be an integer value is later we would want to be able to do operations on top of it now now that you know how to capture an int value from a user what we want to do now is we would want to write a simple program we would want to design a menu so what we want is we would want to ask user for input we would want to ask him to enter two numbers and we would want to ask him to choose an operation add multiply divide or subtract so add is one multiply is two divide is three and subtract is four so we would want user to enter two numbers and choose an operation and based on whatever operation user chooses we would want to be able to show the result a sample execution is shown in here we would want to be able to say enter number user enters two enter number user enters four and then we print the menu we say one is add two is subtract three is divide four is multiply and we would ask him choose the operation and he's choosing four that basically means he wants to be multiplying the values and we would print that the result is two into four which is eight if he chose one as the operation then we would do addition and we would do two plus four and we would show six as the output so try and think how you would design a program like this how you design a menu like this you can pause the video in here and you can try this as an exercise let's now go and look at the solution what i'll do is i'll create a new file right click new python file i'll call this number underscore menu and the first thing which we want to do is we would want to be able to get the input from the user so let's get the two numbers as input so i would say number one is equal to input of enter number one next one is number two is input of number two one of the important things is input gives us a string so i would want to be able to convert that to in so i'll directly call int on top of input so what we are doing in here make sure that the parentheses match so we are getting the input and we are converting it to a int value directly in here we are not creating another temporary variable for that so what we are doing in here is number one is equal to int of input enter number one so once user enters a number it's a string it would be automatically converted to an int and i'm taking it into number one and number two is equal to that for now 
let's just print number one plus number two let's see if this works fine before we go any further we, it's better to take step by step so enter a value oops the wrong program is being executed so let's kill this let's do a right click run number menu now it's executing the right program enter number one i would want to say 12 enter number two i want to say 15 and it's printing 27 that's cool now what we would now want to print is the menu right so i would say print The shortcut to copy the line is Control D or Command D. So it copies the same thing again and again, Control D or Command D. And the first one is add. The second operation is subtract. The third operation is divide. And the fourth operation is multiply. And after that, you would want to again get the choice from the user. So we would say choice is equal to choose operation. I would want to have a few new lines at the start just to give some space. Let's go ahead and print the choice before we do anything with it. Print choice. Let's see what would happen. Enter number one. I would enter 10. Enter number two, 20. And Let's say the operation I would want to choose is 1. It's not really important. So you can see that it's by default doing addition, number 1 plus number 2. That's cool, 30. And it's printing the operation which was chosen. That's cool as well. You are all set to continue with this exercise and write the if condition that is needed to perform the operation as per the choice of the user. I'll end this part of the step in here, writing the if condition, I mean the if, elif and the else condition as an exercise from here and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Let's continue the exercise in this video and complete it. So in the previous step, what we did was we got the input from the user. Now, we would want to use the input and write a if condition. So, if choice is equal to is equal to 1, what do you want to do? You'd want to print number 1. So, choice is addition. So, we would want to print number 1 plus number 2. All right. If choice is equal to is equal to 2, what do we want to do? We'd want to print number one minus number two. Actually, we can use a elif because if this is not true, then we would want to check for choice is equal to two. Choice cannot be both one and two at the same time. So elif is the right option. So elif choice is equal to is equal to three. If it's three, we would want to divide. And the last one is else print number one into number two. Is this cool? So let's see what would happen. And number one, 10, 20, the operation, let's say four. It's printing 34 and 200. So the values which we entered are 20 and 10. So 10 into 20 is 200 and that's the value that's printed. What I'll do is I'll comment out these two things which are present in here which are kind of confusing it so let's put a hash to comment them out pause the video in here and try and think about two things which you can improve in this piece of code there are a few situations in which this piece of code will not work think about what that situation is let's run this again and let's say 10 20 and I enter an operation 6. What would happen? It still does multiplication. So what we need to do in here is we need to actually do elif choice is equal to 4. Print number 1 into number 2. Else, what does this mean? 
this means that it's invalid choice right if the choice is not one two three or four then it's invalid so this is much better implementation than the earlier one because earlier we were assuming that if it's not one two three then it's four and we did the multiplication so this is a small improvement in the program the other improvement which we can do is you can look at the fact that everywhere we are actually actually doing a print so we are doing print five times the other thing which we can do is we can take the result into a variable so we can actually take this value into a result so result is equal to number one plus number two over here what's the result result is number one minus number two result is number one by number two and over here it's result is number one into number two and we can remove all the prints from here so we are just calculating the result inside the if over here result is equal to invalid choice we are calculating the result in here and at the end we can print the result out let's see what would happen now 10 20 i would want to do a multiplication and now it's printing 200 as the result this is more a matter of personal choice if you are okay with having print done five times that's cool too but i like calling the function once so this enables me to have all the results present so all the, the result is present in a variable so either i can print it or if i create a function then probably i can do a return result as well so it gives me the option either to print it return it or use it in some other calculation in this exercise what we did is we got some input from the user based on the operation that user selected we used a if elif and an else to calculate the result and print it i hope this was an interesting exercise for you to solve i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the previous videos we looked at if elif else we did a couple of exercises with that and in this video let's look at a few puzzles related to if elif and else let's start with the first puzzle try and guess what would be the output so try and spend some time reading this code and guess what would be the output now let's go ahead and execute right click run if puzzles you can see that the output is two this is what is being printed this is very simple example right so if k greater than 20 so k has a value of 15 is k greater than 20 nope execution goes to the elif k greater than 10 yes so it prints 2 and it does not print anything even though these conditions match right so k less than 20 is true but 3 will not be printed because inside a if complete statement with elif and else only one block is executed so once this is executed the execution comes out and it will not print anything else now let's look at this puzzle so what do you think would be the output of this particular piece of code l is 15 if l 20 less than 20 print this if l greater than 20 do this else do this what would be the output let's run this and find out l is less than 20 and who am i because there are two different if conditions in here you can look at the code here you would see that there is a if condition if l is less than 20 do this if l is greater than 20 print this else do this so this condition is true so this line is executed this condition is false so else is executed and who am i is printed now let's look at this interesting puzzle so m is 15 and if m greater than 20 if m less than 20 and so on and so forth you can try and look at this code and try and guess what would be the output of this program let's run this again you can see that nothing is printed the most important thing in here is what is called indentation you can see that this if is part of this if so if m greater than 20 is m greater than 20 nope so what happens is the entire if block is skipped so this if block is starting from here to here 
so the entire code which is present in here gets skipped because of the way it is indented so even though m less than 20 would have been true if it was executed the execution never comes there because this code is part of the if block and this condition is not true so this if block is not executed at all i would recommend you to try and play around with this to understand this even more now let's look at the next puzzle number is equal to 5 if number is less than 0 number is equal to number plus 10 number is equal to number plus 5 print number what would be the output the output is 10 because number is 5 so number less than 0 nope so this line is not executed this line is executed 5 plus 5 is 10 and the number is printed now what would be the output if I just format this so I'm adding two spaces and I'm running this what would be the output the output is 5 in Python a block is determined by indentation so as soon as I left two spaces in here this line becomes part of the if statement so if this condition is not true then this statement also is not really executed so this statement is not executed so only the initial value of number would remain as it is and 5 is what is printed in this video we looked at a few puzzles related to if else and elif I hope you had an interesting time during this section where we talked about a few numeric types and we are now talking about if condition we learned about numeric types we learned about booleans we, we learned about conditions and we learned about the if statement until the next section bye bye welcome back in the previous section we looked at numeric types and booleans in this section let's start with another important data type in python strings we'll look at the different things you can do with strings and look at a number of puzzles and exercises with strings in this specific section let's get started with the basics of string earlier in the course we had created a number of string values right so we said we can put anything between double quotes and that becomes a string in python you can also use single quote so either double quotes or single quotes and you would have a string value can i do this what do you think one single quote and one double quote you are right nope that's not allowed so the way it is is either use single quotes or double quotes one of these is fine once you create a variable of that particular type you can check the type of it use the type method and say type of message it shows that it belongs to a class str so in python all the text values are represented by a class called str this stands for string the python string class provides you a lot of features and you can do a variety of things with this string object let's look at some of the important methods which are present in this string class in this specific video now we have a message right so i would want to convert it into uppercase how can i do that upper so you can see that all the characters are converted to uppercase i would want to change it to lowercase how do i do that message dot lower let's change the value of message let's give it a new value let's say it's hello now what you can do is you can also do something called init capitalization I can say capitalize what happens the first character alone becomes a capital one of the things is whatever we are doing here instead of creating a message variable you can directly call methods on string on text directly so I can say hello dot capitalize and what does it return hello isn't that cool because each of these texts is an object is an instance of a specific class we can directly call methods on them so hello dot capitalize you can also do single quotes as well so single quote hello that's 
allowed as well. Now, let's shift our attention to looking at methods which gives us more information about this specific string. We want to find out if this string contains numeric values, does it contain alphabets, does it contain alphanumerics, is it lowercase, is it uppercase, and all that kind of stuff. There are a variety of ease methods which are present in string. Let's look at all of them right now. So, hello dot ease lower. What does it return? True, because this is all lowercase. If I do the same thing with a H caps, is lower? Nope, it's not. The, the other thing you can do is, is title. If the first letter is a caps, then is title would return a true back. If, let's say, I execute this on hello, it returns a false. It checks if it's a title case. Similar to the is lower, you have a is upper method as well. So if I say is upper here, what would happen? False. However, if I say this, what do you think? This will also return false. Now, I change this further and say, hello. This is returning true back. This contains all capital letters. And so, is upper returns a true. So, this is how you check if a string contains all lowercase, all uppercase, or it contains title case. Now, I would want to check whether a string contains numeric values. How do I do that? One, two, three dot is digit what does it return two if i make one of them a it returns false back if i give a space in between nope it's not a digit right there's a space so if all the characters in a string are numeric then is digit would return true similar to that there is something called is alpha is alpha checks for alphabets so, 2, 3 dot is alpha? Nope. 2, A dot is alpha? Nope. A, B, C dot is alpha? Yep. There is also a method called alphanumeric. Is all num, interestingly named, is all num, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, true. However, if I put a space in between, space is not alphanumeric, so it returns a false back. The last method that we'll look at in this specific video are things which you can use to check the start and the end characters of a string. So let's say I have a string, hello world, and I would want to check if it ends with a specific thing. The way I can do that is by saying ends with, and I can say world. Does it end with world? Yes. Does it end with LD? Yes. Does it ends with old yes does it ends with wo nope because wo is in the between in between the string and not at the end of it similar to that there's a method called starts with so starts with you can use to find out if uh, first characters of the string are this specific thing so it returned false if i do he yep true hello oops i pressed a zero so hello that's true. The other thing you can do is you can actually use a file method to search a string. So I would want to find the find hello in this specific string. You can see that it returns zero. The way it works in a string is indexes start with zero. So H is zero, E is one, L is two. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So where is hello starting at? Hello is starting at index zero. So, if I execute the same thing with hello, you'd get a index of 1. However, everything with strings is case sensitive. If I do this, it would return a minus 1, saying it's not found. So, if I'm searching for something which is not present in this string, let's say bello, <laughs> uh, it returns a minus 1 back. And as I said, it's case sensitive. So, if you are searching for E L L O with a capital E, nope, you'll not be able to find it because hello world only contains small E L L O and not one which is starting with a capital E. So the find method, if it finds the string, it returns the index of the starting character. If it does not find it, then you would actually return a minus one 
back. In this short video, what we did was we looked at all the basic methods that you can execute on strings. We started with methods like upper, lower, capitalize. After that, we switched into a number of methods which kinds of check the content of a string. We looked at is lower, title, is upper to check if those strings are lowercase or uppercase or they contain digits or they contain alphabets or they contain alphanumeric values. At the end, we looked at things which help us check the content of a string. Does it start with something? Does it end with something? Does it contain something? We use the find method to do that. This is just the start of an interesting journey with text. We will use text and strings extensively during this course here on. We'll learn a lot more things about strings in the subsequent videos. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this short video, we'll be looking at different puzzles related to conversions of different types. So until now, we learned about the numeric types, int and float, and we looked at the Boolean type as well. And now we have learned about the string type. So we'll try and convert these values from one type to another and try and play with them. So what do you think would be the converted value of this? str of true. str here stands for string. And what is the type of true? True is a Boolean. So it returns string. Similar to this, you can also do bool of true. What does it return? Yep, it returns true as well. However, what does this return? It returns true as well. What does this return? True. False. Now, if I do a bool of false, what do you think it will return? true again. Now, if I do a bool of empty string, aha, finally we get a false. The important thing to remember is all string values which contain any content in them are all representing trues. So, if you are trying to convert a string to boolean, the conversion is not based on the content of the string. I mean, if you have any content in the string, then it becomes a true. Only empty strings would return a false value. So that's something which you need to always remember when you are converting strings to booleans. We started with trying to convert strings to boolean and booleans to string. Now let's try and convert a few integer values to strings. So str of 1, 2, 3. What does it return? Obviously it returns 1, 2, 3. The thing is, you can convert integers to string or you can convert float points to string as well. The str method works as expected with integers. However, the conversion from string to integers is much more interesting, right? So I have a string 4, 5 and I'm trying to convert it to int. It returns 4, 5 back. Now, if I do 5, 6, you'd see that it throws an error. It says I cannot convert it into a int. 45.56 is an invalid integer. So anything that you do to break this would throw a value error. It says this is invalid value. This is not a valid value for an integer. One of the things that allows you to do 45, let's say I would want to say ABC, is to say, specify a base. So what we are doing in here is we are using hexadecimal. We are saying the base is 16. So we would want to convert this string into an int using a hexadecimal. So that's what we are doing in here and that's why this works. Int of 45 ABC comma 16 returns a hexadecimal number. So if you know hexadecimals then A stands for 10, B stands for 11, C stands for 12 and until F which is 15. If I try something which is not valid by a hexadecimal like a g, obviously you would get a value error. So you can convert hexadecimal strings to integer by passing the base as 16. Similar to int, you can also convert strings to float. 
so I can say 34.43 and this becomes a float value however as discussed earlier any invalid values would throw a value error okay in this quick video what we did was we looked at converting different types to strings and converting strings to different types so we looked at boolean int float and we looked at how to convert them to string and how to convert strings to those specific values i'll see you in the next video until then bye bye welcome back in this step let's learn a important fact about strings in python the thing is whatever strings that you create are immutable what does immutability mean and why do we say strings are immutable that's basically what we will learn in this specific step so let's create a very simple string message is equal to hello and i'm saying message dot upper what does it print hello with a caps cool right however what, what would happen if i print message it says hello right so you'd see that the original content of message did not change what happened is when we call message dot upper a new string is created and it is returned back but the original content of this string remained unchanged this is called immutability thing is once you define a string in python you will not be able to change the value of it a lot of people say okay i can do something of this kind message dot upper what would happen now will the value at message change it prints h e l l o all caps hello did the value at message change does this prove that strings are mutable you can change the values of strings nope they aren't the important thing you need to understand about all this stuff is how objects are stored inside python what we'll do now is take a behind the screens look at how things happen in the background when you do something of this kind let's say we are starting afresh we are starting from zero and this is the visualization this is kind of a very very toned down very basic representation of how things are represented in memory there are things called variables and there are things called objects when you are saying message is equal to hello what you are doing is you are creating one variable called message and you are creating one object of string class called hello so what would happen is in the objects you are creating an object with content hello let's say the location for this is a the way it works in python is your variables are nothing but a name so you can say message and the location would be stored as a the thing which is happening in here is message is referring to location a and location a contains the content hello so when i say message is equal to hello this is what is happening in the background when i say message dot upper what would happen what would happen is a new thing would be created at a location b however we did not create any variable for it so it's just printed out to the console you can also decide okay i would want to take this and create a variable so i can say message underscore upper is equal to message dot upper what would happen what would happen is there would be a new variable created message underscore upper and it would be pointing to location b you can see that the original content remains the same so even though i'm calling message dot upper the original content of the object is unchanged let's say now i'm saying message is equal to something else a b c what would happen what would happen is a new value a new object a b c is created c and message would start pointing to c instead of a so the thing you need to understand is that 
the variables that we create are just names referring to a location. They don't really contain the value. The value is present inside the objects and the content of these objects cannot be modified. So even if I say message is equal to message dot lowercase, what would happen? Oops, I should have said lower. So message dot lower. What would happen is a new object is created with ABC, which is the lower of a B, capital ABC at a location D and the message would be pointing to location D. As you can see in here, the original content of the object cannot be modified after it is created. This is the case for a string class, the str class. For the str class, once you create the object, you cannot change the content of it. What we are changing is the variables which are nothing but names and locations. The original content of the object is not modified. This is the reason why we call strings as immutables. Actually, not just strings, but the four different types that we looked at until now. Int, float, boolean, and string. All these types are immutable in Python. So these are the basic types in Python, right? So you have int, you have float, you have bool representing boolean values, and you have str representing string or text values. In Python, instances of all these four classes are immutable. Once you create them, you'll not be able to change the values of them. I hope this was an interesting video to look at. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. One of the things that would be very surprising for people who are new to Python is the fact that there is no character data type in Python. Typically, we have text data types in all the languages, right? So, hello world, for example, is a text and we stored it in message. So, this is kind of a text variable. This is called a string. In other languages, what you have is something to represent a single character. So, for example, in Java, you can have a char data type to store a single character. You can say, okay, H is one character. But in Python, there is no separate data type to store single characters. For example, let's see how to take the first character of the string. The way you can access the first character of a string is by saying message of zero. The index starts with zero, so zero, one, two, three, four. So message of zero prints H. So this is the first character in the string hello world. The thing is, if you look at the type of message of zero, you would see that it's of type string. This is exactly the same type as that of the message itself. So in Python, whether you're talking about a string or you're talking about a single character, they are all represented with the same class str, that is a string. There is no separate character class or character data type. Whenever I refer to character from here, it's a string of length one. So this string of length one, this is what we would be calling it as a character. In Python, you can access this string in a for loop as a sequence of characters. All that you need to do is to say message of zero or message of one, message of two, message of three. So using the index, you'll be able to access the characters in a string. Think what would happen if I say message of 100? Obviously, it throws a index error. It says the index you are trying to access is out of the range of the value of that specific string. Let's say I would want to print all the characters in this specific string. How can I do that? The way you can do that is by saying for ch in message. So all that we are doing is for this the name of a variable. You, it can be anything. So I'm calling it ch. You can call it c, whatever you'd want in the name of this string. So name of the string here is message. For ch in message colon print ch. What would happen? It would print all the characters in this string 
on separate lines. In this short video, we looked at the fact that there is no separate character class or data type in Python. And we looked at how to loop the string and print individual characters which are present inside this string. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will introduce you to a string module which is present in Python. And we'll also look at how you can check if a specific character is present in a string. In Python, there are a number of utility modules. One of them is something called string. And if I would want to use anything from a module in Python, I would need to import that specific module. All that you need to do is say import space string. String is the name of the module. So once you do import space string, that specific module is available to us. You can say string dot something and you can access the content of that specific module. If you do a string dot and press tab, it would show the different things which are declared in the string module. The interesting things that we are interested in are these things, string dot ASCII characters. So if you want to print all the ASCII letters, so I can say string dot ASCII letters and it prints all the letters. So A to Z and A to Z, small letters and the capital letters. Similar to that, there are things like ASCII lowercase prints all the lowercase stuff. You have string dot ASCII uppercase, all the uppercase stuff. You have string dot digits. It prints all the digits which are present. And you have hexadecimal digits as well. A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F. So these are all hexadecimal digits. Similar to that, you have octal digits. You have a set of printable characters. You have punctuation characters. If you look at this, it would show all the characters which are typically used for punctuation. And you have white space characters as well. Whenever you want to do things like you want to check whether something is a hexadecimal character, then you can use this string dot hex digits. Or you'd want to check if something is a white space character. You can use string dot white space to check against it. So this is nothing but a list of characters. You can easily check whether a specific character is present in this specific string. The syntax for that is, let's say I would want to check whether A is in a specific list of characters. So I can do something like string dot ASCII characters. What would happen? It is written true because A is present in this specific thing. The in operation on a string checks if this is a substring of this specific string. So over here, A is present in this string dot ASCII characters, right? So string dot ASCII letters has all the list of letters and A is present. So you can even check whether if I do AB in string of ASCII letters, it returns true because AB is present in here. You can check ABC also. It does not matter what the length of this string is. As long as this string is present in here, in would return a value true. Typically, this is kind of a contains. In other languages, you have methods called contains. So I would want to check whether A is present in this list of values. You can do something of this kind. Or I would want to have a list of letters and I would want to make sure that something is in that list of letters. Let's say I want to make sure that a specific character is either a 1 or a 3 or a 5 or a 7 or a 9. What I can do is I can create a list like this and I can check, okay, 1 in this. So is the letter in this? Is the letter 2 in this? False. Is the letter 4 in this? It returns a false. Now, let's do a simple exercise to test the understanding of what we have learned in here. So, let's say I have a character. I have a character which, let's say, points to a character value. That's basically a string of length 1. Now, I would want to find out if this character is a vowel or not. Vowels are typically A, E, I, O, U or capital A, capital E, capital I, capital O and capital U. So, how do I find out? if this character is a vowel. We'll look at the solution for this exercise and more exercises in the next step. Until then, bye-bye.
in the previous step we learnt about this string module we saw different things that are present in the string module and at the end we looked at the in operator the in operator we used to check substring so if a specific string is a substring of another string we left you with an exercise at the end of the last video how to find if a specific character is a vowel or not okay i hope you had a chance to do that if you didn't then the easiest way to do that would be to create a vowel string so i can say vowel string is equal to a e i o u and a e i o u mm -hmm. and now i can check care in vowel string true because it's a now i can change the value to let's say b what can i do if i do care in vowel string it returns false the other thing you can also do is just have the capital vowel so i can just have the capital ones or the lower ones i can have the capital ones and i can say care dot lower or actually we have the capital so i can say care dot upper in vowel string this will check so the current value of care is b so capital b is not present in here if i actually change the care to a what would happen this returns true string let's say i have instead of this i have a e i o u all the small ones what do you think should be the code that i would need to use to check whether something is a vowel yep you are right so it should be car dot lower in vowel string so over here we have a car is a that works even if car was capital a what would happen this would still continue working that was the first exercise now let's move on to the second exercise i would want to find out and print all the capital alphabets from a to z so i would want to print all the capital letters from a to z how can i do that there was a small clue at the start of the previous step if you want you can review that and try and do it you can pause the video in here and try it as an exercise the clue at the start of the previous video was the import string module right we imported this string module and we saw that string module contained a number of things right when i press a tab it shows all the different things which are present and over here is something called string ascii uppercase so there is something called ascii uppercase which contains a list of uppercase characters now how can i use it and print each one of them on a separate line yep it's very simple right for car in this specific string colon print car what would it do it would loop around the string character by character and print each character you can see that a to z are printed a easier exercise print all the lower characters how do you do that it's very simple right so instead of ascii uppercase you have ascii lowercase and print care that's it we print all the lo lowercase characters and an even easier exercise now print all the digits you can say string dot and see the digits string dot digits those are the ones and colon print care that's it you are printing all the digits on individual lines isn't that cool the last exercise which we want to leave you with is checking if something is a consonant what is a consonant a consonant is an alphabet which is not a vowel so any alphabet which is not a e i o u is a consonant you can pause the video in here and try it as an exercise the simplest way of doing the consonant thing would have been to say consonant string and i can assign all the values right b c d f g h not i j and so on and so forth however that's a very long solution right but is there a easier way i can do that let's say i want to check whether b is a consonant or not so i'm doing a b dot lower i can do a not in vowel string this returns true however if i do it with a what would happen a is not 
a consonant so it's printing false that's cool but the problem with this solution is the fact that if i do something like this what would happen it returns true it says one is a consonant we need to do an additional check to make sure that the character is an alphabet so we need to check that one is alpha and one dot lower not in vowel string now it becomes false so this is one of the ways you can do that so if i have to generalize this solution this is what it would be so what i'm doing is i'm checking that character is the alphabet and i'm checking that the character is not inside the vowel string so what's the current value of char character is having a b so it's printing true so if char is one what would happen let's execute the code it returns false that's cool right so if character has a value of one it's not a consonant so you can use this expression to check if something is a consonant or not in this step the idea was to explore and try and find out more value in what we had learned in the earlier steps there were things which we learned in the earlier steps like boolean we learned about the end operator and we learned about the string module and the fact that it contains uppercase letters lowercase letters so we tried to find out a few exercises which we thought would be interesting for you to do using all the stuff which we learned in the previous steps i hope you had a nice time doing these exercises if these exercises were a little tricky and little hard to solve that's okay that's not a problem at all over the period of your programming career i'm sure you'd be able to solve much more complex problems than this until then bye bye welcome back in this step let's look at a few more puzzles and exercises related to strings let's say i have a simple string string example and let's say this is having a sentence this is a great thing what i would want to do is i would want to print each of the words which is present in this specific string on a individual line so i would want to print this is a great thing on individual lines so i'll have five lines with each of these words present in there one of the clues i would leave you with is try and do string dot example dot and there are a huge range of methods which would come up if you do a tab so if you do a string dot example dot and press tab there are a wide range of things that would come up one of the methods in the list of things that you would see would help us to break this string into multiple things and we can then loop around it and print it that's the clue pause the video in here and try it as an exercise okay i hope you had a chance to look at the different methods which are present in here there are a wide range of things that are present and the thing which we were really interested in is something called a split method so if you do a string example dot split which is present in here this is a great thing so it's printing a list of values this is a great thing the great thing about a list of values is you can loop around it so you can say for word in string example dot split i can press enter in here and i would say print word or to do the output it prints each of the words in an individual line let's say the string example in this case was this slash n slash n this is slash n is a new line character it's a escape character right slash n string example and if i do a print string example what would happen oops i actually but missed by mistake remove the a so this is a great thing so let's do it again you can see that each of the words is printed on individual lines there is another method which is present in the string so if i do string example this the basic split method as well as there is something called split lines so what the split lines method does is it looks for slash n and it divides the string based on the slash n so based on the new line characters 
it would split this string. So you can see that split lines would give you this is a great string. So if you have a string which contains new lines and you would want to divide it into a number of strings with each line as an individual element, the method you can use is split lines. The last thing which we we'll look at is a operator called concatenation operator or the operator plus. What is one plus two? Three, right? This is what we did earlier. So what is string one plus string two? It's actually a concatenation operator. What happens is one gets concatenated to two. What happens if I do this? Think about it. What would happen? It says it's a type error. You cannot do a plus operator between two different types. So the important thing from for you to remember is if I if you do plus between two strings, it is concatenation. It would concatenate the entire string. So if I do A, B, C plus D, E, F, the output would be A, B, C, D, E, F. One other interesting operator on strings is multiplication. So if I do a 1 into 20, what do you think will be the output? It's 20, right? However, if this was a string, what do you think will be the output? It would actually contain 20 ones. So if you multiply a string with 10 times, it means you are concatenating it 10 times. So you'd see a string with 10 A's. So this can be a useful thing. If you'd want to repeat the same characters 10 times, 15 times, then you can just use the multiplication operator on a string to repeat that. The last thing which we'll look at in this video is comparing strings, right? So let's say I have a string with a value test and I have another string two with a value test one. I want to check whether each of these strings are same. The way will this work? Nope, this is assignment. The way you can check if both are same are str is equal to is equal to str2. So this returns false. However, if str2 was also having test, what would happen? This operator will return true. So you can use is equal to is equal to to compare the content of two strings. I hope you are having an interesting time learning about the text and the string class in Python. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Congratulations, we have just completed our section on string. We started with the basic methods on strings. We saw how to capitalize a string, lowercase a string, how to find out if a string is a digit, alphabet, alphanumeric, or if a string ends with a specific character or starts with a specific character. We also looked at the find method to find out if a specific string is present in another string. We looked at the conversion between different data types and string. We looked at conversions between strings and Boolean, strings and int, strings and float. We also understood the fact that a string is a set of characters. And we looked at how to use the for loop to loop around the string and print the set of characters which are present in a string. We also understood the fact that there is no data type called character in Python. Even a single character is of a type str string. We looked at the string module and looked at different strings which are present in the string module. All the uppercase letters, lowercase letters, all the alphabets. We looked at digits and the punctuation stuff. After that, we looked at the in operator. In is like a substring operator. It checks whether a specific string is present as a substring is in a another string. We use the in operator to check whether a string is vowel or a string is consonant. We also looked at a few exercises to print all the uppercase alphabets line by line. We looked at an exercise to print lowercase alphabets line by line. In the last step, we looked at how to split a string using spaces or how to split a string which contains new lines using split lines. We also looked at the concatenation operator. We saw that plus between strings acts as a concatenation operator and star on a string actually concatenates the same string 
as many times as you have multiplied it with. So, if a into 10 becomes 10 a's. We also looked at how to compare the content of a string which is done by using the is equal to is equal to operator. All these things you have learned about strings would be very useful in your programming career because strings and text forms bulk of what you would be processing in your programs. I hope you had an interesting time in this section and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Until then, bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this section on loops. In this section, we would look at the variety of loops which are present in Python. We look at for loop and while loop. In this step, let's start with revising the basics of for loop that we have learned in the previous steps. We saw that for loop helps us to loop around the same set of code multiple times. So the syntax of for loop was very simple. For example, for i in range 1 to 11 colon print i. What does this do? Very simple, right? It prints from 1 to 10. So range function, the second parameter is exclusive. So 1 to 10, we are looping around it and printing the value of i. So this piece of code is being executed for different values of i. We also looked at the fact that for loop can also be used to loop around the characters in a string for ch and let's say hello world and a colon print ch. What would happen? It would print all the characters in a string. We also looked at the fact that you can use for loop to loop around all the words. How did we do that? We said dot split. This would create a list of words. Here there are two words, word, hello and world. And we can now print word. Hello world. Hello is a different word and world is a different word. The next way you can use a for loop is to loop around a specific list of values. I can say for item in 3 comma 6 comma 9 colon print item. Isn't this cool? You can see that it's looping around it and the item gets 3 first, then 6, then 9. In this step, we started with discussing and revising some of the things which we learned about for loop until now. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this video where we would do a lot of exercises with the for loop. The first exercise is to find out if a number is prime. We would want to write a method is underscore prime which would accept a integer value as a parameter and it would return if it's a prime. Now what is a prime number? A prime number is something which is only divisible by 1 and itself. So 5, 5 is only divisible by 1 and 5. It is not divisible by any other number. The same is the case with 7 and 11. However, 6 is divisible by 1, 2, 3 and 6. So it's not a prime number. That's the first exercise to find out if a number is prime or not. Write a function to do that. The second exercise is to write a method to calculate the sum up to the specific value. So I would want to find out the sum up to 6. So I would want to find out 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. The third one is to find out the sum of divisors. So I would want to find out what is the sum of the divisors of 15. What are the divisors of 15? 1, 3, 5 and 15. So I would want to find out 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 15. The fourth exercise is to print a number triangle. So given an input 5, I would want to print a number triangle of this kind. So in the output I should get 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So these are the exercises for the for loop. We will also test our skills with creating methods and executing them in the IDEs. You can pause the video in here and try these four examples and look at the solutions one by one. Let's now start with creating 
the is prime method. Let's use the IDE again. I'll create a new Python file and I'll call this for exercises and say OK. So what we want to do, what we want to start off with is this. So how can I comment this line? Hash. Hash. So this is the comment so that I have the text present in here. Def is the way we start our function definition. Is underscore prime. We would want to accept a int. So I'll call this as number. And we need to put a colon. Now, we would want to find out if the number which is passed in is prime or not. How can I find out if a number is prime or not? I need to check whether it's divisible by any other number other than one and itself. So if I am passed in a value of five, I would want to divide it with two comma three comma four. And I would want to see if it's divisible by any of two comma three comma four. The way I can do that is in a loop, right? So I can say for divisor in range, I would not want to divide it with one. I would want to start with two and go up to the number. So as we know, number is exclusive. So what we would do is we would go from a range of two comma number minus one, two comma five minus one, which is four. So, so we'll divide it with two, three, four colon. And we would want to check. What do you want to check? We would want to check if the number is divisible by the divisor. How can we check? Yes, number mod divisor. So if the number 5 is divisible by 2 or 3 or 4, it would return a 0. So if it returns a 0, what does it mean? If number mod divisor returns a 0, what does it mean? The number is not really prime. So I can say return a false with a capital F, right? So that's a mistake which a lot of beginners make. What happens if the code comes up to here? It would mean that we tried with two, three, four, and it was not divisible by all of them. In that case, I can say return true. Let's see what would happen now. A typo here, it should have been is prime. Is prime of number, what we are doing here is we are checking if number is divisible by two, two, number minus one. So that's what we are doing in here. So if number is six, we are checking if it's divisible by two, two, five. If it's divisible by any of the numbers, what we are doing, we are returning false back. So what would happen? It would immediately return false, get out of the function and say, okay, I'm not prime. I'm divisible by one number, so it's not prime. If we go through all this code and it's not divisible by any of these, then it means it's a prime and we are returning a true back. Now, how can I test this? I'll say is prime and pass in five. What we'll do is we will also print it. So print is prime five. What do you think will be the output? Let's run it. Right click, run for exercises. It says true. Let's print six. What would happen? Run for exercises, false. Six is not a prime. Let's see it with one. It's returning true back. So for one, the rules are a little different, right? So if one is neither a prime nor composite. So what I'll do is I'll add a if condition. So if I'll say if number less than two, then it's not a prime. So I'll say false. Let's put a colon here and let's remove the semicolon. So if this is called a guard check or a boundary check to make sure that you are getting the right inputs in. So if number has a value less than two, we are saying, okay, it's not a prime. For all the other numbers, we would execute the rest of the code. It returns a false. So for all other numbers, two, two is prime, 15, It's prime. One of the things you can try and do is to print different values inside the if, inside the for, 
to make sure that you understand it perfectly. The other thing you can also do is to try and debug this. So you can do a right click debug. You can actually put a breakpoint in here, for example, or you can put a breakpoint here and try and debug it and try and understand this completely. I'll see you in the next step where we'll look at the second exercise. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we looked at the ease prime. And in this step, let's look at sum up to n. Now, I'll start with defining the function sum up to n and number. Obviously, I would want to sum from 1 to number, so I would need to use a loop. So for i in range, I would want to add from 1 to the number. So I would need to do range of 0 to number plus 1. So number plus 1, it would range from 1 to number. Colon. Now, how do I add them up? How do I make sure that I add them up and return them back? The way we can do that is by having a temporary variable. So I'll say sum is equal to 0. So we are creating a temporary variable sum is equal to 0. And when we are looping, we can do sum is equal to sum plus i. What we are doing here is each value that comes in, we are adding it to sum. So initially sum will have a 0. When i has a value of 1, 0 plus 1. After that, it will be 0 plus 1 plus 2, 0 plus 1 plus 3, and so on, up to the value of 6. Isn't that cool? At the end, what I can do is return sum back. Let's now call sum up to n. And I would call for 6. And I would call for 10 as well. What I'll do is comment this line of code. The shortcut is control slash or command slash. And it would be commented. Or you can type in hash. Now, let's see what would happen when I run this. Oops, nothing is printed because we are not really printing it, right? So we call the method, but we are not really printing it. So let's print it and run it again. You can see that it's printing 21 and 55. So if you do 1 plus 6, it's 7. 7 into 3 is 21. So that's right. So this is the sum of first 6, 10 into 10 plus 1, 11. 10 into 11 is 110 by 255. So this is also the right value. So what we are doing in here is we are actually calculating the sum up to n. One of the things you can try as an exercise is to try and find the product of n numbers. That's also called, yep, factorial. So 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5 into 6. So how do you find the factorial? There is actually an inbuilt method in Python to do factorial. Let's not worry about it. You can write a method which would do it as well. I'll see you in the next step where we'll look at the next exercise. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we looked at finding if a number is prime. We looked at finding the sum up to n numbers. And in this step, let's focus on the third exercise, sum of divisors. One of the clues I can give you is that sum of divisors is very similar to is prime. You want to find out if a number is dividing 15 and if it's dividing 15 with the remainder of 0, then you need to add it up. You can pause the video in here. I would recommend you to copy the prime number, start, start off with that, and then you can edit it to get to the sum of divisors. Okay, now let's get to it. I'll comment out these two because I don't want to really worry about sum up to right now. What we want to do is we want to focus on the divisors. So let's copy the function is prime. I don't want to find out sum of divisors. So I'll say calculate sum of divisors for the number. For numbers less than zero, less than two, I'll just return zero back. Let's not really worry about it. What we are interested in real numbers about two. So for divisor in range of two comma number, that's what we did in case of prime numbers. But with sum of divisors, what we want to do is we would also want to calculate the sum including one and the number. 
So if I'm looking at the divisors for 15, I would want to include the sum of 1, 3, 5, and 15. So what we'll do here is increase the range. So we'll increase the range from 1 to number plus 1 so that we are looping from 1 to number. And we would want to check if number device, if the number is divisible, what do we want to do? You'd want to increment a sum variable. Sum is equal to sum plus divisor. Before that, let's initialize sum is equal to zero. One of the things which we can also do is move this to the first line. And over here, I can directly return sum instead of zero. So sum is equal to zero. If number less than two, return sum. Sum is equal to sum plus divisor. Instead of true, we would want to return sum back. Cool, right? So now I can call this method, calculate sum of divisors and pass in sum. We would want to print the value. So I'll say print, calculate sum of divisors of sum. Ah, actually, not sum. I should have said a number. So let's say I would want to calculate the sum of divisors of 6, sum of divisors of 15. Let's run this and see what would happen. 12 and 24. So the divisors of 6 are 1, 2, 3, and 6. That's 12. And the divisors of 15 are 1, 3, 5, and 15. And they all add up nicely. That's cool, right? In this step, we looked at the exercise to calculate the sum of the divisors. We started with the code for the prime number as the base. And we slowly changed it to return the sum of the divisors for a given number. I hope it's been an interesting journey for you. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at the last exercise related to the for loop. Print a number triangle 5. It needs to print 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's start with a simple thing. Let's try and print 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 first. And then we would look at how to print the rest of this stuff. So let's start with creating this method. I'll comment these lines off. And now I can say def print a number triangle and take a number as an input. And I want to print from zero to that one to that specific number. How can I do that? I in range of one to number plus one print i. What would happen? Let's check what would happen. Oops, I missed a colon. Let's fix that. And over here, I would can now call print a number triangle 5. Aha, it's printing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on individual lines. I would want them to delimit it by space. How can I do that? I can say end is equal to space. Let's see what would happen now. You can see that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are all printed on the same line. So what we are doing is, by default, print would print a new line character at the end of each print statement. What we are saying is we don't want a new line character, but we would use space as a delimiter. You can either use double quotes or you can say it in a single quote. So in single quote, I'm putting a space and the output would remain unchanged. So now, what we would want to do is we would want to do the same thing. However, we don't want to really print 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 all the time. So if I actually put a for loop on top of it, so for loop here, and I would say for, let's say this is for j in range number plus 1 to for i in range 1 to number plus 1 and print. Make sure that you have the alignment right. So this is what is called a loop in a loop. What would happen if I do this? This loop is executed five times. So we are doing a loop in a loop. And if I do this, what would happen? You'd see that one, two, three, four, five, five times. One, two, three, four, five. So the whole thing is being printed five times. What we want to do is at the end of each loop execution, we would want to print a new line. So I'll say print so that we have a new line here. We have a new line here. We have a new line here and new line here. Now you can see that we are printing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We are printing actually a square. So if you'd see that we pass in a 6, 
we would see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. Because we are saying for i is 1 to 6, we are saying for j is 1 to 6, for i is 1 to 6, print i. That's what we are doing until now, and that's why it's printing a kind of a square. What we want to do is, in the first line, only print up to 1. In the second line, only print up to 2. In the third line, only print up to 1, 2, 3. Fourth line, 1, 2, 3, 4. How can we do that? Think about it. When I'm inside this loop, I can see the j variable, right? So I can say, instead of number plus 1, I would say j plus 1. So for when j has a value of 1, we'll print from 1 to 1. When j has a value of 2, I'll print from 1 to 2. So I'll only print 1 to when j has a value of 3, I'll print from 1 to 3. So let's try and run this and see what would happen. You can see that our number triangle is ready. So what is happening here is we are having a value j which is running from 1 to 6. And the i value only runs from 1 to the specific value of j. So when j is 1, i is 1. When j is 2, i will have a value of 1 and then it will have a value of 2. From when j is 3, I will have a value of 1, 2, and 3. And that's how we are printing the whole thing out. One of the interesting things for you to do would be to try and debug this and try and make sure that you understand everything happening in the background with this method. I hope all the exercises with the for loop have been interesting. One of the important things to note is a couple of these things can be done in a much simpler way with an enhanced version of a for loop using something called a functional programming. But as a beginner, I think this is the best way to, for you to approach things and for you to understand them. I'll see you in the next step where you would look at other loops present in Python. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at one of the other loops which is present in Python called the while loop. In the for loop, we can specify a range. We can say from here to here. However, we would see that the while loop, we would specify a condition. Do you remember one place where we use a condition until now? Yep, it was a if. This is what we do in a if condition. If this condition is true, this line is executed once. However, with a while loop, we would see that the syntax for it is very similar to a if, but what would happen is if this condition is true, while this condition remains true, this line is executed again and again and again. Let's see how to use a simple while loop right now. Let's say i has a value of 0 and I say while i is less than 5. So the syntax you can see is very similar to if. So instead of if, I am putting a while. The condition is here while i less than 5 and I am saying print i, let's just print the value of i. What I can do now, if I leave it as it is, you would see that it continues executing again and again. I am doing a control c or a command c to break this. What is happening here? When I did this, what is happening is 0 is printed a number of times because i has a value of 0, so I am saying while i less than 5 print 0. So this is printed and again it checks the condition, again it prints it, checks the condition, prints it. What is happening here is something called an infinite loop. And what I did to break it off was to press control C. So if you press control C, it would break the thing and you would get the control back. One of the important things to make sure in a while loop is to make sure that you increment the value of i. So I'll say i is equal to i plus 1. Now, let's see what would be the output. You'd see that the output is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So how does it work? I initially had a value of 0. So first, the condition is checked. Yes, it's true. So 0 is printed. And then the value of i is incremented. i becomes 1. So i is still less than 5, so the loop is continued to execute until 4 is printed, i becomes i plus 1, 4 plus 1 is 5. Then we check the condition. 5 is less than 5? Nope. So it goes out of the loop and terminates the loop. 
So, while is different from the fur in the sense that when I am starting to execute a fur, I know how many times it will be executed. But when I start executing a while, it is just based on a condition. As long as the condition is true, we keep executing the code. One of the important things that you need to remember is to make sure that the condition variable is updated. When we left out this piece of code i is equal to i plus 1, what happened? We saw that the loop was continuously executed. Now, let us say I would want to print all of this on the same line. Let us reinitialize i to 0 and I would want to print all of this on the same line delimited by a space. How can I do that? Yep, that is exactly what we learned earlier. Print also accepts a delimiter. So, I can say end is equal to space and make sure that you are delimiting properly i is equal to i plus 1. The indentation should be proper. So, I left a couple of spaces before i is equal to i plus 1 to make sure it is part of the while loop. And now, you would see that 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 are all printed as part of it. You can see that we are still on the same line because we said to end with a space. Typically, print prints an end line, a new line at the end of each thing. But what we said here is to use a space. That is cool. You might be wondering, what kind of situations do I really use a while? Right? So, earlier we did the same exercises with fur as well. So, we were able to do it with fur and we were able, we are now doing the same thing with while. So, and if you remember the way we did it with for loop is even more simpler, right? So, for i in range 0 to 5, if I really wanted to do the same thing as this, I could have just done something of this kind with the for loop, right? So, print i. It prints 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. For loop is much simpler code than the while loop. With while, we had to write an extra statement to increment the value. So, the question you might be having is, what would be the situations when you should use a while? We will look at that in the next video, where we will talk about different exercises with while loop. Until the next video, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we were introduced to the while loop. In this step, let us look at a couple of exercises using the while loop. Let us think about a problem. Print squares up to a limit. So, I will be given a limit. So, I will be given a number. So, here it is 30. So, I would want to print all the squares of numbers up to 30. So, 1, 2 square is 4, it is still less than 30. 3 square is 9, 4 square is 16, 5 square is 25. So, that is cool, but 6 square 36. So, it exceeds 30, so it will not be printed. So, you would want to print all the squares up to the limit as well as the cubes up to the limit. For the cubes, the output would be 1, 8, 37 if 30 is the parameter which is passed in because 4 cube is 4, 4, 4, 4 into 4 is 16, 16 fours are 64 which is greater than 30. So, only 3 things would be printed 1, 8, and 27. So, you can write functions of this kind as an exercise and at the end of this, we will discuss when we can use a while and when we can use a for loop. Let us get started with the exercise now. I will create a new file, file, new python file and I would want to call this while exercises and say ok. Now, over here, what we want to do is this. So, let us comment the whole thing out. Control slash, command slash. So, what we want to do is create a function called print squares up to limit. So, let us copy the name and this would accept a limit as the parameter. Now, what I would want to do is up to 30, I would want to print all the squares. The way we can do that is by using a while. while condition is the syntax colon and you can write what you want to do. Let us say I would want to print i or print something. What is the condition? While something is less than limit, right? So, while something is less than limit, I would want to do some printing. Let us see what that something is right now. So, I would want to start with numbers and find out their squares. So, let us start with i is equal to 1. And I would say 
square of i, i into i, while i into i is less than limit. So, while this is less than limit, I would want to print the value of i. We missed a semicolon, sorry, we missed a colon here. And let's now try to execute what would happen. Actually, we should print the square, so I'll print i square i. Let's call this print squares up to limit 30. Right, that's what we wanted to do. Let's run it. Oops, it's still printing one again and again. Why? What did we miss? Think about it. What did we miss? We missed the increment i is equal to i plus one. <laughs> that's something which a lot of beginners do. So now when I actually fix it, i is equal to i plus one and I execute it. I get 149, 16, 25. Be careful with the indentation. We would want i is equal to i plus 1 to be part of the while loop. So it should be indented the same way as the print statement. So 149, 16, and 25. That's what is being printed. That's cool. What we want to do is we would want to print it on the same lines. What we'll do is we'll end it with a space. Now, if you run it, it's 149, 16, 25. And if you run it with any numbers, 60, it prints up to 49, right? That's the exercise number one. One of the things you can already see is when I'm starting to execute this, when I'm passing 60 to this, I don't know how many times this loop will be executed. I don't know when this condition will be met. You can see that now we are printing seven values. But if I actually increase it 80, it's printing how many values? It's printing eight values. So from the number which is passed in, we have no way to guess how many times this loop will be executed. We don't know when this condition will be false until it's really false. Those are the kinds of situations in which you go for a while loop. In a for loop, at the start of the execution of the for loop, you are almost very clear for i is equal to 1 to 10, for i is equal to 1 to 15. So you know how many times the loop will be executed. But for a while loop, typically, you don't really know that. Now, the next exercise was to print cubes up to a limit. Pause the video in here, and you can try it as a simple exercise. OK, print cubes should be very easy. So I just need to copy the squares, cubes i is equal to 1. So instead of i star i, it should be i star i star i. And over here, it should be i star i. That's it. And we are ready. So let's now call this print cubes up to limit. What would happen? 1, 8, 27, and 64. This should be a very easy thing to do. All that we needed to change was instead of i star i, two places we replaced it with i star i star i. In this video, we looked at a couple of exercises with while loop. I'll see you in the next video where we'll look at another interesting exercise. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we'll look at a simple menu and we will try and think what loop we would be using to execute that. What we want to do is we would want to have a similar thing that we did when we did the if exercise. Basically, we want to ask two numbers and we want to ask which operation, choose operation. However, the thing is, over here, we would want to enhance the earlier example with a new option called exit. So as long as a user keeps entering a valid operation, one, two, three, four, we would want to continue executing it. So we would want to continue executing until user enters an option five when we say exit out. Think about what loop would you be using for this and try and do this as an exercise. So we take an input as two numbers. We would ask for an operation. As soon as user enters the operation, we execute it and give the result and ask the user again until user presses five. Try and do this as an exercise and pause the video in here. What we'll do is we'll start off with the number one menu.py. That's the thing which we created earlier. So I'll copy it again, copy and paste it, copy paste, and I'll say number menu in a loop and say, okay, 
cool, right? So number menu in a loop, that's what we would want. Control one, get rid of it. I want to focus on the code, so I'll minimize this as well. So what we have in here is simple operation, right? Right now it says, okay, four operations and it would do the result and it would print the result. That's basically what it's doing right now. But the thing is, it only asks for the operation once. What we want to do is we would want to add another option, five exit. And if user chooses that option, then exit. Otherwise, we would want to continue executing this. So what we would need to do is we would need to execute this piece of code. So the choose operation part of it, we would want to do it in a while loop. So what we'll do is we'll start creating a while loop. We'll say while choice is not equal to phi. So until user enters a choice of phi, colon, we want to continue executing this code. And at the end, we would want to again ask for a choice. Why are we using a while loop and not a for loop? Because we don't know when user will enter a choice of five. So you, until user enters the choice of five, until this condition is met, we would want to continue executing. And that's why we are choosing a while in here. So what we are doing in here, enter number one, enter number two, we are asking user to choose the operation. If user chooses anything other than five, we will print the whole thing again, right? At the end, I'll just have a message, print, thank you. So what happens if this is not met or when the entire thing continues execution, print thank you will be executed. Let's run this and see what would happen. Enter number one, 12, number two, five. Now I would want to do addition. So it's printing addition, two, it's doing subtraction. Was that right? So it's 12 minus five, that's cool. Let's do multiplication. 12 into 5 is 60, that's cool. Now let's enter 5. It says thank you and it exits. So these are the kind of situations when while loop is really appropriate to use. What we are doing in here is we are actually taking the numbers as input. Once we have the choice of the operation, we are checking if it's 5. If it's not 5, we continue executing and at the end we again ask for the choice of the user. While the choice is not equal to 5, we continue to execute the code and at the end we print a thank you. I'll recommend you to do this exercise once again to make sure you understand every part of it because there are a wide range of concepts that we are using in doing this exercise. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this video where we would be discussing about a wide variety of puzzles related to for loop, while loop, and also we'll look at a couple of keywords called break and continue. What are they and when can you use them? Let's get started with the most basic of the ones. For i in range, 1, 11, 2, print i, n is equal to space. What would be the output of this script? Let's run this and find out. It's printing 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, right? We saw that range function accepts a step parameter. So it starts with 1, and at each increment, it increments by 2. So 1, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 is exclusive, so 11 is not really printed. Cool, right? So now, let's look at the next one. Let's come on this one out and start the next one. So for i in range, 11, 1, minus 1, print i, end is equal to this. What would be the result? It's easy to guess, right? It starts from 11 and prints only up to 2 because 1 is exclusive. If you want to print up to 1, you have to make it 0. Cool. Now, let's 
uncomment this control command slash and uncomment this puzzle what would be the output of this think about it pause the video in here and think what would be the output of this be let's run this it just prints done so while i star i five star five is 25 25 is less than 10 nope so this code is never executed so it directly prints done isn't that cool let's uncomment the next puzzle out so i is equal to 2 while i less than i star i is less than 10 print i and is equal to this print done pause the video in here try and think what would the output is and let's now run it oops 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 it's printing two continuously let me start this aha i had to click it multiple times before it got terminated the reason why it was running like that was because we had i is equal to 2 while i star i is less than 10 so 2 star 2 is less than 10 2 star 2 is 4 4 is less than 10 yes so we kept printing it but we did not really have a increment let's fix this right so i'm doing i is equal to i plus 1 will this work pause the video in here and try and think about it will this really work the answer is because this i is equal to i plus 1 is not considered to be part of the while loop. If you really want it to be part of the while loop, I have to indent it. So I'm leaving four, place, four spaces to indent it at the same level as print. And now when I run it, you would see 2, 3 and done. So what happens is first time it executes the loop, 2 into 2 is less than 10. That's cool. So i is printed, 2 i is incremented 3 3 into 3 9 9 is still less than 10 so 9 is printed actually 3 is printed and then when it becomes 4 4 into 4 is 16 so this condition is not true the next line is printed and we print done now let's look at a new puzzle with a new keyword which is present in here there's a break in here what we are doing is for i in range 1 to 11 i'm saying if i is equal to is equal to 5 break and we have a print i and is equal to this let's also add a print done at the end of it so what would be the output of this program one of the things you need to understand is the break keyword so the break keyword actually breaks out of the loop so if this condition is met what the break does is it will take you out of the for loop completely so what would be the output of this program let's run it and find out it prints 1, 2, 3, 4 and done. Because what happens is with 1, i is printed, 2, i is printed. This condition does not match, 3 does not match, 4 does not match. With 5, this condition matches. So break is called and we get outside the for loop. So we get out of the for loop and start executing line 24 and that's where done is printed. Let's look at the next puzzle for i in range 1 to 11 if i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 break what would happen let's run this it's printing 1 because 1 mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 does not match 2 mod 2 is equal to is equal to matches and you go out of the for loop and it prints 1 and it gets out so when this condition matches we get out of the for loop now i'm changing this code a little bit now i'm saying if i mod 2 break what would happen let's run it aha you don't really see any number being printed the reason is because as we discussed earlier any non-zero number is considered to be true so when i is 1 1 mod 2 what's 1 mod 2 what's the reminder when 1 is divided by 2 it's 1 so it returns a value of 1 so we break out of the loop inside the first loop itself so this print never gets called so we print done and get out of it let's see what would happen if i had a range of 2 to 11 think about it what would happen yep it prints 2 because 2 mod 2 is 0 so 0 is false so the print is executed because the break is not called however when i becomes 3 3 mod 2 is 1 1 is considered to be true so the break is executed 
and we exit out of the loop. Now, in this puzzle, we are introducing you to a new keyword called continue. In this code, what you see is for i in range 1 to 11, if i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0, then we say continue and we print i. What do you think will be the output? I'll give you a clue. What the continue does is it skips the code inside the for loop after the continue. So after the continue, whatever lines of code are present in the for loop, they are skipped and you would start the next iteration of the for loop. Break would actually take you out completely to the next statement. So it would take you to print done. However, what continue does is it will skip only this print and it would go to the next value of i. Pause the video in here and try and think what would be the output. You'd see that it's printing 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 and done. The reason is because when i mod 2 is equal to 0, we said continue. For all the even numbers, this condition will be true. And so they're all not printed because continue is called. When continue is called, when i is 2 and continue is called, i becomes 3 and the next line of code is not really executed. Now, what would happen if i remove is equal to is equal to 0? Let's run this. It prints even numbers only. Because when is i mod 2 true? i mod 2 for odd numbers, i mod 2 would be a value of 1. So this would be true and continue would be executed. So for all the odd numbers, continue will be executed. So those will not be printed. For even numbers, this will return 0. If 0 is false, so continues are not executed. So the print statement is executed. The last puzzle we'll be looking at is exactly a modification of the earlier one. Instead of i mod 2, we wrote i mod 2 not equal to 0. What do you think will be the output? Yep, you are right. No change in output. Because this is exactly the same as this. i mod 2 is not equal to 0. It's the same as i mod 2. Because if i mod 2 is 0, then if i mod 2 will be false. If i mod 2 is 0, then i mod 2 not equal to 0 also will be false. One of the things I would recommend you to do is to try and type in these puzzles and try and do them on your own. I think one of the best ways to understand what's happening behind the screens is to do a lot of playing around, try and change a lot of code, try and play around with it, and try and see if the output matches what you think it will be. One of the other things you can do is also try and debug to make sure that you understand exactly what's happening. Loops and conditionals form the most basic elements of programming. In this section, we looked at loops, we did a number of exercises with loops, and we looked at a variety of puzzles related to them. Until the next section, bye-bye. Welcome back. There are a number of predefined modules in Python. They provide a lot of variety of features. And in this step, let's try to learn how to import a module and how to use methods from specific modules. Let's say I want to import a new module. I would want to do something. So let's talk about the math module, import math. Now, if you do math dot and press tab, it shows all the functions that are defined in the math module. There are a variety of functions which are defined in the math module. And if I would want to use any of them, all that I need to do is do math dot, let's say I would want to use the floor function. Let's not worry about the exact functionality of the floor for now. Let's focus on the fact that math is a module I would want to learn and floor is a function that I would want to call. So 4.5, yep, it returns four back. Now, I would want to find out a little bit more about the math.floor. How can I do that? I can say help math.floor. What would happen? It would show the floor documentation. It says floor returns the floor of x as an integral. So this is basically written the largest integer, which is less than or equal to x. So if you want to know more about a specific function, this is how you can do that. I'm doing a colon q to get out of it. If you want to find out help about a module, help math. And it shows the documentation where you can find the complete reference for it. And if you press the down arrow, you'd be able to see all the methods which are defined in here. I'm typing a colon q to get out of it. One of the important things to understand about importing a module is when you import the module name, 
if you I want to use the function, then I would need to use module name dot function. That's what we were doing in here, math dot floor. The other option that you can do is import the entire module content directly into the namespace. So I can do from math import star. What would happen now is all the functions which are present in here come into the namespace. So I can directly call them floor of phi. I don't need to use math.floor anymore. I can do GCD of, I would want to find the greatest, greatest common divisor of these two. It's two. I want to find the help, so I can say GCD. It returns the help for GCD. One of the important things to remember is when you import star, when from math I'm importing everything, then it means if you have any local variables with the names as these functions, they might get shadowed. Typically, it's not really considered to be a good practice to import everything into the namespace. If there are specific things that you would want to import and use them directly, then you can import just that by doing from math import floor. Or I can say from math import GCD, the specific thing that you would want to import and I can use that function alone directly. In this quick step, we try to get an overview of how to use a predefined module in Python. So math is one of the predefined modules. What we did was we imported the math module, import math. And then we can look up all the functions which are present in there. We can also get the help using help of math.floor or help of math. And we also looked at how to import all this stuff from a module. So here we said from math, import everything. And over here, we were importing specific things. So we can, from math, import GCD. If math had specific classes, you can import them as well. If you like a module, you want to use some features from it, basically what you need to do is first import it, and then you can start using all the features that are present in that specific module. Until the next tip, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a tip regarding loops. In loops, in certain scenarios, you might want to access the index of the element. How do you do that? That's what we would be looking at in this specific tip. Typically, let's say there is a numbers list, one, four, six, three, whatever numbers you would want to have, it does not really matter, right? So for number in numbers, oops, let's print number. What would happen? Yep, it just prints the number. But if you want to find the index of the specific element, so there might be certain scenarios where you would want to know, okay, which index is this specific element presented? And I would want to be able to see that in the loop. How do you do that in Python? The way you that do that is by saying for enumerate of numbers. So enumerate of numbers is a method so you just call it and now you can get both the index and the number as well. So I'm saying index comma number, this is a tuple. So I'm accessing both of them. And now I can say print and let's use a formatted string and say, I want to print a index and the number at that specific index is number. Cool. Now you can see that it prints 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 1, 4, 6, 3, 4. Obviously, this would also work for strings as well. So let's say I have a string list and let's say it contains the list of AIU. What does it create? Yes, it would actually contain all the vowel characters. And now if I loop around it, index, comma, vowel in enumerate of values printf a formatted string comma index comma well as simple as that right nothing fancy in here aha i got my method name wrong it should have been print you can see that it prints the index as well as the specific element. This tip is useful when you would want to have the index and use it for some purpose. This is how you get the index of the specific element 
inside a loop. Until the next day, bye bye. Welcome back. In this tip, let's look at a specific way you can make your if statements even simpler. Let's say I have a number. I have a number. Let's say the number is 5. And I would want to find out if it's even or not and store it in a name called is even. Typically, the way you can write that is very simple, right? So if you can say if number is equal to or actually number mod 2 is equal to 0, then it is even, right? So you can say is even is equal to true. Else is even is equal to false. This is how you can do that. However, there is an even simpler way of you doing this. You can say is even is equal to true. When is it true? True if number mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0. And else it's false. So you can see what does it have is even is false. Now let's have number is equal to 6 and let's do this again. Is even true. So this is kind of a shortcut. So instead of writing complete piece of code like this, number of statements, you can have just one statement. This is kind of a shortcut if statement, which is very useful when you have simple condition and based on which you'd want to set the values. Actually, the even easier way of doing this would have been to say is even is equal to number mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0. This would have been even easier way of doing it. But if the return value is something like a string, so let's say you'd want instead of true or false, you'd want to have yes or no. In that kind of situation, this statement would be very, very useful. So you can say is even is equal to yes if number is equal to zero, else no. So those are the situations where this kind of stuff is really useful. In this step, we quickly took a look at a shortcut if statement. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will look at an important concept about Python. Python is strongly typed, but a dynamically typed language. What am I saying? What is strongly typed? What is dynamic typing? Let's look at that in this specific video. Now, what is strongly typed? Let's say A has a value of a number. So A is 1. Can I do a length of 1? Nope. Not allowed. Because this specific type, which is, what is the type of 1? Or type of A here? It's int. On the int, an operation called length is not really defined. So it's saying object of type int has no length. So if a method is not defined on your specific type, then you would not be able to do that specific things. If str on a string, let's say I have a value. And on this, I'd be able to say str dot upper, and this would print value. Will I be able to do a dot upper? Nope. On a, a method called upper is not really defined. The other thing about Python is the fact that everything is an object. So even if you say type of 1, it's int. 1.5 is a float. Let's say this was in a string. Its type is str. Let's say I'm going to find the type of true. It's class boolean. So everything that you see in a Python program, including methods and the constant values, are instance of some class. The two important things that we have learned until now is A, Python is strongly typed. You cannot do anything that is not allowed by a specific type on an instance of that specific type. And if you do so, you would get an error. The second thing which we looked at was the fact that everything in Python is an object. The last important concept is over here, we have str pointing to value, right? So str, what's the type of str right now? It's a string. However, I can say str is equal to 1. And what would be the type of str now? It's of a type int. 
so you can see that the type of the str during the runtime of the program has changed from string to int and you can even change it further so it can be now a boolean and you can assign a list to it as well so one two three or one two what is the type of str right now its type is list so the type of the str has been changing during the runtime of this specific example and that's what is called a dynamically typed language so in python the type can change so specific name here it's str can point to different values of different types that's one of the fundamentals in python programming you can change the type so that's why python is called a dynamically typed language so in summary python is a dynamically typed language however it's strongly typed in the sense that once you assign a type then all the rules of that specific type apply you will not be able to call any methods that are not defined on that specific type and we looked at the fact that everything in python is an object I'll see you in the next trip. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we'll talk about a mistake which a lot of beginners do. Let's talk about the sum function, right? So sum is one of the functions which is inbuilt in Python. You can pass it a list of values and it would add them up. So it adds all these and returns one or two. Now. Let's say you are trying to solve a problem. I would want to, I have two numbers. Number one is equal to 10. And let's say I have a number two, which is 20. And during the logic, while writing the logic of the thing, I had to add these up. And what I do is I just say number one plus number two. What would be the value of sum? 30. But what would happen now if I call the sum built-in function? Mm -hmm. It says, type error int object is not callable why is it coming up the thing which is happening in here is we are shadowing a global built-in function with a local variable of our own so whenever we refer to the sum now we are actually referring to the local variable it's saying local variable sum is int and an int object is not like a function you cannot call it that's basically what it's saying. The bad practice that we are doing in here is shadowing a global built-in function with a local variable. And that's not good. The way we could have avoided that is by either using a different name, either calling it sum of two numbers or something of that kind, or at least by using a sum underscore as the variable name. This would prevent us from shadowing the sum built-in function. So if you have to name any variable similar to a built-in function, what you need to do, you can append an underscore to convey that, I, even though I would want to actually name it as sum, I'm naming it as sum underscore to avoid a collision with a built-in function. I can actually do a del sum, which would actually delete the local variable sum. And now I, the reference goes back to the built-in function sum. So sum of this would start returning 102. So the best practice is to avoid having variables named with the same names as a built-in function. Try and avoid that. Either have a completely different variable name or at least append an underscore to it. I'll see you in the next video with another tip. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, we look at another typical mistake which beginners make with Python. One of the important things in Python is indentation is very, very important. So if I press a space and if I'm time to type in i is equal to one, it says unexpected indent. So space at the start of a line has a lot of value in Python and that is shown here as well right so if i am saying i is equal to is equal to three and have a lot of space it says unexpected indent the same is inside a if so even if i have a if condition so let's say i am saying i is equal to one and i'm saying if 
i is equal to is equal to 3 colon and I directly type something here. So I'm saying if I print something, what would happen? It would throw an error because the if block code should be having a indentation. So you need to have a space to indicate the indentation. The other important thing is when you are typing the next line, again, if you want to part it to be part of the if, then you should give the same indentation as the previous statement. So it should start in here. If it does not, if it starts something here, what would happen? Again, error. It says indentation does not match any outer indentation level. So this is something we should be very careful about. If you want a statement to be part of the if, then it should be indented the same indentation level as the previous statement. This is the same with loops as well, for loop, while loop and all the other stuff. So be very careful with indentation because Python uses indentation to define the blocks. Where the block starts, where the block ends, all that is defined just by using indentation. This might sound a little difficult. This might be a little difficult for beginning programmers to get used to. But I am sure if you start using it in the right way, this is much more efficient than any other way of identifying a block. So be careful with the indentation and I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. In this quick tip video, we'll talk about something called PEP8. What's PEP8? PEP stands for Python Enhancement Proposal. And PEP8 is a style guide for Python code. If you just Google for PEP8, you land up on this document. And as you can see in here, it's style guide for Python code. This is a very old document, as you can see in here. This was created in 2001. And the awesome thing is it lays down all the guidelines on how you can write good Python code. One of the most important things I love about Python is the practicality of all the things that are surrounding it. While defining this style guide, one of the statements says, do not follow this pep blindly. It says, think about it and then follow the guidelines in this pep. So these things which are in the pep are just guidelines. This might not be applicable to 100% of the scenarios. Make sure that you are using your best judgment. What are the different things that are discussed in this style guide? First is how do you lay out your code? How do you sp use space? How do you use bank lines? How do you use string quotes? How do you use comments? And the most important part I love is the naming conventions part of it. How do you name variables, methods, classes, exceptions, and things like that? If you want to be a good Python developer, I would recommend you to spend some time with this style guide and try and read what is in here and try and understand it. Let's look at a few of the important things that are present in this style guide. Let's look at an important thing regarding inline comment. It says use inline comments sparingly. If you look at this inline comment here, it's increment x. Is it really needed to say increment x? Nope. All right. So it just says x is equal to x plus 1 increment x. The comment is saying exactly what the code is doing. So it's telling the what. Usually the best inline comments tell why you are doing something and not what. If you are trying to say what you are doing in an inline comment, it typically means that you have not written good code, which is easily understandable. So in your inline comments, try and say why you are doing a specific thing, why you chose a specific algorithm, why you chose the specific type of thing you are doing instead of something else. So talk about why's and not the what's. Now, let's look at the naming conventions. Class names should use cap words, right? So it would be something like type var, type var in here. Exception names are the same as class names. In addition, you need to have a error at the end. Empty value error currency addition error. Function and variable names, 
typically should be lower case separated by underscores constants typically we would use all caps so max underscore overflow total always make sure that you're using self as the first argument to instance methods so make sure that you're using self in the instance methods when you are designing a class you need to check that all the public attributes should not have any leading underscores what we are looking at in this video are just the tip of the iceberg i would recommend you to spend some time and look at other recommendations which are present in here the idea behind this is just to tell you that there is something called pep 8 you need to look up as you get better with python spend more time with this so that you understand everything which is present in here until the next tip bye bye welcome back in this quick tip we look at something called pep 20 it's also called the zen of python if you just do a google for pep 20 you should land up on this document this is called the zen of python as you can see this was created way back in 2004 and the zen of python says beautiful is better than ugly explicit is better than implicit simple is better than complex this is basically how you should think when you are writing your python code so when you are designing something with python how should you think that's basically what the zen of python tries to explain i would recommend you to spend some time with it one of the things which it focuses a lot on is in expressing clarity so your code should be simple to read it your code should be easy to understand as soon as you look at something you should be able to understand what it is doing and most of these guidelines emphasize that you can see something called readability counts flat is better than nested so if you have a lot of nested structure the code is difficult to understand rather than that having a flat structure is better making sure that whatever you are writing is explicit is very clear to look at is much more important than being implicit and making it obscured you can look at this one which is never hide errors right so if there is an error if there is an exception happening don't try to silence it make sure that you are trying to handle it and make sure that there is enough information for somebody who's looking at that error at a later point in time it also says keep the implementation easy to explain keep it very simple if you are lazy like me and you don't want to go to internet to read the zen of python all that you need to do is import this and this would print the zen of python in here as a beginning programmer a lot of these might not really make sense this is a document i would recommend you to revisit once in a while and see what you can gain out of it especially when you are starting off some of these might seem very complex very abstract very obscure that's not a problem as you work and write more and more code you'd see that most of these start making sense the most important thing to realize is the basic idea behind all these 19 principles is very simple whatever code you write should be easy to understand whenever somebody else looks at that code it, they should be able to make sense out of it very quickly and that's basically the fundamental guiding principle so keep your design simple keep your code simple and make sure that others are able to understand your code i'll see you in the next tip until then bye bye welcome back welcome to this section on introduction to object oriented programming the way you think in structured or procedural programming is completely different from how you would think in object oriented programming in this section you will be introduced to thinking in terms of objects we will discuss about what is a class what is an object what is state what is behavior and also discuss about a few important object oriented basic concepts encapsulation and abstraction we will use a lot of examples to discuss about object oriented programming and the different terminology which is used with respect to object oriented programming i am excited to bring this section to you
I'll see you in the next video where we would start with the basics of object-oriented programming. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back to this video about introduction to object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is all about thinking in terms of objects. Before we get into depth with this, we will talk a little bit about structured programming. If you have done any programming with languages like C or Pascal, you'd be doing something called procedural or structural programming. Procedural or structured programming involves thinking in terms of procedures. These are also called methods or functions. So let's say I have a problem to solve. The first thing I would try and do is to split the problem into multiple functions or multiple procedures. I would start thinking in terms of, okay, what are the functions I would need to write? What are the different steps involved in doing this? For example, let's say I would want to fly. So I would want to fly from one place to another place. Then I would start thinking in terms of the different steps involved. I'll say, okay, travel to airport, find a check-in counter, check-in, pass security check. So we are thinking more in terms of what are the important methods that we would need to create and how to combine them to solve the problem at hand. Procedural or structured programming is all about thinking in terms of functions or these are also called procedures. Object-oriented programming brings a new thought process around this. It says, okay, why don't we talk in terms of the different objects that are involved in the problem and also think about what is the data they would contain and what are the actions you can perform on them. Okay, is this sounding complex? Then you are not alone. That's how I felt when I was introduced to object-oriented programming as well about 15 years back. Let's take an example and try and understand how to think in terms of object-oriented programming. So let's take the example of taking a flight again. The first thing that we would be thinking about is what are the different objects that are involved? An aeroplane, a air hostess, a passenger, a airport, a cab that I would need to take to the airport, also the different persons that might be involved. So when we are thinking object-oriented, we are trying to identify the different things that are involved in our problem. The first thing which we would try and do is to identify the things like airplane, air hostess, passenger, the pilot, and things like that. Once we identify the things that are involved, we identify what data you would want to use about that specific thing. So what is the data that can represent an airplane? Maybe which airline? What is the make of the airplane? What is the type of an airplane, whether it's an Airbus or not? And what is the position? Where is it currently? So that's kind of typically the data. And also, you think in terms of actions. You'd be thinking in terms of the actions that you can perform on an airplane. Take off, land, cruise. A lot of things that you can do on an airplane. If you look at the air hostess, then probably the name of the air hostess address is the data. And there might be actions like wish, serve, and a number of other actions. When we are thinking about a passenger, his name, maybe his address, and a lot of information can be the data. And probably the actions he can perform is take cab, do a check-in, walk, smile, run, board the aircraft and a lot of such actions. So when we are thinking object-oriented programming, we are thinking about what are the objects, what is the data they might contain, and what are the actions that can be performed on them. The data that an object might contain is also called state of the object. The state of an object can change over a period of time. The position of an airplane now is different from the position of an airplane maybe after an hour. The actions that can be performed on the object are also called its behavior. In summary, the big picture is this. 
structured programming is all about thinking about procedures or methods that's all we would be thinking about in structured programming in object oriented programming we try and think in terms of objects and what kind of data they might contain and what are the operations or what are the actions that can be performed on these objects if all this seems a little confusing to you do not worry about it we would be using more than five examples to discuss this in detail in this specific section i'll see you in the next video welcome back in this video let's talk about what are the different terminologies which are associated with object oriented programming in the previous video we learned that object oriented programming is all about objects the state of the objects and the behavior what we are seeing in here is a simple class this does not really follow the java syntax i just created a simple template kind of thing to just represent a class and i'm creating two instances of the class in here what is a class a class is nothing but a template a class can define what are the data that an object can have and what are the actions that can be performed on an object a class is like a template for example a person is a class an object is an instance of a class so when we talk about person class the instances can be mahatma gandhi nelson mandela so a person class defines the attributes that are related to a person and each object of that specific class each instance of that specific class for example nelson mandela or mahatma gandhi can have different values for the attributes of the class let's consider this example right so we have a planet class and we are creating two instances earth and venus you can have other instances as well mars jupiter so this is a class which defines that a planet in general will have a name location and a distance from the sun and earth is a specific instance of that planet and for earth the name is earth location is let's say specific coordinates of the earth and the distance from sun for earth would have a different value compared to the other instance of planet venus if you are aware of the solar system then you would know that venus the distance of venus from sun is less than that of the earth from the sun so the distance from sun for venus would have a different value compared to the distance from sun for earth so a class is a template an object is an instance of that template earth venus the member data state or fields are the data which are present in every object so for each of these fields earth can have a different value and venus can have a different value so this is called member data or this is also called the state of an object this is represented by using something called fields or these are also called member variables the last terminology which is frequently used in object oriented programming is related to the methods which are defined in a class these methods are said to be representing actions actions that can be performed on a specific object so you can say earth dot revolve earth dot rotate or you can say venus rotate so these are the actions that can be performed on different objects this is called behavior of a class behavior of a class is the actions that can be performed on its objects the idea behind this video was to give you a quick introduction to all the terminology related to object oriented programming so a class is a template an object is an instance of that template the member data is what data an object can contain and behavior or actions or what are the actions what are the methods that can be called on a specific object let's end this video with a few exercises so think about an online shopping system and try and identify what are the different things that are involved in 
creating an online shopping system. So try and identify the objects, try and identify what kind of data would be associated with each object and also what kind of behavior would be associated with each of those objects. And the second one is much simpler exercise. So think about a person class. Think about what can be the data which can be present in that and also think about what are the actions that can be performed on it. So think about those two things. Those would be an interesting exercise as far as object oriented programming is concerned. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this short video, we will discuss about the exercises from the previous video, right? So the first thing which we talked about was the online shopping system. We wanted to identify the different objects that are involved and also the data associated with them and also the actions that can be performed. So here are a few examples. I mean, this is not really a complete master list as such. This is a representation of how you can think about them. I'm sure you would have identified much more than what I have shown in here. So the types I have identified are customer. A customer can have a name, address, and he can perform multiple actions, right? Log in, log out, select a product, check out, and a lot of other stuff, right? And shopping cart. Shopping cart can contain a list of items that a customer has already chosen. And the actions you can probably perform on a shopping cart are add an item, remove an item, and things like that. Another thing is a product, right? So a product has a name, it has a price, quantity available, that's all the data, that's the state. And the behavior is what are the methods that can be exposed? Probably order more products, change the price of the product. All those can be the actions that can be exposed. Actually, this is just a small representation. Actually, when you talk about an online shopping system, you can identify a number of other objects and also you can identify what state they might contain and what behavior is possible on them. Now let's get to the other exercise. The other exercise was to identify things related to a person. So there's a class called person. What is the data that you would want to have there and what are the actions? What are the methods that you would want to have there, right? So these are a few examples. So name of a person, maybe you can even split it up and say first name, last name and middle name address you can even split it up again right so you can store the zip code country state and all that kind of information as well what kind of hobbies does this person have where does he work is he studying all that is the data about a person right and the other thing is the actions that can be performed right so walk run sleep eat drink travel move a lot of things that can be performed on the person so the idea behind this exercises was to start getting you thinking in terms of object oriented programming, right? So we are trying to identify the different objects that are present. What is the state? That is, what is the data they might contain? And what is the behavior? What are the methods or actions that can be performed on them? That's a lot of theory that we talked about until now. I'm itching to get my hands dirty. In the next step, we would start creating a number of classes, creating instances or objects for them and try and play around with them. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. After hearing a lot of theory about object-oriented programming, it's time to get our hands dirty. Let's make it much more interesting with a hands-on exercise where we would be doing things in the Python shell. We'll be creating a few classes and we'll be creating instances of the class as well. Let's get started with trying to create a class in Python. How do you create a class in Python? The syntax is very simple. Let's say I want to create a country class. So class country. For now, I don't want to really have anything in this class. So I press enter and I'll say pass. So pass basically helps us to create an empty class. Pass can also be used to create an empty method. For now, we are creating an empty class using a pass. So class country followed by a semicolon followed by pass. Class is a keyword and colon is part of the syntax. Country is the name of the class. As we said earlier, the class acts as a template. It's a blueprint. And based on this blueprint, we can create instances of the class. 
how can we create instances of the class in Python? The way we can create instances of a class in Python is very simple. All that you need to do is India is the name of the instance and country name of the class followed by parenthesis. So I would want to create an instance of the country class and I would want to call it India. In a similar way, you can create multiple instances. So I can say USA is equal to country. Netherlands is equal to country. So country is a template and we are creating different instances of the country. India, USA, Netherlands. These instances are also called objects. So we created three objects of the country class. One of the characteristics of objects is each of these objects have their own state. Right now, because the class does not provide any behavior or data, the state of these objects is empty. They have an empty state. Now, let's add a little bit of state to these objects. How can I add state? By creating attributes. So I'm going to say India.name is equal to India. And I can say India.capital is equal to Delhi or you can call it New Delhi. So now what is the state of the India object? It has a name of India and a capital of New Delhi. However, the state of USA and Netherlands is still empty. Let's create some state for them as well. USA.name is equal to United States of America. I'll just put in USA and USA.capital. What's the capital of USA? Yep, Washington. And Netherlands.name is equal to, I'll just put it as Netherlands in a simple way. And Netherlands.capital Amsterdam. So now we have state in each of these objects. One of the important things that you need to understand is when I do India.name, it prints India. So when I change the state of other objects, when I'm changing the state of Netherlands or the state of USA, the state of India does not change. Each of these objects have their own individual state. So when I change name of USA, it will not change the name of India. When I change capital of Netherlands, it will not change the state of the capital of India. This is one of the most important characteristics of all the objects. Each objects have their own instances of the data. And that data is called state of the object. Right now, we don't really have any behavior. Behavior is the methods that you can do. Behavior is the operations that you can perform on the objects. Right now, we have not defined any methods. In, during theory, we learned that a class is a blueprint. You can create instances of the class and these are called instances or objects. And each object can have their own state. State is represented by data elements or attributes or member attributes. We looked at the hands-on part of that stuff in this specific video. We understood how to create a class, country. This is the blueprint. We created three instances and we gave them their own attributes, their own member data, their own state. We saw that changing the state of one object will not affect the other objects. We will talk a lot more about object-oriented programming in the subsequent videos. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we created our first class in Python, created a few instances of it, and tried to set some data into it. In this step, let's do the same thing in an IDE. We are going to use PyCharm, and we are going to create a new project to be able to do that. So what I'll do is go to file, I'll say new project and I'll give the name as 02 oops and say create. I'll choose to open it in the current window and I'll say add it to the currently opened projects. So let's see what would happen. 
you can see that the project is listed right here so that I can now work on both these projects together. It will take a little while. It does a lot of stuff to make sure that the entire project is set up. And at the end of it, we have our OOPS project ready. Now, how can I create a new Python file? We have been doing it multiple times. Control N and say new Python file. And I would want to create a file with the name OOPS basics and say OK. Now, what we'll do in this video is we'll create a simple class. We'll want to call the class as motorbike. We would create a few instances of this specific class. How can we define a class? Very simple, right? Class motorbike. Isn't that cool? And followed by a colon. And for now, let's have it as an empty class. How do I create instances of the class? I just need to say Honda is equal to motorbike. Ducati is equal to motorbike. I'll go ahead and print these objects. So I'll do print of Honda and print of Ducati. Let's see what would happen. I'll do a right click, run Oops Basics. You can see that two objects are being printed. Now, I can also add a little bit of state to these motorbikes, right? So each of these motorbikes might be having an initial starting speed. So let's say Honda.speed is equal to, let's say the starting speed is 50 miles per hour. And Ducati.speed is equal to 25 or 250, whichever one you'd like. Now what we have is two instances of the motorbike class and we have initialized the speeds for them as well. So in addition to the objects, we can also try and print the current state of Honda. What's the current speeds of Honda? If you look at it, it would print 50 and 250. The thing about state of an object is it can change during the lifetime of the object. I can do now Honda.speed is equal to 150. What, are, what we are doing in here is we are changing the state of the object Honda. And if you actually print Honda.speed after this, what would be the output? Let's see what it would be. It's printing 150 because we changed the speed of Honda. However, we have not changed the speed of Ducati. So what do you think will be the output when I say print Ducati.speed? It would remain 250. When I printed the speed of Honda here, it was 50. However, when I print the speed of Honda here, the state changed. It became 150. However, Ducati's speed did not change because we did not change the value of the attribute speed. Until now, we created a simple class, we created a couple of instances, we set some state into it, and we saw that state of an object can change during the duration of a program. Now, you can pause the video in here, and I would recommend you to create a new class. So I'll recommend you to create a new class called book. I would recommend you to create three instances of the book object. So create three instances, have your favorite books as the names of the object instances. And for each of these instances, have an attribute or a property by the name, name, and set the name of the book into it. At the end of the whole thing, try and print the name of all the three instances of the books. So it's very simple, create a class called book, create three instances of your favorite books and set names for each one of them. One of the things I'll do is I'll rename this file. So I'll say right click, refactor, rename. Because this file contains motorbike, I'll rename this to motorbike.py. And I'll create a new Python file and I'll call this book.py. You can just type in book, class, book. We want to create an empty class starting off. So the art of computer programming is the first instance I would want to create. Is this the way we name variables in Python? Nope. It should be the art of computer programming. Book learning Python is equal to book learning restful services is equal to book. 
so these are we can create instances and for each of them I can set a name so name for computer programming is the art of computer programming learning Python is equal to oops dot name is equal to learning Python learning my restful services is equal to learning restful services in 50 steps let's say this is 100 steps so this is basically the way we can actually create instances and set names set state for each of those instances and now I can print the state of the object how can I do that print learning python dot name print learning restful services dot name what will be the output of this program right click run book and error once I click on it it would take me to the error the mistake which we did was we did not have actually name on it so learning services dot name let's run it again and now you'd see the names of all the books printed in here the initial versions of the motorbike and the book class that we are creating here are very basic during the course of this section we'll enhance these two classes to be having even more functionality now that we have the basic setup we'll talk about more advanced stuff in the subsequent steps until then bye bye welcome back in this quick video, we'll look at a few puzzles related to all the stuff which we have learned about classes and objects. Let's create a new class. I'll call this class planet and I'll have it as an empty class. Is this allowed? I can, can I put pass in here to say it's an empty class? Think about it. Actually, yes. If it's an empty class, then you can put pass directly in here. So this defines a class called planet. And how can I create instances of the planet class? It's very simple, right? Earth is equal to planet. Is that right? Yep. Can I use something like new planet? Actually, it would give you an error because the syntax in Python is just very simple. Earth is equal to planet. When I'm creating planet, will I be able to assign a name to it? Can I say Earth, planet, Earth? Would, it, would this be allowed? Can I set something of this kind? Actually, not. We'll look at this in the next section where we'll be able to add a name directly when we are creating an instance of the class. But for now, our default class does not support this behavior. I've created an instance called Earth. So what would happen now if I say Earth.name? What would happen? I've not set anything into Earth yet. What would happen now? It says planet object has no attribute name. What it's saying is right, as of now, planet object does not have any attribute called name. Now let's set the name earth.name is equal to the earth. Now if I, if you do the same thing now, what would happen? It prints the earth. Cool, right? So we have set an attribute called name to the object of a planet class called Earth and the name which we set is the Earth. Now let's create a new instance of the planet. Let's call this Venus. Venus is equal to planet. As simple as that. What happens if I do Venus.name? It does not have an attribute name. One of the important things is each object has its own data, it has its own attributes. So the fact that we have set attributes on the Earth does not mean the same attributes would exist on Venus. What we need to do is we need to set the name for Venus as well. And now you'd be able to use Venus. The last thing that we will be looking at is the behavior. So what would happen if I would call a non-existent method? So let's say Venus dot do something. There is nothing called do something, but I'm doing Venus dot do something. What would happen? it would again throw an attribute error. It says it does not have an attribute called do something. One of the interesting things that you would note in here is the fact that Python considers methods and data as well as 
attributes. So the way it's implemented in Python is both the data and the methods are all implemented as attributes. And the thing with Python is you can add attributes dynamically. So during the runtime of the program, you can add new attributes, new methods as attributes as well. The idea behind this step is to take a behind the screen look at objects, classes, and attributes. Let's move on to other topics in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we were introduced to the world of object-oriented programming. And in the previous step, we created the motorbike class and we set a state for it. One of the things you might typically be thinking about is you might want to do something when an object is created. So when the motorbike object is being created, you might want to do something. You might want to print something. How can you do that? That's where constructors come into picture. In this step, we will define a constructor for the motorbike class and we'll try and print something in it. How do you define a constructor for a motorbike class? Once we start defining the constructor, this is not going to be an empty class anymore. So I'll remove the pass and over here I can define a method. Constructor is a special method. So the way we would define it is by saying underscore underscore init underscore underscore. One of the important things to understand is the fact that for all the methods in a class, which are instance methods, you need to pass in an attribute called self. We will talk about a few puzzles related to self a little later. For now, the important thing is you need to exactly define as per the syntax here. So underscore underscore init underscore underscore and you pass a parameter called self. And over here, you can define what you want to do when a motorbike class is created. So I can say motorbike instance created. So all that we did is define a simple function. We removed the pass and we added in this piece of code in. Let's see what would happen if I run this. If you see at the start, we see that motorbike instance created is printed twice. So when we are executing this line of code, you'd see that this is printed. And when we are creating the next instance, then this is also created. You'd see that, let's say I'm creating another instance. Let's call this Ducati 2. So I'll say Ducati 2 is equal to motorbike and run it. And you'd see that now a third statement is printed, motorbike instance created. So whenever we create an instance of an object, this code over here is executed. Typically, we use constructors not to just print statements. What we want to do is we would want to initialize the objects that are present in here. Let's remove this line of code, Ducati 2. What we are doing here is actually we are creating an object and we are setting the initial data. We are creating an object and we are setting the initial data. Why not? set the initial data right when we are constructing the object. Why not say motorbike of 50? Why not say motorbike of 250? Why not set the initial state into the instance of the object directly? One of the things you'd see if you hover over here, it says unexpected argument and you'd see that when you, because the constructor as it is right now, it's not ready to accept the argument 50. So how can we set 50 into the instance of the object? We can add it as a parameter to the constructor. So I can say speed. What we are doing is we are adding a parameter called speed to the constructor. And now I would want to make use of this speed variable. So I can say print speed. Let's comment out all the lines of code which are doing print on the Honda. Control slash or command slash and run this. What you'd see now is 50 is printed and then motorbike instance created. 250 is created, motorbike instance created. So the value which we are passing in here is present over here. So we are able to take it and print it. However, 
if I uncomment these two lines of code, you'd see, if I run this, you'd see an error because it says Honda, oops, it's failing right now because of an unexpected indent. Let's fix the indent. Let's fix that up and let's run it again. And now you'd see that motorbike has no attribute called speed. So what it's saying is I have no idea what this speed attribute that you are referring to is. We have printed the speed in here, but did we set it into the instance of the object? No. How do we set it into the object? The way we can do that is by using the self which is present in here. You can do self. So to the current object, we want to create an attribute called speed. In the current object, we want to create an attribute called speed. And what is the value of that attribute? Is parameter which is passed in. So the way we refer to the parameter is just like that. But what we want to do is we would want to take it and set it into an attribute called speed. The way we do that is by saying self.speed. So on the current object, we would want to set an attribute called speed with the value that is coming into this parameter. Now you'd see that these two statements are printing the speed of Honda and Ducati. So Honda speed is 50 and Ducati speed is 250. Isn't that cool? So what we are able to do in this step is we are able to enhance our motorbike class and we created a constructor and we made the constructor initialize data. What I'll do now is I'll remove the print statements which makes the entire thing confusing and run this again and you'd see that Honda.speed is set and Ducati.speed also is set. We use the constructor typically to initialize the attributes on a object. So over here, the attribute which we wanted to set was an attribute called speed. So we initialize the motorbike with a speed called 50 and we created an instance of it and we called it Honda. Over here, we set the speed to 250 and we were able to print the content of it. I'll leave you with an exercise. We have created the book class earlier and over here what we did was we made the name as a separate thing. So we set name separately. What I would recommend you to do as an exercise is to change this and pass the name of the book as part of the constructor of the book class. So I would want to be able to say instead of the art of computer programming dot name, I'd want to be able to take this and put it in here and remove this line of code and do the same thing for these two things as well. So create a constructor and solve this problem and I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Let's start with the exercise from the previous step. What we wanted to do is we would want to create a constructor like this, right? So book of learning Python in 100 steps and remove this line of code. So let's remove these two lines of code and let's take this and put it down here as well. So this is the kind of code that we would want to write. If you execute the code as it is right now, if you save this and do a right click run book, what would happen? It says error. It says object takes no parameters because we the default constructor does not take any parameters. We will need to create a constructor in the book class. How do we create a constructor in the book class? The way we can do that is by removing the pass and we would be writing our own constructor method. The name of the method should be underscore init underscore and we accept self as the parameter. We can write the code that we want in here. What we want to do is we want to create a constructor accepting name of the book. So we need to add a parameter called name and self.name is equal to name. Let's see what would happen now. Cool. We are able to use the constructor to set a name to all these books. Congratulations and I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at a few puzzles related to constructors. Let's create the planet class again. How about this time with a constructor? So def underscore underscore init 
underscore underscore and I'm not passing anything in here and I'm creating a pass. So it's a empty method that we are creating as a constructor. So what would happen when I say planet? Aha, uh -huh. it says error. It says init takes zero positional arguments, but one was given. What's happening here? Why is it giving us an error? The thing is, all instance methods in a class need to have self as a parameter. Whenever we are creating an object, what we are doing in here is we are calling the constructor. And by default, Python would pass the current instance as an argument. So even though we are not passing any arguments in here, by default, Python would pass one parameter. That's why it's saying, okay, there was one given, one parameter was given, but this method is accepting zero and that's the reason why it fails so if i really want to actually create the right constructor then i would need to have self as the first parameter of the constructor method now i would be able to say planet and create a new instance you can see that a new object was created now let's go to the class planet again let's try and create it again now, in addition to the existing constructor, I would want to create another constructor in it, underscore, underscore. I would want to have it accept another parameter. So let's say I would want to have name as the parameter. Let's create it as an empty method for now. So I'm creating two constructors, one with one parameter and the other one with two parameters. What do you think will happen now? It's creating the constructor. Let's try and create it. It says missing one required positional argument, name. So even though I have two constructors in here, it's only taking the second one. It's not really using the first constructor and matching it in here. The reason is because in Python, you can only have one constructor per class. You can either have this or this. What happens when you define the class is whichever one comes later is the one which would be accepted. So if I did class planet and if I had this as the first one and this as the second one, then I would have been able to create planet, but I will not be able to create planet with a name. It says it only accepts one parameter, but you are passing two. The reason why it's saying two is when, we, when I pass Jupiter as the parameter, what happens is self and Jupiter are passed as parameters. So two parameters are passed. And when we define a class like this, the way you can remember it is like this. In Python, you can only have one constructor per class. Whatever is the last constructor, that's the only constructor which is valid. All the earlier constructors are replaced. So when we created the no argument constructor first and the one argument constructor next, the one argument constructor is the one which is valid. When we created one argument constructor first and we then created a no argument constructor, the no argument constructor is valid. Now you might be thinking, what if I would want to be able to create planet like this as well as like this. I want to be able to create a planet you passing no parameters as well as passing one parameter or passing two parameters. How can I do that? How can I do that with one constructor? Think about it. There was something which we learned about methods earlier. Yep, the default values. That's how you can do that. So the way we can do that is by saying class planet and we can create we can define the constructor with a default value. I can say name is equal to Earth. The default planet has a name of Earth. Now, what would happen? I can create planet and I would be able to even say planet of Jupiter. Both of them would be allowed. The last thing which we'll look at is let's create planet class again I'll use the same thing however over here what I'll do 
is remove the pass and press enter and let's go inside the code for the method self dot let's say asset speed is equal to 10 self dot name is equal to name self dot distance from sun is equal to 10,000. Do you think this class would compile? Here we are only passing in one argument to the constructor, but we are initializing more than one properties. Do you think this is allowed? The answer is yes. This is a valid thing to do in a constructor. What we are setting in here are called the default values for properties. So what we are doing is the one parameter we are accepting is the name of the planet. However, both the other ones, speed and the distance from sun, we are setting it to default values. And that's cool. So now if I create a new planet, earth is equal to planet and say earth dot name, what would be the value? Earth, earth dot speed, it would be initialized to 10 and earth dot distance from sun it would be 10,000 typically in Python you can have your constructor define all the properties that you would want to be defined on your object you can also set initial values to them we'll leave you with one last tip about naming classes earlier we looked at naming variables distance from sun is a attribute it's a variable we used small case and we used underscore to separate the words we use the same convention when we were naming methods as well however when we name classes typically camel case is used that's basically the reason why when we name the class we used the name motor bike so motor and bike are two words and in camel case the way we do that is by not using underscore to separate them but we would make the second word start with a capital letter so in python to name classes we use camel case and we use the first word also is capitalized so we start with a capital letter and then every subsequent word is also capitalized so this is how we name classes in python again there is nothing stopping you from calling this motor underscore bike but what we are talking about are conventions which are followed across the sphere of python programming i'll see you in the next step until then bye welcome back in the previous steps we talked about constructors and how they are helpful in initializing the state of an object one of the things that happens typically in programs is the state of the object keeps changing. So let's say over here, I would want to increase the speed of Honda. I can say Honda dot speed is equal to Honda dot speed plus 150. So I'm increasing the speed by 150. This could also be done by just saying Honda dot speed plus is equal to 150. Or I can say Ducati dot speed plus is equal to 25 so what we are doing in here is we are modifying the state of the object the thing is we are modifying the state of the object outside the class so outside the class we are writing code to modify the state of the object in this step we will talk about encapsulation and how we can encapsulate this kind of behavior directly inside the class now let's get started with encapsulation encapsulation is one of the most important object oriented principles that basically says all data and data changes should happen through methods or through behavior of a class so over here how are we increasing the speed what we are doing to increase the speed is we are directly changing the value of the attribute that is not really considered to be a good practice when it comes to object-oriented programming ideally the 
increase in speed should happen through a method which is defined inside the motorbike class. Let's now look at how to define a method inside the motorbike class. Now, how do you think we can define a method? Very simple, right? So, I'll just press enter in here and start defining a method inside the motorbike class. The most important thing is this is at the same indentation level as the constructor. So, def, I would need to name the method. I would want to increase speed. As soon as I press open parenthesis, it would give me self as a parameter and it completes the rest of the syntax. That's one of the things IDE does. But the important thing is for all instance methods, we need to pass self as one of the parameters. If you don't pass self as a parameter, you would get an exception. We will look at it a little later. For now, let's focus on increasing the speed. When we want to increase speed, how do we increase speed? We would want to increase speed by some value, right? So I'll call this how much. So how much do I want to increase this speed by? And over here, I can say self dot speed plus is equal to how much. So what happens now is I can increase the speed using the behavior. So I can say Honda dot increase speed and pass in how much I would want to increase it by 150 and Ducati dot increase speed how much do I want to increase it by if you print I'll remove the statements from here and I'll print them down here let's run this you'd see that the speed of Honda becomes 200 and the speed of Ducati is 275 250 plus 25 and 50 plus 150 what we are doing now is we are increasing the speed through behavior on an object. So our objects right now have both state and the behavior. Let's print the values before the increase of the speed as well. And let's run this. And you'd see that over here, the Honda.speed is 50. Ducati.speed is 250. And we are increasing speed. We are changing the state. How are we changing the state of Honda? By calling the behavior, by calling a method on the Honda object. So our Honda object, the state of it was speed of 50 before this. We are calling a method to increase the speed. And we are changing the state of Honda object to increase the speed to 200. So our object has both state and behavior. And the change in the state is happening through the behavior of the object. What we are doing here is we are encapsulating the logic of how to increase the speed inside the class. And this logic can be reused on all instances of the motorbike class. Now, what if I want to decrease the speed? So, we have increased the speed, but what if I want to decrease the speed? I'm copy pasting the entire thing and I'm changing the method name to decrease speed. Decrease speed. I would want to decrease the speed by 50 and decrease the speed by 25 again. I can easily decrease the speed by creating another method, right? So all that I need to do is put it in here. So I'll do decrease speed self how much here speed is decreased isn't that cool now if i run this you'd see that the speed of honda is decreased by 50 and ducati is also reduced by 25 so 275 becomes 250 and 200 becomes 150 so in this short video we created behavior on the class we created a couple of methods increase speed and decrease speed to enable us to increase the speeds and decreases speeds on instances of motorbikes. We executed the methods on both the Honda instance and the Ducati instance. I'll leave you with an exercise. Enhance the book class that we created to have a new property called copies. How many copies of the book are available? And have methods to increase the copies and decrease the copies as well. Another thing is to have copies as a constructor argument. Make sure that you are setting an initial value when you are creating an instance of the object and have methods to increase and decrease the number of copies. Do that as an exercise and I'll see you in the next step with the solution.
Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. Let's pick up from where we left the exercise in the previous step. We wanted to create copies and we wanted to add it as a constructor argument. So name, comma, copies. And I'll set the default values of copies to zero. And what I'll also do is say self dot copies is equal to copies. We want to have a method called increase copies, right? So what I'll do is I'll try and have it in here. So let's say learning Python dot increase copies. And we also want a method to decrease the copies. Learning Python dot decrease copies. So let's say I want to increase it by 25 and decrease it by 10. You'd see that there is no method called increase copies or decrease copies. And let's see how to get the IDE to do that. I'll place my cursor in here and you'd see that a small bulb comes up in here and it says add method increase copies to class B, class book. Let's do that. And you can see that the signature of the method is automatically created. It creates an empty method, but that's okay. Let's go ahead and put it right next to decrease copies, moving the line to next one and putting a cursor in here. And this comes up and I'd say add method decrease copies. Now you'd see that the methods are created. The signature is by default created by the IDE. And now I can focus on the code in here. So increase copies, how much? I would want to be very clear with my names of the variables. I don't want to leave it at param, how much? And over here, self.copies plus is equal to how much? And over here, it's self.copies minus is equal to how much? Isn't that easy? Now I can go ahead and try and see what's the value inside them. I'll comment these lines of code, control slash or command slash, and let's print learning python dot copies. What do you think will be the output? It's printing 15. So by default, what's the value of copies? It's zero. And we are increasing it by 25 and decreasing it by 10. So 0 plus 25 minus 10, which is 15, and that's what is printed in here. If you want to assign an initial number of copies, you can do that as well. So I can say comma 100. So learning Python, I'm creating initially 100 copies, and then 25 is increased, and then 10 is decreased. So 100 plus 25 minus 10, 115. Let's see what would happen. 115. Isn't that cool? We have now created a book class with accepting a name and number of copies as the initial values to create the object. And we created behavior in it as well. We are now able to increase the number of copies and decrease the number of copies as well. I'll see you in the next step. We would be talking about a lot more object oriented stuff. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the last step, we added behavior to our book class as well as the motorbike class. We created a couple of methods, increase copies, decrease copies, increase speed, decrease speed. And we looked at how they are useful in changing the state of an object. In this step, let's get back to the puzzles related to behavior or to the methods that we create on a class. Let's get back to our favorite planet class. And this time, let's create a method. So def revolve, I'm just saying, Revolve is a method that I'm defining in here. And over here, let's create an empty method. Let's create earth is equal to planet. So we have defined a method on the planet class. Can I do earth.revolve? What do you think will happen? Aha, error. It says we are giving one parameter, but Revolve is taking zero parameters. How is this happening? Where are we giving one parameters in here? That's where self comes into picture. Whenever we call a method on an instance of a class, whenever you call a method on the object, what happens? One parameter automatically gets passed. That's self. 
we saw that when we were invoking the constructor the same is the case with all the methods inside a class by default one parameter gets passed so on all your instance methods you need to create a parameter called self and only then you would be able to call methods on it so self is very very important to be able to create a instance method inside a class now let's get back to our favorite pycharm editor and try the next puzzle i'll say right click new python file and i'll call this planet dot py and what i would want to do is let's say planet i would want to create a instance of the planet class earth is equal to planet what would happen there is no planet class yet right if i go and hover over here there's a red bulb which comes up i can say create class planet id does the magic for us what we want to do now is create another method inside this class so i'll remove the pass i'll create a method very quickly def let's call it rotate obviously we need to pass self as the parameter that's what we learned in the first puzzle and now i can say the logic so let's just say rotate so if i call the rotate method it prints rotate let's create another one let's call this revolve and revolve now we would want to have another method in here which does rotate and revolve and instead of repeating the logic in here what i want to do is call rotate and i would want to be able to say revolve i would want to call the other methods which are present in here and over here i can say earth dot rotate and revolve to call that specific method right you are already seeing red underlines which says we are doing something wrong but let's check what we are doing wrong so right click run planet aha it says name rotate is not defined if i click this it takes me to this line and rotate here is not defined but we have the rotate method in here so how can i call a method which is defined on the same object how can i call a method defined in the same class the way we can do that is by using the keyword self self dot rotate self dot revolve and now if you run the program you would see that it prints rotate and revolve the important lesson from this is the fact that you need to have self to call methods on the same class so if there's a method in this class and i would want to call it from another method in the same class i need to do self dot that specific method self dot method the two things that we discussed in this specific video are number one we definitely need to have self as a parameter or an instance method so if you have an instance method belonging to a specific class you would definitely need to have a self parameter if you'd want to call the method on an object of that specific class the second thing we learned is how to call other methods defined in the same class the way we would do that is by doing self dot self dot i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back one of the important questions that a number of people ask about encapsulation is why do we really need encapsulation in this small video we'll give you an example of why we need encapsulation what we have here is methods to increase speed and decrease speed right so we decrease speed by 25 and if i run this program right now the motorbike program right now it shows the state so what i'll do is i'll comment out all the intermediate prints so that we have the final state after this only printed we see that at this particular point the speed is 150 and 250 now what if i call decrease speed by 350 should this be allowed what's the current speed of honda 150 and i'm saying decrease speed by 350 what would happen now if i take these lines and put it down here aha so the code outside the class is trying to play havoc with our honda object the speed becomes minus 200 and is it possible no nope. that's where encapsulation helps us if people were using honda dot speed minus is equal to 350 then it becomes a little more difficult to control what people are doing but because they are calling the method 
what we can do now is we can have a check in here we can say if self dot speed minus how much is greater than zero so only allow it if it's greater than zero put a colon in here and now when I run it you'd see that the speed remains at 150 decrease speed has now has a validation it says do something better you cannot decrease by that much and I can say else print get a life and what would happen oops colon run it again it says get a life so it says okay nope that's not the way you cannot decrease it by that much because the current speed is not so high and it says get a life these are the kinds of things you can do if you use methods so if you use behavior to change the state of the object then you can add additional logic at a later point in time and that's the reason why encapsulation is good so try and encapsulate all the behavior inside a class and that would help you to do things at a later point in time which would allow you to enhance things a lot in this video we looked at one of the advantages of encapsulation until the next step bye bye welcome back in the previous few steps we learned a lot of basics about object oriented programming state behavior constructors encapsulation and a lot of such stuff one of the important things to remember is that in python everything is a object what do i mean what do i mean by everything is an object when we create even a simple value like five so i'm creating five as a value right so if you do type of phi what does it say it says it's of type int so there is a class called int in python and when you say five what it's doing is it's creating an instance of that class so phi is actually an object of a class int now if i say type of true what happens it says it's of type bool boolean class so true is an instance of a class called boolean type of a piece of text what's the type it's of type str earlier we saw that we were able to invoke methods on hello i can say hello dot upper right why is it allowed because hello is an object and I can call methods that are defined in the class which the object belongs to hello belongs to string class and in string class there's a method called upper defined and what is it printing hello with a caps that's why it's allowing me to call methods the same is the case with a floating point value as well floating point value belongs to a class float so this 5.5 is an instance it's an object of the class float everything that you see in python is a object the interesting part comes when we talk about methods right we created methods earlier right so we said def do something let's create an empty method pass right that's how we create empty methods if you type in do something what does it say it says function do something at a specific address the thing is this is also a object you can actually define a method do something let's say it prints something now if I do something you can see that it's at a new address but the important thing is when you call do something what would happen it would execute the method and print something thing is even this do something is a object you can take it and assign to another variable so let's say I want to instead of do something I would want to give it a new name test is equal to do underscore something so I'm taking a function so do something what is it it's a function I'm taking it 
and giving it to another variable and if I say test it would say now test refers to a function and I can even execute it with this name you can see that when I say test and parenthesis it's printing something isn't that very interesting this is possible because even function is an object in Python. The most important thing to understand from this specific video is in Python, everything is an object. The constant values that you create are objects of specific classes. The functions you create, the methods you create are also instances. I hope you had an interesting time in this section learning about the basics of object-oriented programming. I'll see you in the next section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this section on data structures in Python. In this section, you would discuss why do we need data structures and what are the important data structures that Python provides by default. One thing I can tell you is these data structures that Python provides are very powerful. There are a lot of operations that you can do with minimal code in Python. In this step, let's focus on the first question. Why do we need data structures? Let's say I have multiple values to store. Let's say I would want to store marks of different students. First student mark is 45. Second student mark is, let's say, 54. These guys are average students, maybe like me. And mark 3, this guy is a very good student. So he got, let's say, uh, 80, 80 marks. Now, I want to find out the sum of all these three guys. How can I do that? Mark 1 plus Mark 2 plus Mark 3. So, the professor asks, what's the sum and what is the average? I would do this, right? So, I would say the average of the marks in the class is this. Okay, 59.6 something, something, something. That's cool. But now, professor says, there's a new student. Mark 4. Aha. Uh -huh. I would need to have a new student. He gets marks. Mm -hmm. Now, the formula, aha, mark 4 by 3. Aha, I made a mistake. Actually, it should have been 4. Right? So, that's what would happen. Each time you have a new student with a new mark, you create a new variable and store his marks. This is how your program keeps changing. And that's not ideal. When you have a list of marks, you would rather store them in specific data structures that would allow easy manipulation. And that's where the data structures in Python comes in. Let's now look at a specific data structure in Python called list and how it helps us to solve the problem that we discussed earlier. Creating data structures in Python is very, very simple. You don't need to be even aware of which class a data structure belongs to. All that you need to do is, let's say I would want to store the marks. So I would need to say marks is equal to, initially, in our example, we had three marks, 45, 54, and 80. So we are initializing marks with these three values. I want to find the sum of them. Aha, sum of marks. I'd want to do the average. I can do sum of marks divided by length of marks so we are not hard coding anything so you can see that it's exactly the same as earlier now i'm getting a new mark what do i need to do i just need to say marks dot append the new value what's the new value 43 now i would want to find out the average again what i would need to do same code the code does not change and you can see that it is exactly the same average as earlier. If you look at the type of marks, this is something called list. So what we are doing when we create a data structure using square brackets is we are creating an instance of the class list. In this step, we discuss the need for data structures. We said manipulating individual values is very, very difficult. And that's why you'd want to group them and put them in a data structure. That allows you to use the same code irrespective of number of elements. 
and it would help us to make our code very easy to maintain. I'll see you in the next step where we will talk a lot more about the operations that you can perform on lists in Python. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at the list data structure. How do you create a list data structure? It's very simple. All that you need to do is have square brackets and put the elements you'd want to have in the list in the list. So 23, 56, 67, Let's say those are the elements I would want to look at in the list. I would need to say marks is equal to this. That's it. I'm able to create a list and I can do variety of operations on this list easily. So let's look at the basic things you can do. Sum of marks. You can do max of marks. You can do min of marks. You can do length of marks. All these functions are very obvious right this gives you how many elements are present this is the minimum maximum and this is sum of all elements if you want to add more elements you can do max dot append let's say 76 now if you print max it has the new element 76 at the end if you want to add element at a specific index you can do that as well max dot insert let's say i would want to insert something in between 56 and 67 let's say 60 and I would want to insert it at index 3. Actually, index 2, because this is 0, 1, and I would want to put it at index 2. Very simple. Now, if I do max, you'd see that 60 is inserted in here. You can remove a value from max as well. So, all that you need to do is remove 60. You can also check if a specific element is in the list or not. All that you need to do is say 55 in max false is 56 in max true and also you can search for a specific element you can say max dot index of let's say i would want to find out the index of 67 it returns index of 2 so 0 1 and 2 let's see what the max content is so 67 is 0 1 and 2 so that's what it returns let's say i say max dot index of a non-existing element 69 what does it return it returns an error it says 69 is not in list the other thing you can do is loop around the elements in the list so you can say for mark in marks colon print mark you can see that it's very easy and you'd be able to see 23 56 67 76 printed out to the console in this video we looked at some of the basic operations that you can perform on lists. We saw operations like sum, max, min, length, appending a new element, inserting a new element, removing a specific element, checking whether an uh, element is in the list or not. And also we found how to find a specific elements index and how to loop around a list. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, Let's look at an exercise using the list that we created earlier. What we want to do is we would want to create a student class. What we want to be able to do is we would want to be able to create a student class accepting a name and list of marks. And we would want to be able to perform all these operations which are listed in here on this student class. We would be able to find out how many number of marks are there. We would want to find out this total sum of marks. We would want to determine the maximum mark. We would want to determine the minimum mark. We would want to calculate the average. We would want to add a new mark as well as remove marks at a specific index. So these are all the operations we would want to support and we would want to create the student class which supports all that operations. You can pause the video in here and try it as an exercise. What I'll do is I'll copy this and get started with the solution. Let's go to PyCharm and let's create our new class again. Control N. I want to create a new Python file and I will call this student. And OK. I'll paste this stuff in and say control slash or command slash to comment this out. So what we want to do is create a class called student, right? So let's minimize this off. Control 1, Command 1 so that we can use the full screen and we are ready to get started now let's start class student 
colon. The first thing we want to do is we would want to be able to create a student, right? So this is the code that we would want to be able to do. And we would want to be able to give a student a name and we'd want to be able to give him a list of marks. So I'll give him 23, 45, 56, 75. So these are his marks in different subjects. Now we need to define a constructor. So let's get started. Def underscore underscore init. Press enter so that it fills autofills. Self is a mandatory thing that we need to definitely have. After that is the name and after that is the marks. So what I would need to do now is I would need to take the name and marks and put it into the current object. Self.name is equal to name and self.marks is equal to marks. That's cool, isn't it? We have our constructor defined. Now let's go ahead and define our get number of marks method. Let's go ahead def i would want to say get number of marks and over here we would want to find out the number of marks inside the student where are the number of marks inside self dot marks so do you remember a function which helps us to do that yep return length of self dot marks right is it that right now let's try and print let's use formatted thing and let's say student and over here let's print number number so let's run this and see what the output is you can see that the number of marks is four so you can also say number of marks to be even more clearer that's cool right so we have number of marks as four now you can pause the video in here and try the remaining stuff as an exercise if you have not done the exercise before let's continue we can easily create the other methods as well so get total sum of marks this would be sum of marks right as simple as that determine maximum mark I want to find the maximum mark of a student. How do I find? Max. Cool, isn't it? Now, this define minimum mark. I would want to use minimum. The next one is average. Determine average. There is a statistics module in Python which helps us determine the average. But let's keep things simple and directly use whatever methods we already have in here. So we can say average as get total sum of marks so i can do self dot get total sum of marks divided by self dot get total number of marks that's the easiest way to do that right the next one we would want to add is to add number of marks how do i add a mark think about it self i would need to add a parameter so i would call this new mark and how do you add a mark to a list of marks which are present? Self dot marks dot self dot marks dot append new mark. The last function that we have is remove mark at index five. This would remove the mark at a specific index. So this is the index. One of the things is the method which we looked at earlier dot remove will only remove a specific value. It is not used to remove a value at a specific index. What we'll do to remove a value at a specific index is to say del self.marks at index. This way you'd need to remove a value. So if I want to remove a value at a specific index, so index is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if you'd want to val remove the value at a specific index, then you need to do del self.marks index one of the things which we are assuming is the index is a valid index if the index is a invalid index this would obviously throw an exception make sure that you are indenting it right so there should not be any space before all this stuff python is very very particular about indentation as you would have experienced until now so let's uncomment the whole thing and uh, one of the things is remove mark at index 5 would throw an exception because we have four elements and we are adding a new element so five elements so there will not be an index called 5 so let's add an index called 2 and 
let's print student dot marks over here and let's move the print statement a little down and print all the rest of the stuff so we have number of marks we'll print max we'll print min we'll print average maximum mark minimum mark and average one of the features that I can make use of is if I want to have the content split the string content split into multiple lines I can do triple string so if you do a triple string so this is three double quotes in a sequence what it allows us to do is it allows us to split the code into multiple lines so the string can be split into multiple lines and the entire content would also be printed the same way so let's run this program and let's see what would happen oops error so let's start with the first one it says return some of self dot marks the problem is that we are actually shadowing you can see that the IDE is highlighting this what we are have doing is we are creating a variable with the name sum which is actually replacing the method sum and that's not good so what we'll do is we'll say sum of marks as the name of the variable and let's print the sum of marks here sum of marks so this is something we should always be careful about there are inbuilt functions that we are making use of sum in here so if you have the same variable name as that then it would replace or it would shadow in the right terminology it's called shadowing now let's see what would happen cool isn't it so now I have all the things being printed in the right way so number of marks is 4 199 75 23 and 49.75 you can verify that the values are all right and I'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this video we'll look at a few puzzles to help us understand lists even further let's create a simple list this time we'll create a list of strings thing is you can create a list of strings as easily as you can create a list of numbers it's cat let's say dog elephant it's simple right so how do you find out how many animals are there length of animals right that's simple that's what we have done earlier what would sum of animals give what do you think it will give error obviously because plus is something which is not defined on a string similar to the list with numbers you can add values remove values and all that kind of stuff the functions remain exactly the same so you can do animals dot append fish what would happen animals would have the new value fish or you can do animals dot remove dog what would happen dog is gone one of the things you can do in Python is something of this kind so if I do animals of two what do you think will happen what would be printed zero one and two so you can almost use array indexes kind of stuff so this is kind of the array indexing that we do in C programming or Java programming so we can use that even in Python for lists so animals of one returns elephant zero cat but be sure you are actually using a right index because if you do four it would actually throw an index error one of the important things to remember when it comes to lists is the difference between animals dot remove and del so animals dot remove would remove the specified element from the list here we are specifying the actual value of the element however when we do dl animals of two what we are specifying is the index so when you want to remove an element specifying its value you would use remove when you want to remove an element specifying its index you would use del so you can do see del animals of two what would happen you can see that cat elephant and the last one which is at index two fish that is deleted the next important thing that you need to remember is the difference between append and extend if you look at lists there is also another method called extend and if you try and invoke the extend method and say 
fish, what would happen? So you can see that actually individual values from here are being added in. So F, I, S, H are added in. Whereas if I do animals dot append fish, what would happen? It would add an element called fish. So what is the difference between extend and append? Animals dot extend is actually used to add a list of values. So you not use an element like this. What you need to do is add a list of values. So I can say giraffe. If I get the spelling right. Horse. I can add a list of elements and you'd be able to see animals now. So you can see that the elements are added in. Cat, elephant and we saw we see the new elements in here giraffe and horse so that's one important thing that you need to remember is the difference between append and extend extend is used to add a list of elements so when we pass one element to extend what it does is it considers this as a list a string when it's considered as a list it would take individual characters and that's what it's adding in so the two important things that we discussed until now are the difference between remove and del and also the difference between append and extend. There is another way you can actually use do the extend. You can do animals is equal to animals plus and add the new elements jackal and kangaroo. I'm testing my ability to recall animals right now. So animals is equal to animals plus jackal, comma, kangaroo. What would happen? You can see that jackal and kangaroo are also appended. So this plus is kind of a shortcut of extend. We could have even done something of this kind. So with a list, you can also use plus is equal to, isn't this really cool? I'll say plus is equal to lion and monkey. What does animals have now? Cool, isn't it? Animals now has cat, elephant, fish, giraffe, I mean, F-I-S-H as well, because we tried to extend with fish, and we also have the other elements which are present in here. One of the important things that you need to always remember in Python is there is no restriction on what you can have in a list. So I can easily say animals.append 10. What would happen? When I say animals, it would have a value of 10. So there is no type restrictions. In a list, you can have values of any type. In this video, we looked at a few puzzles related to lists. We started with looking at the basic operations and we looked at the difference between extend and append. We saw that extend is used to add a list of elements to a list and append is used to add a specific one element to a list. We also looked at the fact that plus and plus is equal to our shortcuts to the extend method. We also looked at the difference between remove method as well as the del. Remove is used to remove an element with a value whereas del is used to remove an element at a specific index. We saw that the fact that almost all the methods on the list throw an error if you use an index out of the range. The last thing which we looked at was the fact that lists can hold elements of multiple types. So in a list of strings, I can add an integer or of a specific class of any choice. Until the next video, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will look at one of my favorite features on lists in Python. It's called list slicing. It's a really powerful feature which can help you to break lists into different kinds of values without a lot of code. Let's look at what it is with a simple example. I'm creating a simple list called numbers. It has strings from zero to nine. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. That's it. It has how many elements? Length of numbers, right? How many? 10, right? So if I want to find out what is the second element or what is the element at index two, numbers of two, right? Oops, numbers of two. So it gives you two back. The same syntax you use to do this can be used to get 
a subset of elements from this list. How do we do that? Let's say I want to get elements from index 2 to index 6. What do we get back? 2 to 5. This is exclusive. So index 6 is not included. So it's 2, 3, 4 and 5. Those are the values you get back. This feature that we are using in here is called list slicing. There are multiple ways in which you can use list slicing. For example, if I don't really want to specify the starting element, that means the default will be 0. So what would it get? It would get elements up to index 6. So 0 to 5, that's what you would see in here. Now, if let's say I don't want to specify the ending index, but I'll specify the starting index. What would it get? Yep, you're right. It starts from index 3 up to the end of the list. So you can slice and dice the list in whichever way you would want. Is this not sufficient? Let's make it even more powerful. What we can even do is to specify, I would want to start from index one. I would want to go up to index eight, but I only want to get every second element. What does it do? It starts with index one and it gets every second element, one, three, five and seven. You see how powerful it is? You can even say I would want to get every third element only starting from index one. What does it do? One, four, seven. It starts with index one, goes to four, skips two more elements, goes to seven and returns them back. Now, if you would want to actually do this across the list and I would want to start from element zero and get every third element, colon colon 3. What does it do? It starts with 0 here and then gets every third element. So 0, 3. 3 plus 3, 6. 6 plus 3, 9. Isn't this awesome? You can also use slicing to access the list in a reverse order. So numbers colon colon minus 1. Same list. However, this time in the reverse order. You can see when I say colon colon minus 3, it starts from the right side, fetches element, every third element from the right side. A lot of programmers from other languages struggle with slicing because when they first see this syntax, numbers colon 6, what is it doing? Numbers 3 colon, what is it doing? 1 is to 8 is to 2. Oh my god, <laughs> Python should be some weird language. That's what they would think. But once you understand slicing very well, then it makes your code much, 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 much more simpler. It's, it makes the code much easier to read. Does the magic end here? Nope, the magic does not end here. Actually, you can use slicing to even delete elements from a list. So let's say I would want to delete all the elements starting from index three. I can say del numbers of three. Two. So it deletes all the elements starting with index three. Let's see what would happen numbers it only has two elements let's reinitialize let's say i do delete numbers in the middle of the list starting from index five to seven what would happen let's print numbers aha uh -huh. five and six are thrown off thing to remember is seven here is exclusive so index seven is not included however the first one five is inclusive so five 6, so 7 is not really included. Let's reinitialize the list again. Let's reinitialize numbers. And another important thing that you can do with slicing is you can even replace values in the list using slicing. So I can say, I would want to replace values from index 3 to 5 with their corresponding numbers. So I would want to replace 3 with 3 and 4 with 4. So when I say 3 to 5, we are talking about two elements, three and four, right? So let's make it bigger. So three to seven. So we are talking about three, four, five, and six. So let's replace three, four, five, and six with their corresponding numeric values, three, four, five, and six. What would happen? Numbers. You can see that three is replaced with number three, four is replaced with four. So these values are replaced with their corresponding numeric values. Slicing is very powerful. And in this video, we looked at how you can use slicing to retrieve values from a list, how you can use slicing to delete values from a list, and how you can use slicing to update values in a list.
when you are coming from other languages to python slicing is one of the important things that you need to understand very well i hope you are having a lot of fun i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back we have been talking about different features of list continuously in the last few videos and there are still a few more videos to come and that's the number of features that list have in python in this video let's focus on a few simple pieces of code to sort to reverse and also a few other tips related to looping around a list using an index let's get started with initializing the numbers again so we initialize numbers to have 0 to 9 so that we have something to play with the first thing that we we'll look at is reversing the list numbers dot reverse isn't that easy what does it do it reverses the existing list so numbers dot reverse is a in place reverse that means it is modifying the existing list directly however if you'd want to loop the list in a reverse way let's reinitialize numbers again so that we have the original one back so numbers has 0 to 9 however if you want to actually not use the in place reverse but you would want access the elements in a reverse order then you can use something called reversed reversed of numbers this would actually give you an iterator which would help you to access the elements in a reverse way for example i can do for number in reversed of numbers print number so it accesses the elements in a reverse way what is the difference between reverse and reversed reverse does a in place reverse so the original list gets reversed however whenever you want to just access the elements of the list in a reverse way we can use reversed of numbers which returns a iterator so this is the way we can loop the list in a reverse way let's print numbers again so that we have it here and what we want to do now is talk about sorting so let's say i would want to sort this list how can i do that numbers dot sort as simple as that what would happen numbers because this array contains string values they are arranged in the alphabetical order you can see that 8 e f g h i j k nothing is there n o then we jump to s t and z isn't that cool so numbers dot sort actually does a in place sort the original array is sorted let's initialize numbers again if i would want to actually not do a in place sort but i want to access elements in a sorted order what i can do is for numbers in sorted sorted is another function so sorted of numbers i can access the numbers in a sorted way print of number what would happen we, we are accessing the elements in a sorted way but if you see the numbers itself would still remain as it is so it would contain the original list but over here when we do for numbers in sorted of numbers we are accessing the list in a sorted way the original list is not really changed by sorted so what is the difference between sort and sorted sorted returns an iterator which you can use to loop around the elements in a sorted way however the original list is not affected however if i do a sort the original list is changed to have sorted values another interesting feature in sorted is you can pass in a key to use so if you know of a function which you can execute on this and you can use that as a key to sort the array so i'm passing in ln length so length of each of the string is how many characters are present so if i pass a key of length then we would be accessing the elements in the increasing order of their length so let's see what would happen print numbers what is happening we are accessing the elements in the increasing order of length so one has three characters two has three characters six has three characters after that elements with four characters and five characters now the other interesting feature of the sorted method is key is equal to length and also you can do something called reverse 
is equal to true. So I would want to actually access in the reverse order of length. What would happen? You are right. So it starts printing elements in the reverse order of the length. So it starts with 5, 4 and 3. These are really powerful things that you can do with it in here. Over here in the key, you can use a lambda expression as well. If you look at it when we talk about functional programming, where you can actually have a function which you would custom define and put it in here and it would lead to powerful code. Thing is, all this stuff which we are using in sorted can also be used on the numbers.sort function. So you can say numbers.sort and pass in key is equal to length. As we discussed earlier, sort is a in place sort. So it would use the length function and sort the numbers. So you would see that numbers are now sorted in the increasing order of the number of characters. You can also sort in the reverse order as well. You can say key is equal to length, reverse is equal to true. And what would numbers have? It's now in the reverse order of the number of characters. Five characters first, four characters next, and three characters thereafter. Similar to sorted, over here also, you can use a lambda expression in place of the key, which we would discuss when we talk about functional programming a little later. In this step, we focused on two important features, sort versus sorted and reverse versus reversed. We saw that the basic methods on the list directly does a in place change. So if I call numbers.sort or numbers.reverse, then the original list gets affected. However, sorted and reversed are Written iterators which do not change the original list. We also looked at the fact that we can pass in a key to the sorted, indicating how we would want to sort it. What is the criteria based on we, we would want to sort? And we can also pass in a parameter called reverse to indicate that we would want to sort in a reverse order. This is a lot of stuff we learned in this specific step. I would recommend you to revise this stuff again and I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this step, we would look at the features which list provides where it can act as a stack and a queue. First of all, what is a stack and what is a queue? A stack is typically called last in, first out. So if I insert elements in the order 1, 2, 3 and 4, then if I want to take out the elements from a stack, the first one which will come out is 4. The next one is 3, next one is 2, and next one is 1. So it's called a last in, first out. A queue, as we all know, is first in, first out. So if I insert elements in this order, and if I want to take an element out of the queue, I would need to get one out first. How can we use a list as a stack or a queue? Let's look at it right now. Let's start with a stack. Let's create a simple list. So let's say numbers is equal to an empty thing. So I would insert numbers dot append one, numbers dot append two, numbers dot append three, and numbers dot append four. The way you can use a list as a stack is by saying numbers dot pop. This would return four. One of the important things about the pop method is it retrieves the last element as well as the important thing, it deletes it as well. So if you look at numbers right now, 4 is removed from the list. If I do a numbers.pop again, 3 comes out. And if you do numbers, it's 1, 2. Now I can add numbers.append if I would want to add a new one. Let's say I would want to add 10. And if I do numbers.pop again, what would come out first? Last in, first out. So the last element in was 10. So the first one which comes out is 10. And if I see numbers now, mm -hmm, 1 comma 2, because 10 is popped out. So this is how you can use a list as a stack. So you can use the append to insert and pop to take the element out of the stack. Now let's reassign the numbers to empty. And let's now look at how to use this list as a queue. I can add in four elements 
one first two next three next and four next what you need to do is to do numbers dot pop zero what would it do it would pop the zeroth element so it returns one first and now if you look at numbers it would only have two three four if you do numbers dot pop again it's returning two back and if you look at numbers now there are only three and four so the elements which came in first are the ones which go out first this is basically a queue so you can add new element the same way 10 and if you do a numbers dot pop zero again it removes the elements which came first three and if you do pop zero four and pop zero again 10 if you do numbers it's right now empty so this is how you can either use a list as a tag or a queue later in this course we would look at a more efficient way of implementing a queue with python the pop zero works but it can be much more efficient and we would look at something called a dq at a later point in this course in this step we looked at how to use a list as a stack or a queue i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at using custom classes inside a list let's create a new class i'll call this new python file control n and i would say country and let's create a class country so country and i'd want to have a constructor in here def underscore underscore in it and i would want to have a country name i would have population and the area i can do self dot name is equal to name self dot population is equal to population and self dot area is equal to area and i can create a list of countries right it should be very simple let's make sure i fix the colon here how do i create a list of countries i can say countries is equal to list of i can create country instances in here as simple as this country of india let's say population we are having it in millions so it's 1200 millions and let's say it's having 100000 square kilometers of area actually it might be much much bigger than this i'm just taking a few examples in here now i'll put other countries as well in here let's say china and let's say the population is 1400 million and let's say the area is double that of india and you have usa which has much lesser population let's say it's 120 million but it has a little bit more area the numbers are not really important all that we are trying to do is create a array cut 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 what we are trying to do is we are trying to create a list of countries let's print countries oops and see what would happen one country okay you can see that what is being printed in here is a list of countries but we are not able to actually see the values one of the things you can do in python to see the representation of the object is to create a method called representation so i can say representation of self so once you override this method when you print something then the return value from this method is printed in here what we want to return is representation of self dot name self dot population and self dot area one thing you need to be cautious about is we would want to return a tuple so you'd want to actually include this within two parentheses we'll talk about tuples a little later for now don't worry about it but if we want to create a representation then we would need to pass in a tuple just like we use this to create a list we can use parentheses to create a tuple don't worry about the details for now for now let's make sure that you have two open parenthesis and two close parenthesis and you can run this right now you can see now 
that all the values in the list are being printed. Now, you can access values from this by using an index, right? What does countries of zero print? Let's see, what does it print? It prints India. Countries of zero to one, what we are doing here is slicing, right? So we can see that it prints the zero and one is exclusive. So zero to two would print two, right? So India and China. So we are able to do retrieve a value. We are able to do slicing. You'd want to actually append. You can do that as well, countries.append. You can actually do a country and append a country as well. So you can say Russia, even lesser population, and even furthermore area. You would, Now, if you look at countries, it would print four countries. In this step, we looked at how to create lists using custom classes in Python. In the next step, we would look at how to sort and manipulate this specific list. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we created a country class and created a list of countries. In this step, let's focus on trying to find the country with the maximum population, country with the maximum area, minimum area. We want to sort the list in a specific order and all that kind of fun stuff. Now, what we want to do is sort the countries, right? Can I do this? Countries dot sort. What would happen? Let's run this. Mm -hmm. You see an error. It says its operation is not supported between instances of country and country. The problem that we have in here is how does Python know to compare one country with another? If the values were numbers or if they were strings, then Python knows how to compare them. But the values in the list are belonging to a specific class and Python has no way of defining how to sort the values. One of the first things that we will try and do is fix this. Earlier when we created this class, we created it with strings as population and area. And that's not good, right? So these are numeric values. Let's have them as numerals. So let's fix that quickly. Same goes for Russia as well. That's cool. Now we have this. And if you run the program right now, the output does not really change. Still, sort is not supported because we are asking it to sort countries and Python has no way of knowing how to sort them, right? Now, we would want to define how to sort them. We would want to be able to say key is equal to and say sort it using the population or sort it using the area. And to be able to do that, we would want to be able to get the attribute value of population. How do we get the attribute value for population? Python provides a way for that as well. One of the things is for this, we need to import a specific module. The name of the module is operator. So I'll say from operator, import attribute getter. And now I can use this attribute getter method to get the value of a specific attribute and sort based on it. Let's say I would want to sort based on population. So I can say population. One of the things that we need to be careful about is let's continue to use just single quotes. So I'll change these countries to use single quotes as well. Typically, by default, it's a good practice to use single quotes in Python. So let's do that. So single quotes population. Now, what do you think will be the output if I run it? Mm -hmm. Countries are sorted in the increasing order of population. You can see 80, 120, 1200, and 1400. What? How can I sort them in the reverse order? In the decreasing order, I can say reverse is equal to true. Now, I can use max, min, and all the other stuff using the same approach. So I can say max of countries, and I can pass in a key of the same thing. So I can say, I would want to find the country with the maximum population. What would it print? What do you think it would print? China. China is the country with the maximum population. If you'd want to find the country with the minimum population, you can do that as well. If you want to find the country 
with maximum minimum area change this to area that's it maximum area max of area now you can see now that it shows everything so the country with maximum population is china minimum population is russia minimum area is india maximum area is russia i mean we are just comparing the four countries that we have it does not really mean india is the one with the least area or russia has the least population there are countries with lesser population and area than these countries as well over here we looked at how python makes it very easy to do all the kind of manipulations that we typically do on list with one line of code we are doing a lot of stuff in here i would recommend you to play around with a lot of other classes create instances of them and try to play around with them try to do a max min try and use slicing and try and create representations of it i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back this will be the last video before we would move into the next data structure i know we have been playing with lists a lot and the last thing which we'll be talking about is list comprehension why do we need list comprehension great question let's get back to the numbers example and we have numbers 0 to 9 with the spellings from 0 to 9 now what i want to find from here is i want to take all the elements which are of length 4 i want to create a new list with that how can i do that think about it how can i create a new list with elements that are of length 4 one of the things i can do is numbers length 4 is equal to empty array right and i can now loop around the numbers for number in numbers i can say if length of number is equal to is equal to 4 then what do we want to do add it to numbers underscore length 4 so i can say Numbers underscore length four dot append number. Cool. What would be the output? Numbers underscore length four. Okay, we get all the things with length four. But we had to write a lot of code to get this going. We had to initialize it, and then we had to append, write a lot of code to do this. List comprehension allows you to do this. in a much simpler way if i use limp list comprehension the way i can write the same code is numbers length 4 is equal to i can say within square brackets number for number in numbers this is exactly the same so for numbers in numbers is exactly the same as what we have in here so what we are saying is for numbers for numbers in numbers what would happen so it would loop around the numbers and create a, the same list again you can see if i print numbers length 4 this is the same list as numbers let's try something else length 4 i would say length of number for number in numbers what would happen what do you think will happen you can see that a new list is created with the lengths of these numbers So numbers length four now contains four three three five four four three five five four. So it contains the number of elements which are present. Let's say I would want to create a new list with upper case. What can I do? I can do something like number dot upper. What would be the result? Aha! Uh -huh. Everything in upper case. Let's get back to the problem that we wanted to do. So we wanted to do this. We wanted to get the original number, but we only wanted to get the ones which are of length 4 how do we do that we can add a if condition number for number in numbers if if what this condition right length of number is equal to is equal to 4 isn't that cool you can see that now numbers length 4 contains 0 4 5 and 9 the same code that we had in here now we can write it in a single line and this statement which is present in here is called list comprehension in python now let's create another list values 
is equal to 3, 6, 9, 1, 4, 15. And in a list, we can have duplicates as well. So I might have 6 twice, 3 also twice. So we have values present in here. From this, I would want to create another list with even numbers only. So I would want to create another list, values underscore even, from this list with only the even numbers from here. How can you do that with list comprehension? You can pause the video in here and try it as an exercise. Okay, let's look at the solution now. So it's very simple, number for number, let's call it value, right? So value for value in values, if value mod two, we want even numbers is equal to zero. So what would values even have now? Let's type it in, values even, six, four, six. Those are the only even numbers which are present in here. You can do values odd as well. So I can say value mod two is equal to one. And what I would need to do? I need to change this to odd. What would happen if I print values odd? It would print the odd numbers. So I would recommend you to create multiple lists and try different kind of stuff with list comprehension. And I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Until now, we had been talking about the data structure list. List can contain duplicates. So if we create a list of numbers is equal to, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, it can contain duplicates, right? So it can contain the same value twice. List is more based on the index. So list is like element at 0 is 1, element at index 1 is 2. So list is more a positional thing. It keeps things in positions and you can add things at the end or in between. In list, position is given the utmost importance. The other data structure that we'll be talking about now is called a set. A set, on the other hand, does not contain duplicate. So if I create a numbers set out of this thing, how can I create a number set out of this? I can say set of numbers. Set is a method and I can call set of numbers and create a number set. What would this have? As you can see, number set does not have any duplicates. That's the major difference between a list and the set. In a set, you will not have duplicates at all. The way you can add elements to a number set is very simple. Number set dot add. Let's say I'm adding the same element. What would happen? It will be only present once. If I add a new element, what would happen? It would be added to the list. Let's say I want to add zero. You can see that it contains zero, one, two, three, four. So in a set, you cannot have duplicates. The way you remove elements is exactly the same. So you can say remove zero. So what happens? Zero is removed out. One of the important things about a set is it does not support access by using an index. So you cannot say numbers of zero, number set of zero and try to access the element because a set does not support indexing. If you want to have a unique set of values, then you would go and use a set. The way you can check if an element is in a set or not, you can say one in number set. Is it present? True. You can say five in number set, it returns false. All the typical operations that you can perform on a list, like min, for example, min of number set, that's allowed. You can do max or you can do sum or you can do a length. All these kind of operations, which are on all the elements together, you can do it on a set as well. In addition to these operations, in a set, you can perform operations like intersection, union, and disjoint. Let's create a couple of sets. So let's, I will say numbers one to five set. So I'll create a set with numbers one to five. How can I create a set with numbers one to five? I can say set of range one to six. What does it contain now? One to five. And I can create another set with numbers from 4 to 10. So I'm creating another set with numbers from 4 to 10. So how can I create it? 4 to 
11. So now numbers 4 to 10 set contains 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is what is present in numbers 1 to 5 set. So now if I do numbers 1 to 5 set plus numbers 4 to 10 set, what would happen? It says unsupported operation. If you want to do a union of these two sets, the way you can do that is by putting in a pipe symbol. The pipe symbol does a union of both the sets. So it combines both the sets and finds the unique elements in them. So it returns 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10. Now, if you want to find the intersection between these two sets, how can I do that? And it returns elements which are present in both the sets, 4 and 5. So 4 and 5 is present in this set as well as in the 4 to 10 set. The other operation you can do is subtraction. So you can try and do minus and this would return the elements in this set but not present in this set. So elements 1, 2, 3 are the ones which are present in this set but not present in this set. You can do the reverse as well. So if you want you can actually subtract number 4 to 10 set minus numbers 1 to 5 set. And this would return the elements which are there in this set and not in this set. So what we are looking at is set. A set does not allow duplicates and it allows all the operations that are typical for sets, right? Subtraction, you can do a union, you can do a, a intersection. And we looked at how to find the min, max, length. You can calculate the sum of elements in a set. We also looked at the fact that set does not support indexing. Whenever you come across a scenario, where order of the elements is not important, the index of the elements is not important, but you want the elements to be unique. In that kind of a situation, you would go for a set. In set, all elements are unique and we will not be able to track elements by their index. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at another interesting data structure in Python. It's called a dictionary and it's represented by the class DICT. Dictionary represents key value pairs. What does that mean? Let's see how to create a simple dictionary. Let's create a dictionary called occurrences is equal to DICT of A occurred five times, B occurred six times, and C occurred eight times. I have to actually separate them by commas. So let's separate them by commas. And now, if you type in occurrences, you'd see what is a dictionary. So dictionary is basically a key value pair. So you have a number of key value pairs stored in the dictionary. So typically, let's say I have a sentence and I would want to find out how many times each character occurred in that sentence. In those kind of situations, I can use a dictionary. I can say A occurred 10 times, B occurred 15 times, C occurred 25 times. If you are familiar with Java, then this is like hash map. It stores key and value. The key can be any object and the value can be any object as well. In this example, we have the key as string and the value as a integer. When I do a type of occurrences, you can see the data structure beneath this. This is something called DICT. That is the class which is underneath the dictionary. A dictionary allows us to access values using a key. I can say occurrences of D is equal to 15. So number of occurrences of D is 15. You can compare this to a list where the index we used was a number in a list Always the index was a number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. However, in a dictionary, the index can be anything. Index can be any object. Over here, we are using string as an index. Now, if you see occurrences, what does it contain? It, it contains the new value for D. You can also update the value for D as saying 10. You can also try and retrieve the value in the same way. You can do occurrences of D, it would print 10. One of the things you should be cautious if you try and get a value which is not present, this would throw a key error. Instead of that, a better way without throwing an exception would be get. So get D, this is a type safe way. So if I do get E, it is not there, it returns none. So that's why it's not really printed. This is a type safe way of getting the value of a key. You can also add a default. So 
you can say occurrences dot get e and if it's not present return 10 back so it returns 10 back however if you'd see occurrences it would still have only the four values so this is kind of the default so if this is not present in the dictionary then return this value back there are a number of useful methods which are present in a dictionary let's look at some of them right occurrences dot keys returns the keys that are used in the dictionary occurrences dot values returns all the values that are present inside the dictionary occurrences dot items returns the values in the format of a tuple we will talk about tuples a little later this is returning a list of tuples each tuple has key as the first element and value as the second element you can loop around all the items by using this way so you can say key value in occurrences dot items and you can say print formatted string of key space value and this would print all the values which are present in the dictionary you can also delete a specific occurrence so you can either say occurrences dot occurrences of a is equal to zero this would set the occurrences for a to zero or if you'd want to completely delete the occurrence a you can say occurrences of a so the keyword is del delete occurrences of a and when you do occurrences you'd see that a is completely removed from the dictionary we saw that dictionaries are used to store key value pairs we saw how it can be used to store occurrences of a specific characters in words and we looked at how to add values how to remove values from a dictionary and we also looked at the varieties of ways you can loop around the values in a dictionary i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's do a simple exercise with a dictionary i have a simple string here this is an awesome occasion this has never happened before right this is your first time learning python hopefully this has never happened before i would want to do two things one how many times is each word present in the string two i would want to find out how many times each character is present in this string so those are the two things i would want to find out and i would recommend you to use pycharm i mean use the ide and try and solve this as an exercise okay let's look at the solution right now so let's copy the string let's go to pycharm and let's create our new python class actually our new python file i should say i'll call this word count we'll write a very simple script let's not really worry about object oriented stuff in here what we have is a string right now i would want to find out how many times each letter is present in here let's start with that so how can i loop around the string for char in str i can say print char what does this do this is very simple right i just missed a colon so let's run this and this would print all letters inside this string so we are looping around it one by one what we want to do is we would want to add it to a dictionary dictionary is the proper data structure to use because we can store okay this character has occurred this many times so we can have a key value pair so the key can be the character and value can be how many times it is present let's initialize a dictionary so how can i initialize a dictionary character occurrences is equal to empty dictionary typically open brace close brace represents a dictionary if you remember what represents a list square brackets represents a list what we would want to do is for each character in the str we would want to increase its occurrence by one if it's not present already we would want to use zero as the default value so how can i find if it's present so i can do a get the get and use char so this returns how many times this is present but the problem with this is if it's not present then it returns none back i would want to set a default zero so this is where i can set a default so this returns how many times a character is present in the char occurrences until now i would want to increment it by one and i would want to set it into the char occurrences char occurrences of char is equal to 
characteristics dot get char of zero plus one. So what this does? It checks that character how many times is present. If it's not present, then it returns zero. So the value which would be set would be zero plus one one. The second time you find the character, you will get one back, and you will add one to it, and you will get it to two. So let's see what would happen. Let's now instead of printing char, I will print char occurrences. Be careful with the indentation. So this there is no indentation here. This is part of the for loop. So let's run this again. Now you can see how many times each character is present inside this string. So you can see that there is a list of things which are being printed. T is present twice, H is present four times, I four, and so on and so forth. You can pause the video in here and try and do the words as an exercise. It should be a simple thing, right? It should be very similar to char occurrences instead of the fact that. We have to call this word occurrences. Word occurrences, word occurrences, word occurrences, word occurrences, and let's call this for word in str. Let's replace this by word first. Okay, I replaced everywhere with word. And over here, we don't want to use the str. If we use the str, we'll get each characters. I would want to get the words from the string. How can I do? I can use this split function, right? So I can use the split function to get each word. And now let's see what would happen. You can see how many times each word is present printed out to the console. This was a simple exercise to show how dictionaries are typically used to store key value pairs. I hope this was an interesting exercise, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video on data structures, we will look at a number of puzzles. Related to sets, we'll also look at puzzles related to lists and dictionary. Now, I want to create a simple list which has the squares of the first ten numbers. How do I do that? The simplest way to do that in Python would be to use list comprehension. I'll say squares first ten numbers is equal to, and I can say for i in range 1 to 11 we want to get the first 10 numbers so i'll say for i in range 1 to 11 what do we want to collect is this squares for i star i for i in range 1 to level isn't it interesting so if i do a type of squares of first 10 numbers what would it print it prints list so this is a list that we are creating so this is list comprehension the thing is Whatever we are doing with the list comprehension, you can also do it with a set. Let's create a set. How do we create a set in the same way? So I would want to create a set with the same values. Squares of first ten numbers is equal to. If I want to create a set, I can say set of. Let's rename this to underscore set. Set of squares of first ten numbers. That I can do. That's one way of doing it. The other way I can do that is by using set. Comprehension. So it's similar to list comprehension, you can use set comprehension. So the way you can use set comprehension is by putting it in braces. Here we use square brackets. Here we are using what we are using in here braces. And now I say i star i for i in range one to eleven. Now if I do a type of squares, first ten numbers, set. What would be the type? It's of a type. Set. When we are doing list comprehension, square brackets denote lists. Braces denote set. The braces can actually denote two things. It can either denote a set because here I am returning one value back. If you are actually returning a key value pair back, so here let's change this to set to I'll say to dictionary. And over here, what I'll do is do i colon i star i. So what we are doing in here is within braces, I am putting i colon i star i. What do you think will happen now? Let's do a type of squares of first ten numbers and dictionary. What do you think will be printed? It's of a type dictionary. Let's see what values are present in it. Squares first ten numbers dictionary. What values are present? One one. So key is one, value is one. Key is two, value is four. So the thing which we are seeing is the list comprehension in its same form can be used for set as well as for a dictionary as well. For list 
it's square brackets for a set and the dictionary it's a brace so if you can if you can use curly braces then it becomes either a set it would become a set if you are giving one value it would become a dictionary if you are passing in a key and a value pair key colon value becomes a dictionary now let's do a simple thing i'll do a check of an empty list so i'm doing type of empty list type of this curly braces what do you think will return it's a dictionary by default an empty thing is a dictionary if you want to create an empty set the way you can create it by calling the set function so this would be an empty set so this is of type set the other way you can create a set is by actually having an element so as soon as you put open brace close brace and in that include an element it would be of type set however if you actually make it a key value pair if you say a is present five times within curly braces what type would it be it would be of type dictionary these are all pretty nuanced kind of things but these are powerful things you need to understand fully to make complete use of the power of python i think understanding all the things that we are discussing in this specific video are key to making great use of all the data structures that are present in python the only data structure that we did not discuss until now is something called a tuple tuple is represented by a parenthesis close parenthesis this is what is called tuple and in tuple you can have any number of values so over here i am creating a tuple with three values the important thing you need to remember is parenthesis represents tuples square brackets represents list curly braces might either be a set or a dictionary if the curly braces does not contain anything it's a dictionary if the curly braces contain a set of elements it's a set if a curly braces contains key value pairs then it's a dictionary make sure that you understand every one of this in depth try and do this exercise multiple times and make sure that you remind yourself of all this stuff and i'll see you in the next section until then welcome back in this quick tip we would be looking at another interesting data type in python called the tuple now what is a tuple when do you use it and how is it different from a list let's look at it right now let's define a simple method let's say def i'll call this create ranga and let's return ranga comma let's say the date of birth as well as the country hmm is this really allowed yep we are returning multiple values from this method so in a single statement we are returning three different values back now let's see what does it create let's take it in a variable called ranga and say create ranga what's the type of ranga it's of type tuple tuple is nothing but a set of values which are separated by comma now let's say i want to take ranga and assign his values to three different variables let's see what to do name year comma country is equal to ranga what would happen let's see so what what's in ranga it's a tuple it's represented by a open parenthesis a close parenthesis that's what python uses to represent a tuple if i look at name ranga year 1981 country aha uh -huh, india so what is happening in here is when we return multiple values we are creating a tuple and that's being returned back and ranga is of type tuple what we are doing in here is called destructing we are taking a tuple and we are assigning the values from the tuple to three different variables name comma year comma country is equal to ranga and you can see that name year and country are assigned the right values the thing is on the tuple you can do a number of operations for example i can do a len length of ranga what does it return 
I can say rung of, so you can use an index to retrieve the values, rung of 1, rung of 2. That's allowed as well. Now, let's try and change a value. So, I'm saying rung of 1, rung is not born in 1981. I would want to reduce my age. It does not allow you to do that. Because a tuple is, by definition, immutable. The values in a tuple cannot change. So, once you create a tuple, it's immutable. And for that reason, in certain situations, tuples might be more efficient to use than a list. Now, the main difference between list and tuple is typically a list is a number of values. So, a list of numbers. But a tuple is a set of attributes of a specific thing. Here, I am storing a person and his related attributes. So, a tuple typically stores details about a specific thing. And a list stores a number of things. So, that's how you do things typically. But certain places where the values in a list do not change. So, if you have a static list, it might be good to represent it as a tuple because tuple is much more efficient. Accessing values from tuple is much more efficient than accessing values from a list. Let's now look at a few simple tips regarding usage of tuples. So, over here, we saw that we actually return multiple values from the method and that's how we created the tuple. But uh, easier way of creating a tuple would have been to directly initialize the values here, right? So, I can say person is equal to and say ranga comma 5 comma India. This is the easiest way. You can also create the same thing by not even having the parentheses around it. So, if you look at the type of person, it would remain tuple. And once you have a tuple, you can assign it to a set of variables. So, you can say things like name, comma, age, comma, country is equal to person. We looked at that already. What would happen if I have lesser number of variables in here? Obviously, it would throw an error. One interesting thing that a tuple helps us to do is to make swap very, very simple. Let's say I have two values, x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1. You can assign it even in a simpler way. You can say x comma y is equal to 0 comma 1. This is a funky way of assigning values. The interesting part comes where I can do a thing like x comma y is equal to y comma x. So, this creates a tuple with the values of y and x at this point in time. So, the tuple which would be created is 1 comma 0 and that would be assigned and destructed again. So, x becomes 1 and y becomes 0. So, if you print the value of x now, it's 1 and y is 0. So, the values referred by x and y are swapped. Another interesting tip is related to how do you create a tuple with one element. Right? So, if I say x is equal to 0, what would happen? What will be the type of x? It's of class int. Right? How do you create a tuple with just one value? The way you can do that is by putting a comma. So, you can do x is equal to 1 comma and it's actually of type tuple. This is typically an interesting piece of code for people who would come from other languages. They would be worrying, oh, what does it really mean? In Python, this stands for a tuple. In this quick tip video, we looked at tuples. We started with creating a simple method which returns multiple values. We saw that the type of the return value when I take it into a variable is of type tuple. And we saw destructing a couple where we took a tuple and created three variables based on the values of it. We also looked at the fact that tuple supports simple indexing. So, rung of 1, 2 and 3. We saw that tuple helps us to do things like swap very, very easily. At the end, we looked at an interesting syntax to create a tuple with one element. I'll see you in the next tip. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this section on object-oriented programming continued. In an earlier section, we understood the basics of object-oriented programming. In this section, we will focus on more advanced stuff related to object-oriented programming. 
we'll talk about object composition we would talk about inheritance we would talk about abstract classes and we'll talk about how you can design your classes very well in this first step we will revise the things which we learned earlier we will revise the concepts of class object state and behavior as we said earlier a class is a template so this motorbike class here is a template for all the objects of the motorbike class so here honda is a object or an instance ducati is an object or an instance of the motorbike class this motorbike instance honda has a specific state at this point it has a value for speed as 50 state of an object is represented by its properties by its member variables here speed is a property speed is a member variable and we change the state of an object through the behavior of an object the behavior is typically represented through methods here we have increased speed decreased speed as the methods to change the state of the object we saw that the state of the object can change during the duration of the program at specific time the state might be something little later in the program this state might be something else and at the end of the program the state might be something else so these are all the basic things that we have learned in the previous section i'll see you in the next step where we will try and design a simple class until then bye bye welcome back in the previous video we talked about a few important questions that you need to ask when you are talking about your classes right so the first one is what is the state that means what are the member variables you need to have and the second one is how do you want to allow creation of a specific object that is what are the constructors that you would want to allow third one is what is the behavior you would want to allow that's basically the member methods let's consider an example right a ceiling fan the fan here is not really a fan of a actor actress or a director what we are talking about is a ceiling fan which gives you a little bit of wind, right that's the fan we are talking about so for this fan class you can think about what are the different elements that represent the state of a specific fan object you can think about how you want to allow construction of a fan object and you can also think about the behavior what kind of changes you'd want to allow in the state of a fan class you can pause the video in here i have left out a few clues in here about how i think about it now i would recommend you to pause the video in here and also think about how you represent the state what are the different constructors you would want to have and what are the different behaviors that you would want to allow you can pause the video here okay let's start with the solution right so i said over here i said the state i am looking at is make radius color ease on and speed so basically what we are doing in here is we are saying this is the manufacturer this is the radius of a wing of a fan and this is the color of the fan and this is whether it's on or off and if it's on or what is the speed so those are the different things that are important to represent the state but you might be thinking of a wide range of other stuff as well now let's try and represent the fan class in our code what i'll do is i'll start creating a new project for this so what i'll do is i'll say file new project and i'll call this oops advanced and say create and i'll say open in new window and add to currently open projects so we are creating a new project oops advanced and over here it takes a little while to create the setup and stuff hopefully it's ready very soon yep here we go we have it ready and now i can go ahead and create a new python file i would want to call this fan and okay and let's now start thinking about this right so we said these are all the important things let me comment this out so these are the different things that make up the state of the fan class and these are i think the important things from a behavior one of the important things that you need to take care of when you are designing the behavior of a class is think about the consumers think about who is going to use your class think about how they would like to see it i think when we talk about a fan the typical behavior is to be able to switch it on switch it off and also to be able to increase the speed and decrease the speed as well so these are i think the typical behavior that might be expected 
by consumers who are going to use our APIs. Even when you're not really designing classes to be consumed by others, maybe consumed by yourself, even then I would recommend you to think about what kind of behavior you would want. Try and get a outside in perspective. Try and look at it from outside and look at how you'd want to design your class. All that theory aside, Python is all about getting things done as fast as possible. So try and keep this analysis to a bare minimum. Okay, enough talk and let's get down to business. We want to create a class called fan. That's what we wanted to start off with. And let's create the constructor first, right? So when we are creating a fan, all that we would be able to decide is what is the make, what is the radius and what is the color, right? So our constructor will represent that as well. So let's do that def underscore underscore in oops, in it. And over here, I would want to pass in make radius color and let's do self dot make is equal to make self dot radius is equal to radius and self dot color is equal to color. We have our constructor ready. Make sure we have a colon in here and now I'm ready to create an instance of the fan. So I'll do a print fan and pass the arguments that would be needed to create it. Let's say the manufacturer one and let's say the radius is five centimeters and the color is green. Let's run this and see what happens. Cool, it's printing the object, but it's cooler to print the representation of the object. So let's define the method representation as well. Representation of self and I would say return representation of inside that we have to create a tuple and over here I would need to return self dot make self dot radius self dot color let's run this okay cool manufacturer one five and green that's cool now one of the things that we can also do in the in it is set the initial state for the other things right so we want to so wanted to represent speed and whether it's on or off I can set the initial state for them as well. So I can say self dot speed, initial speed is zero and self dot is on. Initially it's off, right? So it's false. So in the representation also let's include that in. So self dot speed and self dot is on. Now if I run this right now, you'd see manufacturer one, five, green, zero and false. Now, let's go ahead and represent the behavior that we wanted to have for this specific class. Behavior we wanted to have are these four methods, right? Switch on, switch off, and the other stuff. So, def switch on. What do you want to do? We would want to say self dot is on is equal to true. One of the things is once fan is switched on, we would also need to set this state. This is kind of the business logic, right? So you, we are setting the fan to true and we are setting a default speed of three. What we'll do now is we will actually do a refactor, right click, refactor and extract variable. This is one of the refactorings you can do, extract variable and I'll give it a name of fan. So the object name is fan and before printing it, what I want to do is I would want to say fan dot switch on. So by default at the start, the fan is off. Now, after switching on, what would be the state? Let's see what would be the result. So you can see that now speed is three and it's on is true. Let's go ahead and define another function, switch off, right? So switch off, what we would need to do is on is equal to false. In, other, in addition to that, we would want to set the state to zero. So let's call this function and check if it's working fine. Fan dot switch off. Let's run this. Okay, cool. At this point, speed was three and switch on is true. And at this point, line 44, it's zero and false. Now, I'll leave it as an exercise to implement the increase speed and the decrease speed methods. It should be very easy. All that you need to do is increment the speed and decrement the speed variables. In this step, we wanted to give a perspective on how you design your classes. What we think about is what are the different elements that make the state of the object and think about what is the behavior you'd want to expose. Thinking outside in, 
always helps because that would lead to better design. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, we want to do a simple exercise on object composition. Now, first of all, what is object composition? Until now, we stored simple elements inside our object, right? So, ID is a number, name is a string, author is a string. The thing is, in a class, I can use instances of other classes as well. Earlier, we used instances of the predefined classes in Python. In this step, we will create a custom class called review. And in the book class, we will use a list of reviews. And this is called object composition. An object consists of instances of other objects. This is very typically used in object-oriented programming. The kind of programs that we would want to be able to do are what is shown on the screen right now. We would want to be able to say, create a book, and we would want to be able to add reviews of this kind. We would want to be able to say, book, book is equal to this book. And we would want to be able to say, book dot add review, add review, and so on and so forth. And at the end, we'll try and print the content of the book with details of the book and its reviews. I would recommend you to think about it, try and pause the video in here, and try and think how you would do this. Let's look at the solution, right? Go to PyCharm and create a new class. Let's create a new Python file, and I'll call this book reviews. And say OK. I'll copy the code in. Let's comment it out for now, and let's get started. So first, we would want to create a book class. That's basically what we would want to do. We would want to have a constructor in here, right? So let's have a constructor. So underscore underscore def underscore underscore init self. And we would want to have an ID. We would want to have a name and author. So this is easy part. So self dot ID is equal to ID. Self dot name is equal to name. And self dot author is equal to author. Cool. We have a book defined. And over here, what we would want to be able to do is add reviews to it. So you would want to have reviews also as part of the book. One thing I can do at the start is initialize reviews to a empty list. So initially, there are no reviews, right? And also, I'll define the representation so that we can see what is the content. So I'll return inside that a tuple and self.id, comma, self.name, self.author, and self.reviews. Isn't it cool? Leave a new line. One of the things we need to do is we need to create the representation of this. So return representation of this, and that should be cool. This would help us to see the content when we print the book, right? So let's now create the instance of the book. Let's uncomment this line, which was present in here. So we have the book created now. And let's print the book as well. Right click. Run book reviews. Cool. We are able to see the content of the book, but the reviews are still empty. Now, how do we add reviews? Before we are able to add reviews, we need to have a class called review. In Python, you can have multiple classes in the same file. So I'm defining the review class in here. So I would say def. We would want to be able to initialize reviews as well, right? How do you want to initialize reviews? I'll say init self you want to be able to give it an review id and also we have description and we have a rating and we can say self dot id is equal to id self dot description oops there's a spelling mistake description is equal to description and self dot rating is equal to rating cool right we have the constructor ready and now I can define the representation as well so that when we print the review, we would be able to see something good, right? So self and return representation of a tuple with self.id, self.description, comma, self.rating. 
Now, we have two individual classes ready, right? So we have two individual classes. One of the things you would be seeing is the IDE PyCharm is checking against die guidelines and it says expected two blank lines but found one. There's a Python standard called PEP. It defines how you should write your classes, how you should write your Python code. And according to the guideline, if you are ending the definition of a class, then you need to have two empty lines after that. And right now, we only had one, so I'm leaving another one. That's cool. It's great that the ID is doing that. The other important thing is let's use single quotes. So that's another thing which is typically checked. So now we can create reviews as well. Let's create a review. I'll call this review one is equal to review of this. And let's try and print it as well. Print review one. Right now there is no relationship between the books and the reviews, but that's okay. We'll take things one by one. And now you can see the book and the review, but they are not tied together yet. So how do we tie together the book to the review? We need to add the add review method, right? So let's add this in, add review, and we would want to be able to add a review. So I'll call this review and say self dot reviews. What should I do? Dot append. And what do we want to append? The review which was passed in. Now let's see how to add the review in. I can say book dot add review, review one. What would happen if I run this now? Cool. You can see that now among the reviews that are present in here is the review for the book. So we created two classes and now this book class contains a review of the type review. Let's add another review as well. This time let's not really create a temporary variable and use whatever we had earlier. I need to add a parenthesis to fix the error and Let's not really print the review anymore. So now let's run this and you'd see that there are two reviews printed in this list. So for this book, we have added in two reviews. So this is how we do object oriented design. For this book, now part of the book is the reviews as well. So along with the ID name and author, this book contains a list of reviews. One of the things I can do is this variable is present only once. So I can even refactor and do something called inline. What happens is the value of that variable would be replaced wherever it is used. So let's do a inline and you can see that book.addReview review is directly created in here. In this step, we created a book class, we created a review class and we added behavior to the book class so that we can add reviews to the book. The relationship between book and review is called composition. Book composes of instances of reviews. In the next step, we would look at another relationship called inheritance. Until the next step, bye bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at why we need inheritance. We would consider a simple example involving an animal and a pet and understand why inheritance is needed. Let's create a simple class called animal and let's say there is a simple method called bark in here. So it's doing a bark, right? Simple bark, <laughs> nothing very big. It just prints bark, mm -hmm. simple animal, right? So if I do animal is equal to animal, I can do animal dot bark, right? Oops. One of the things which we are missing is self, right? We need to have a self there, self, and print back. Now, if I create the animal again and do animal.bark, what would happen? It prints bark. Let's say I would want to create a class called pet, and I would want the pet to be able to both bark, and also I would want to be able to groom the pet. Pet class, what I would want to do is I'd want to be able to say def bark self print and bark right and def groom self print 
groom so on the pet i want two different behaviors bark and groom on the animal right of the only behavior which is present is bark when i create a pet instance i would be able to do a pet dot bark and pet dot groom the thing which you can look at in here is i am unnecessarily repeating the behavior of bark in both animal and pet why can't i inherit the behavior from the animal that's where inheritance comes in so instead of defining the behavior again in the pet class can i reuse the behavior from the animal class let's see how can how we can do that the way we can do that is by saying class pet of animal so class pet and within parenthesis put in animal that's it as simple as that and now i can do def i don't need to define the method which is already present inside animal i just need to say groom self print groom now let's try and create the pet again i'd be obviously do, able to do a groom on the pet right so i can do pet dot groom but the interesting thing is i would be able to even do pet dot bark even though pet does not contain bark it inherits the behavior from the animal class inheritance allows you to inherit behavior and also the properties of the super class this animal class here is called a super class and pet is called a sub class the sub class inherits the behavior and the data behavior and the properties of the super class so we would be able to do pet dot groom pet dot bark and if animal contained any data for example if you want to give a nickname to the animal pet also would inherit it inheritance is a powerful concept one of the most important things to understand is use inheritance only when there is a is a relationship this pet is an animal so only because there is a is a relationship between pet and the animal i'm using inheritance in here a lot of times people tend to misuse or abuse inheritance by using it in situations where there is no is a relationship and that can lead to problems so make sure that whenever you are using an inheritance whenever you are trying to reuse some code there is a is a relationship between both the classes i'll see you in the next step where we will try and create a little more complex relationship and try to establish inheritance between those classes until then bye bye welcome back in this step let's look at an important fact related to inheritance even though we did not inherit from any class in here the book class does not have anything between parentheses that means it's not really inheriting from anything is that right actually that's not right all classes in python extend from a class called object if you look at this repr method the representation method inside the book class that we created earlier there is a small sign on the left hand side if you hover over it it says overrides method in object why is it overriding method in object because by default if you don't put anything in here it is actually as if you are overriding something called object object is a predefined class in python if you click over here in the ide it would take you to the object class you can see that there is a empty definition for the representation class by default you would see that there are a lot of other things that are defined as part of the object class by default all python classes unless you specify a class in here inherit from object that's something you need to remember and we will look at more about it in the subsequent videos until the next step bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at an interesting feature which is supported by python it's called multiple inheritance it basically means a single class can inherit from multiple classes let's create a simple example and check it out i'm creating a new python file i'll call this amphibian 
what we'll do is we'll create two classes right so what the first class that we will create is land animal let's create an empty class for enough and we'll also create another class called water animal and i'll create an empty class in python you can have classes which can extend multiple classes so i can say amphibian is both a water animal and a land animal and i can go ahead and now try and create instances of amphibian so if you'd see this you'd see that there'd be instances of amphibian classes that are created i can do right click run amphibian and you'd see that there is an amphibian or object which is being created what we are doing in here is called multiple inheritance the amphibian class is inheriting from water animal and the land animal so if these classes have any methods then the amphibian class will also inherit from that let's look at a simple example what we'll do now is we'll create a simple constructor in each of these classes so i'll say def underscore underscore in it first thing we'll do is we'll delegate to the superclass constructor so i'll do underscore in it and let's say the land animal has something called a walking speed so i'll say self dot walking speed is equal to five kilometers per hour let's say that's the thing which we put in here and in the water animal also we'll have additional behavior let's say over here instead of walking speed in a water animal it's swimming speed right so let's call it swimming speed and let's say these guys swim faster these are very fast swimmers so let's say 10 kilometers per hour and now when we create instance of the amphibian class let's i click refactor and extract a variable let's take it into a variable and let's call this amphibian and what we'll print is amphibian dot swimming speed and amphibian dot walking speed before doing that let's also create a constructor in the amphibian as well so now we have constructors in each of these three classes which are delegating to one another so amphibian we are saying super so this would call the super class constructors and same is the case with land animals and the water animals that's cool let's run this right now you'd see that it's printing both swimming speed and walking speed so what's happening in here is amphibian is getting attributes of both the land animal and the water animal if i had methods in the land animal then i would be able to call them as well so for example if i had a method def increase walking speed and say how much and say self dot walking speed plus is equal to how much and let's say we have similar method in the water animal increase swimming speed and swimming speed is equal to how much so we now have methods to increase the default swimming speed and the walking speed and i can inv invoke those methods on the amphibian class so i can say increase swimming speed and pass in let's say 25 and i would want to increase the walking speed these are super animals so they are extremely fast so let's now run this and see what would be the output you can see that the values are increased so what we looked at right now is the fact that in python you can have multiple inheritance we saw how you can inherit from two classes and we saw that this specific amphibian class inherits both the data both the properties and the behavior from the super classes i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this step let's look at an important feature in related to object oriented programming called abstract class we'll understand how you can create abstract classes and also try and understand where you can use abstract classes let's start with creating a new python file 
I'll call this animal and say OK. While you're programming, there are certain scenarios in which you'd want to be able to create abstract classes. What do I mean by an abstract class? Let's say I have a class called animal. Let's say it's an empty class. Typically, I'll be able to create instances of these classes, right? So if I do a print of animal, it would create an instance and print. The same thing happens if I define a method in here as well. So let's say I'm defining a method called bark and let's say I'm creating an empty method. What would happen now if I run this? Same output, right? Nothing changes. In object-oriented programming, there might be certain situations where I don't know what the code inside this method should be. But I want my subclasses to define how this method should behave. There might be situations where I don't know what code to put in here. When I'm creating an animal, I might not know how to bark. And I would want to leave the definition of the method to subclasses. In those kind of situations, we go for something called a abstract class. So we will say we want to create an abstract class and we would want to say this is a abstract method. We would want to be able to say this is abstract method. The way we can define an abstract method is by adding a specific annotation and extending a specific class. So we would need to make this class extend a specific class and add an annotation on the abstract methods. These annotations and the class is defined in a module called ABC. So what I'll do first is I would import those things in. So I'll import ABC and that is abstract base class. ABC stands for abstract base class. And I would also import in abstract method. So what we'll do in here is we'll extend ABC class and we would add a decorator, a decorator by the name abstract method. So what happens now is when we try to create an instance of the abstract animal, let's see what would be happening. It says cannot instantiate abstract class. Now let's say there is another class which is present. So let's say I'm creating a class dog which is extending abstract animal and it's let's say an empty class. Do you think I'll be able to create an instance of the dog? Let's run it. Nope. It says cannot instantiate abstract class dog because a dog is not defining the method. What dog can do is it can go ahead and define the method. It can say print wow wow. So what abstract class and allows us to do is we say, okay, every animal should bark. But when I'm creating the class, I don't know what the bark should be. So what we are telling our subclasses is you define how to bark. And what happens in here when I do a print dog? Now I'm able to create the instance. And also you'd be able to see that I would be able to call the bark method on it. So this would print bow bow. What we saw in this specific step are the basics related to abstract classes. In the next step, we will look at another example of an abstract class. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we looked at the basics of abstract class. In this step, let's look at a real world example of how you can use an abstract class. I'll create a new Python file. So let's create a new Python file and I'll call this recipe say okay typically whenever we cook something there are typically three steps involved first one is to prepare right so you'd want to make sure that you have all the raw materials ready and you'd want to make sure that you have clean vessels the dishes are done and ready for use the second one is to execute the recipe right so you'd want to make sure that you follow the instructions do this stuff and the last step is to do a cleanup. Make sure that you garnish, probably you'd want to make sure that you put it in the proper vessels and things like that. These are three steps that you would need to do whenever you do a recipe. Let's say now you are creating a class to represent a recipe and you would want to make sure that each of the subclasses follow these three things. How do we do that? 
one of the solutions that we can use is to use a abstract class let's import the abstract class stuff so from abc import abc comma abstract method now let's create the class abstract recipe and we would want to ensure that it extends abc abstract base class and we would want to create a method in here what we would want to call as def execute so execute is executing the entire thing doing the prepare doing recipe and doing cleanup what we can do is self dot prepare self dot recipe and self dot cleanup however this is just the abstract class so we don't really know what the exact preparation is the exact preparation depends on the specific thing that we are actually doing let me fix a typo in here so it's abstract recipe and so what we would do is we would make prepare recipe and cleanup abstract methods how do we make it abstract methods you would add a decorator called abstract method and we would say def prepare is pass and let's do the same thing for the other methods so what we are saying is we don't know what are the steps which are involved in the preparation we don't know what are the steps involved in the recipe we don't know what are the steps involved in cleanup but we would want to ensure that these three steps are defined by all the subclasses and when we execute something we would want to follow these three steps in order what we are defining is the algorithm and we are leaving the implementation of individual steps to the subclasses this design pattern is also called a template method design pattern what we are doing is we are preparing a template method we are saying this is the template we would want to execute however the steps can be defined by the individual subclasses go ahead and now try to create an instance of the abstract recipe would that be allowed what would you get obviously cannot instantiate an abstract recipe because it contains abstract methods right so we would want to create a real recipe let's say what we can do is we can say recipe one and i want to extend the abstract recipe class and over here i can define these three methods so let's go ahead and define them so these are no longer abstract methods and i can define instead of doing a pass so i would want to say print do the dishes so as part of the preparation i would do the dishes and get raw materials and the recipe let's just say we execute it print execute these steps oops i did not remove the pass that's why it's complaining and now clean up i would want to really leave it empty for now so what would happen if i do recipe one i create an instance of it and dot execute what would happen it says do the dishes get raw materials execute these steps so what we are doing in here is the abstract recipe acts as a template this execute method acts as a template it ensures that all the subclasses follow these steps we have a preparation step we have a recipe step and we have a cleanup step it ensures that all the subclasses follow them and create definitions for those methods and the execute method would execute all of them we can create another example let's say we would want to create a microwave recipe so a recipe where a microwave is involved so let's say the first one is to get raw materials do the dishes get raw materials and the third step is switch on microwave the recipe remains the same and during the cleanup what i'll do is i'll do a switch off microwave now i'll try and create an instance of the microwave recipe let's leave a new line in here and run this you can see that now the recipe is executed according to the 
code which we wrote in the microwave recipe. So do the dishes, get raw materials, switch on the microwave. After that, execute the steps and then switch off the microwave. Abstract method play a key role in defining a template method and making sure that all the subclass methods define all the abstract methods. This is a very good example of a design pattern which depends on abstract classes. This design pattern is also called the template method because we are defining a template method which is followed by all the subclasses. In this step, we looked at an example of an abstract class and how it is really useful in designing your code. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this section, we looked at a wide variety of object-oriented concepts. We started with devising the basic concepts that we learned earlier, class, objects, behavior, state, and how state changes during the course of an object-oriented program. And then we created a couple of simple object-oriented programming examples. We designed a fan class with specific state and also behavior. After that, we looked at object composition. We created a book class having a number of reviews. We looked at inheritance. We created multiple examples of inheritance. And we looked at an example of multiple inheritance as well. Inheritance helps us to design a class hierarchy and reuse properties from the superclass. We looked at a specific type of a class called abstract class for which you will not be able to create instances. But we looked at examples where abstract classes are really useful. We looked at the template method design pattern where you define a template and leave the specific implementation details to the subclasses. We saw how abstract classes help us to implement template method design pattern. I hope you had an interesting time doing this section. I look forward to seeing you in the next section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome to this section on exception handling. In this section, let's focus on all the important things around exception handling. We'll discuss about the exception hierarchy, and how do you handle exceptions, throw exceptions, and things like that. In this specific step, let's discuss about your thought process when you are doing exception handling. How should you think when you are doing exception handling? One of the most important things is it's not just the bad programmers who cause exceptions. Even code written by good programmers can have exceptions. Exceptions are very commonplace. Exceptions can occur because of bad code and also because your expectations on the environment were not met. Maybe you are expecting a directory to be there or a folder structure to be there, but that was not present on your deployment environment. You are expecting some configuration to be done on a database which was not done. All these could cause exceptions. For me, the most important thing is great programmers handle exceptions very well. When I write code which has an expectation, I would make sure that if that expectation was not met, then I would clearly highlight that. And that's done through proper exception handling. So what are the two keys to exception handling? For me, the most important thing, if something went wrong is in your system, you should give a good message to the end user. You should tell him what are the next steps he can take. If, let's say, your system expects a file to be there and the file was not present and because of that an exception happened, you should tell the end user, hey, the file that was expected to be present at this specific location was not there. That's the reason why the program failed. It should have a very friendly message to the user. And if the exception happened due to a programming error, the most important thing is the second key, right? You should not just gobble up the exception. You should give enough information to debug the problem. Try and make sure that enough information is logged to help the person who is going to debug the problem. These are the important 
things that you need to understand and this is the attitude that you need to take forward when we talk about exception handling. We looked at the fact that both good and bad programmers cause exceptions but the great programmers are the ones who implement exception handling properly so that there is a friendly message to the end user as well as there is enough information in the log or somewhere to debug the problem to find out what the problem is. I'll see you in the next step where we would start discussing more about exception handling. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a few pieces of code which can throw different kinds of exceptions. The first one which we'll be looking at is one by zero. What do you think will happen? Mm -hmm. It says zero division error. What we are trying to do is divide by zero. And as you know, the result of this is undefined and that's why an error is thrown zero division error so if I had a variable of i with a value of 0 and I'm saying j is equal to 10 by i what would happen zero division error earlier we looked at this one as well so 2 plus 2 we are trying to add a string 2 with a number 2 what would happen it says type error I don't know how to add a int and a string. Let's create a simple set of values. One, comma. I'm creating a list with these values. And I'm saying sum of values. What would happen? Again, the same error. What it's trying to do, this sum of values, is trying to add them up. And it says, okay, I don't know how to add int and a string. Let's now try to access a variable which is not yet defined value. What would happen? It says name error. A name value is not defined yet. Earlier, we created a list called values. So on the values, let's call property which is not really existing. So I'm trying to say values dot non-existing thing. What would happen? It throws something called list does not have an attribute non-existing. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, trying to retrieve a variable a non-existing variable from values and this throws an attribute error and the same thing happens if I'm trying to call a non-existing method so what I'm doing in here is trying to call a method and you'd see that this would also throw a attribute error so whether I'm using a non-existing variable or I'm trying to call a non-existing method I would get an attribute error zero division error type error name error attribute error all these are different kinds of exceptions that are defined in Python. If you want to see the complete list of exceptions in Python, we can import the built-in module in and we can do a help on built-ins. You'd see at the top are classes and you'd see there is a class called base exception from which exception inherits and after that is a set of errors the one which we looked at earlier is zero division error you can see that zero division error inherits from arithmetic error which inherits from exception which inherits from base exception which inherits from object so that's kind of the entire hierarchy and if you keep going down you'd see other errors as well you see assertion error and if you use the down arrow you would be able to see all the other errors which are present in Python by default. So you can see the name error present in here as well. You also have indentation error and tab error. What we looked at in this specific video is the different kinds of errors that are present in Python. We also looked at, at a high level, the hierarchy of exceptions. We will talk about this a little more in the subsequent videos. For now, let's get out of this by typing colon Q. As soon as you type Q, it would get out of it. So the way we got in was help built-ins. And if you type in Q here, it would get out of it. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's get started with understanding how to handle exceptions. Let's go to our IDE and start with creating a new project file new project 
and I would want to call this 04 exception handling and say create. I would want to open in current window and I had to currently open projects. So let's check those things up. Let's wait for the project to be set up. It should be done very quickly. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we have the project ready. And now I can create my new Python file. Control N and Python file. I would call this exception handling basics. Cool. Now, we know that 1 by 0 throws. What does it do? If I run this, just type in 1 by 0 and run this. What would happen? Yep, this would throw a zero division error. And if I click this, it would take me to the line which thrown the error. So let's say I have a variable i, which has a value of zero, and j is i by, let's say, 10 by i. Let's say this was some input I'm getting from a user. So zero is not really, think as if it's not hard coded. This is actually an input you are getting from user, what would happen when i is 0, this line would throw an exception because j is 10 by 0. So this would throw an exception. Let's try a simple line of code after this. Let's try to say print j. What do you think will happen? What will be the output of this program? Executing the line, it's saying divide by 0, but you don't see the value of j being printed. The thing about an exception is once an exception happens, the execution terminates right then and there, unless you handle the exception. In this piece of code, we are not really handling the exception at all. That's why what happens is when an exception occurs in line 2, it throws the exception out and skips the other lines in the program. So even if I had 100 lines of code right here, not, none of those would get executed. You would see that end will not be printed at all. So when an exception happens, what happens is all the subsequent lines of code are skipped. And that's really the problem. And that's why you would want to handle exceptions. These two lines of code have a probability of handling exceptions. So I would want to make sure that if an exception happens here, I would give a default value to J. How can I do that? That's where the try block comes in. I can type in try colon. You would see that there's a problem in here because now you need to indent this. So I'll indent this code. And now I would be able to handle the exception. How do I handle the exception? The way you can handle the exception is by typing in something called except. So except, so the syntax is very simple. Try colon, except colon. What we are saying is, this piece of code might throw an exception. And if it does throw an exception, initialize j to 0. So do this code with j as 0. Let's see what would happen. Mm -hmm. What is the value of j being printed? It's being printed as 0. And you would see that end also is printed. So what we are doing in here is handling the exception. We are saying, OK, there's a chance that this code throws an exception. So if it throws an exception, then I would want to assign a default value to J. In this quick video, we looked at the basics of exception handling. We learned that if an exception is not handled, then the subsequent lines of code are not executed. What we did was we used a try block to write our code, which might throw an exception. And we created an except block to say what should happen if an exception is thrown. At the end, we saw that we were able to handle the exception and continue with the code as expected. We will dig deeper into this example in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we created a simple example. We saw that this line of code is creating a divide by zero exception and therefore we put an except block to handle and assign a default value and print this stuff in this video let's dig deeper and try to learn more 
about the try except block. One of the first things I realized at the end of last video was I created the exception handling basics in a different project. So let me fix that first. So I'll move it to exception handling package and let's say OK. And now we have the exception handling basics in here. And when I run it, what would happen? You know, it, it would print zero and end because that's what we told it to do. Let's now have a print exception in here. What would happen now? It would say exception zero and n. Now, what would happen if the exception did not have pen? Let's say I had a value of one or two. What would happen? You can see that exception is not really printed. J is having a value of five and n is printed. So that's your first lesson. The important thing is except the code in except block is executed only when there is an exception. If there is no exception in this piece of code, then flow directly goes to the subsequent lines. So after three, four, you'd go to nine and 10. If there is an exception in this piece of code, only then execution goes to line six and seven. That's lesson number one for this specific step. Now, what we'll do here is we'll create a simple list. List is equal to our favorite example, one comma one, right? So let's call this values. Values is equal to one comma one, and we would want to do a sum of values. What would happen? Mm -hmm. It throws an exception. What exception would, it, would this throw? We know that already, right? If I take this code and put it in, what exception would this throw? Values is equal to one, one, and sum of values. What would it throw? This would throw a type error. It says, I have no idea how to do an addition of an int and a string, because when we are trying to add an int and string, I have no idea. That's what Python tells by using a type error. So if you see, if you execute this piece of code right now, what do you think will be the output? These lines are not throwing an exception. What would happen? Yep, the same output. What would happen is this line would throw an exception. So execution goes in here, we print exception and j is equal to zero and print j and print n. You might be thinking, what if I would want to handle these two exceptions differently? I would want to be able to say this one, I'd want to handle and assign a different value to j. And if a divide by zero exception happens, then I would want to do something different. How do I do that? That's where you can start specifying what kind of exceptions you would want to handle. You can say in except type error. So I would only want to handle type errors and I would say print type error. What would this do? What this does is it would only handle type errors. And if a type error happens, it prints type error, assigns a value of zero to J and the code continues execution as expected. If a divide by zero exception happens, what do you think will happen? Aha, what's happening here is the exception is getting thrown out. The exception is not handled, it's getting thrown out. So these two lines of code is not getting executed at all. What is happening in here is a divide by zero, a zero division error is happening. So this piece of code, line number four, if you click this, it would take you there. Line number four is throwing a zero division error. And if a zero division error happens, it is thrown out. But this block says, okay, I only know how to handle type error. I don't know how to handle zero division error. So it says, don't ask me, I have no idea how to handle it. So basically throws the exception out. There is no exception handling defined. So what happens? The exception gets thrown to the output and the process finishes with a failure. You can see that exit code is one. What would happen if this is one? The exit code of the pro process is zero because the program ends properly. Even though type error is thrown, we are handling it. Therefore, the process finishes with an exit code of zero. That's a proper exit. However, if I have i is equal to zero, what's happening? This code is throwing an exception, but we don't have an exception block to handle that. What happens? The exception gets thrown to the outside world. And this process finishes with an exit code one, which is a failure. 
how can I handle this also? The way I can handle that is by defining another except block. So you can have multiple except blocks. So I can say except, what's the error? You have it here, zero division error. So if it's a zero division error, I would want to print zero division error. And let's say the value of j I would want to assign is zero. Let's say when it's type error, I'll give it a value of 10. And when it's zero division error, it's given a value of zero. So what would happen now? It prints a value of zero. What would happen if I had a value of one? This line gets executed, this line gets ex executed, this line gets executed. But this line would throw a type error. And let's run it. Cool. Now it's saying type error. J has a value of 10 and n. In this step, we looked at two basic things. We saw that if no exception happens, then the code in except is not really executed. So if I change the code right now to say values is equal to 1 comma 2, then this will not throw a type error and this will not throw a zero division error as well. So this code inside the try does not throw an error at all. So what would happen? All this code in here gets skipped. Let's see what would happen. All this code gets skipped. Type error or zero division error do not get printed and we go directly to the last lines of code. The second thing which we learned is we can handle specific errors. So if I say accept type error, then I would only handle type errors. If I say accept div zero division error, then we would be only handling zero division errors. So you can have specific exception blocks tailored to handle specific exceptions. I'll see you in the next video where we'll talk a lot more about exception handling. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this video where we will be talking about a number of puzzles related to exception handling. We learned a little bit about exception handling in the previous videos and we will test it in this specific video. Now, let's start with a very basic example. So this is the code you are seeing right now. So try 10 by 0, accept type error, accept 0 division error, print end. What will be the output for this? Think about it. Let's run it. Cool. The output is 0 division error and end because this would throw a 0 division error. This is where it gets handled. So 0 division error gets print and end is printed and you can see that the exit code is successful exit right so it's properly exiting the program now let's look at the next one comment and comment now i would want to do 10 by 0 here i'm saying object you know that object is the super class of all the classes right so can i put object in here and say zero division error what do you think will happen let's try it you see that it throws an error catching classes that do not inherit from base exception is not really allowed. So what the exception says, catching classes that do not inherit from base exception is not allowed. So even though object is a valid class, you cannot catch with it. You can only catch those classes which inherit from base exception. I've imported the built-ins and I'm doing a help built-ins as we did earlier. And you can see the hierarchy, right? So base exception inherits from object. So only those classes which inherit from base exception, you would be able to handle. And one of them is exception. So you can either handle base exception or exception or any of the things which is under exceptions. Now let's comment this and let's uncomment the next puzzle. So over here, we are handling base exception. So this is throwing divide by zero error and handling base exception. What do you think will happen? It says base exception and end. What happens is this is throwing a divide by zero error, right? So this is throwing a zero, zero division error. And you'd see that zero division error is under arithmetic error, which is under exception, which is under base exception. So you can either catch this or this or this or this if you catch any of those four you would see that the exception gets caught one of the things you are already noticing in here is the ide says two broad exception clause 
generally you should not handle too broad a clause you should have specific exception handling clauses for the exceptions that you would expect now let's pick up arithmetic error from here you can see that zero division error comes from arithmetic exception so if i do arithmetic exception in here what do you think will happen the exception would still be caught however if i do an overflow error right so overflow error is different from a zero division error and it's not part of its hierarchy so zero division error does not inherit from overflow error so what would happen if i do overflow error you'd see that the exit code is one we are not handling the error because zero division error is thrown this does not match so it throws the exception outside so the exception is not really handled so you should be very careful and you should understand the exception hierarchy before you try and handle exceptions now let's look at the next puzzle try 10 by 0 and over here i'm using a new syntax the thing is you can also handle multiple errors in the same block so the way you can do that is you can put a parenthesis and put the errors you would want to handle in here here i would want to handle zero division error and type error so if either of these exceptions happen you would see that this block would be able to handle it so if i run this right now it would print exception and end the same thing would be the output if i have a type error being thrown so if sum of one comma one what does it throw i'm trying to add a number with a string so what would happen it would throw a type error right so let's see what would happen mm -hmm. you can see that the same code gets executed so this exception block will be able to handle now two kinds of errors zero division error and type error the last puzzle shows how you can get the exception details so over here what we are doing is accept type error and adding in as error sometimes you would want to get the details of the error and print them out so the way you can get that is you can say as error and you can print the details out let's see what would be the output in this case you can see that the output is unsupported operator for plus int and string typically when we are debugging it's important to see more details right if somebody said print exception and you have this you don't know what exception has really happened so having specific details will help much more so here we are saying print error and it says unsupported operator type for plus intent string then probably you can look at this and figure out okay this is what the problem is instead of saying something generic it's always good to say something specific and having the error variable in here helps us to add more value to the message we are printing to the output there you go these are some of the important puzzles related to exception handling there are two new things that we have learned in this specific step one is you can handle multiple exceptions all that you need to do is put them within parentheses and you can have multiple exceptions handled the second thing we learned was you can get the error details you can get the exception details all that you need to do is accept the type of the error as your variable name and you can get the details of the exception which is thrown i hope you are having a lot of fun with exception handling and i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the previous step we looked at a few puzzles related to exception handling in this video let's look at two more important constructs that are part of the exception handling we looked at try and accept the other two things which are typically part of a try except block are else you can for now let's just print else and the last one is called finally we'll keep this example very simple for now let's see what would happen if i execute the code right now so this code is not throwing an error and this one also will not throw an error right so this is not throwing an error this is not throwing an error so the exception handling code will not be executed let's see what would happen if i run the program right now the output is else finally 10.0 and end so if an exception does not happen what we see is the code in else and finally is getting executed 
let's see a scenario where an exception happens so i'll make i is equal to 0 and let's run this now what happens zero division error finally is executed however else is not executed the important thing that you need to understand is else is executed when an exception is not thrown so if this piece of code does not throw an exception then else is executed if this piece of code throws an exception then else is not executed when an exception happens else is not executed at all now what about finally thing about finally is this piece of code is guaranteed to be executed irrespective of whether an exception happens or not so the only line of code in the whole thing which is guaranteed to be executed is the code in finally i mean there are a few exceptions when finally is not executed but for most part the code in finally is always executed whether there's an exception thrown whether there is no exception thrown whether it's handled whether it's not handled in all the scenarios finally is called so let's take an example and understand when you would use else and when you would use finally let's say i am opening a file in here so i'm let's say i'm opening a file or a resource in here one of the things with files and resources are once you open it you would want to make sure that they are definitely closed so if i'm opening the file in here the best place to put the logic for closing a file is inside finally because this piece of code would be executed irrespective of whether any exception is thrown in here let's say the th code in here is having some business logic to read and read from the resource and do variety of stuff in here what we want to do is at, irrespective of whether an exception is thrown in business logic or not we would want to make sure that this thing is executed because this is closing the resource if you don't close the resource what would happen a resource leakage would happen so if you want to do things like that finally is the best place to do that now what is the kind of logic you would typically write in an else you can use else to do operations which you would want to do when this block does not throw an exception for example if you are calculating something and the calculation is successfully done and you want to save it to the database then you can do saving to the database part in an else in this short video we looked at two other constructs as part of the try catch block else and finally else is not really frequently used but finally is used very frequently to make sure that any resources that you open are definitely closed i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at a few puzzles related to exception handling blocks so we have a try block except block and else block and finally block what are the allowed combinations that's what we would love to find out in this specific step we saw that you can have a try and you can have multiple exception blocks and over here what we have is a default exception block so if an exception happens and it does not match these two types then the default exception block is executed we have multiple except blocks and we have an else and a finally now can i have an else without having any exception blocks without handling any exception blocks can i have an else actually you cannot so you'd see that there's a compilation error it says you cannot do that and it makes sense as well right this is the same code as writing this so why do you really want to do it so you cannot have an else without having except blocks now can you have a try with just finally yes you can have a try with just finally because what happens is if this code throws an exception it's not really handled but at least this line of code gets executed let's say this line of code throws exception what happens this line of code gets executed and the exception is thrown out so if you have a resource opened and the, the business logic is throwing an error at least we can make sure that the resource is closed and then we throw the exception out so try with finally is allowed 
the two things which we learnt until now is else with just a try and no accepts is not allowed. Finally, with just a try is allowed and we already saw the fact that you can just have try with accepts either one block or multiple blocks. Any of these scenarios is allowed. In this video, we try to look at the possibilities with the try constructs. So we looked at try, accept, else and finally and saw the permutations and combinations of when what is allowed. Obviously, you cannot have any of this stuff below without a try because all this does not matter if there is no try above it, right? So there is no meaning in having all this stuff without a try. I'll see you in the next video where we'll be talking a lot more about exception handling. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we looked at how to handle exceptions. But you might be writing code which might throw exceptions as well. So how do you throw exceptions? That's what we would be focused on in this and the subsequent steps. Let's get started with creating a simple example. I will create a new Python file and I will call this currency. Let's consider a simple example, right? So when we talk about currencies, so let's say I have 20 USD and I would want to be able to add 30 USD to it. What would be the result? 50 USD. So we would want to develop a simple program which allows us to add currencies. Think of a scenario where I have to add INR 500 to USD 50. Let's say the first version of the program that we write, we don't really support this feature. In the second version, we would want to add a currency exchange and look at how to convert it and add more features. But in the first version of the program, what we want to be able to support is just adding same kinds of currencies. We don't want to support adding different kinds of currencies. And when different kinds of currencies are added in, we would want to throw an exception. Let's see how to do that in this specific step. Let's get started with defining the currency class. So class currency and let's create a simple constructor. So def underscore underscore in it. I'd want to be able to add two parameters, right? So I would want to be able to say what is the currency. For now, let's just keep it as a string and we would say amount. So how much of the currency and we'll say self dot currency is equal to currency and self dot amount is equal to amount. So that's cool. So we have the constructor ready. Let's also define a representation methods so that we would see the currency values when we print it out. Let's say return representation of, let's send a tuple in self dot currency comma self dot amount. Simple, right? Nothing complex that we are doing until now. It's all simple stuff. So now let's comment this out with a hash and let's create instances of the currency class as well. Currency of USD comma 20. I'll say value one. Let's print value one. Let's run this program and see what would be the output. Oops, I got an error because the name should have been in it. Now let's run this again. Yep, now we get an output USD 20. That's cool. So we are now able to print the create a currency with specific values, right? What we want to be able to do is we would want to be able to add a value to and let's say have 30. And I would want to be able to do value one plus value two. What do you think will be the output if I do this right now? It says unsupported type plus for currency and currency. It's saying you cannot add two currencies. How can we support adding currencies? We can do something called operator overloading, right? So you can give a new meaning for this operator for the currency class. How can I do that? It's very simple. All that you need to do is implement something called add method. So on the currency, I'm implementing a add method. So what I can do now is I can say 
what should be the result of this the parameters that come into the add method are the current object as well as the value we would want to add in so the value one let's say i'm doing value one plus value two then self would be having the value of value one other would be having the values of value two so what we can do is let's for the start assume that both of them have the same currency so i can say that the currency of the resultant object should be one of these so I, either it can be self dot currency or it can be other dot currency what should be the value value should be the addition of both of them right so self dot amount plus other dot amount so that would be the total amount so let's call this total amount and what we would want to return from here is what is the result of the addition what is the result of the addition it's a new currency object and let's use one of the types let's assume for now that these two would have the same type so let's self dot currency comma total amount now let's run this program mm -hmm. you can see what is printed usd comma 50. but one of the things that we are doing in here is we are assuming that both currencies have the same type so what would happen if i say inr comma 30 mm -hmm. it still adds them up what i would want to do in here is i would want to have a check i'd want to check if the currencies are the same if they are not i would want to throw an exception so if self dot currency is not equal to other dot currency right now we are not supporting that feature we would want to throw an exception how can i throw an exception the way you can do that in python is by saying raise and say exception and you can pass in a piece of text i'll say currencies do not match let's run this and see what would happen you can see that it throws an exception currencies do not match and you can see the complete stack list it shows this is the line which is throwing the exception you can dig in this is the specific line that is throwing the exception as well so this is how we raise exceptions in python all that you need to do is use the keyword raise create an exception and pass in currencies do not match in the next step we'll understand how to create custom exception classes in this step we reused the exception class which is already present in python in the next step we'll look at how to create a custom exception class of your own until the next step bye bye welcome back in the previous step we looked at how to raise an exception of our own in this step let's look at how to create a specific exception class just like the exception class we would want to create our own currencies do not match exception how to do that and how do you raise that that's basically what we would be focusing on in this specific step let's get started with creating a, our own class the way you can create our own exception class is very simple how do you think it is you have to create a class so let's do that currencies do not match error and for now let's have it as empty can i say raise this what do you think will happen can i replace this and can i say raise currency do not match x error what do you think will happen when i run this it says first thing it does not take any parameters so let's fix that let's say it's not taking any parameters what would happen now it says exceptions should derive from base exception so whenever you create a specific exception of your own one of the things you need to make sure it's is it's extending base exception or a subclass of base exception so let's extend exception now let's see what would happen now you'd see that we are actually throwing an error out so it's saying currencies do not match error that's cool right so that's basically how you would throw a custom error one of the things that you can do with errors is also accept a message what we can do is we can create a constructor so i'll say def underscore underscore init self comma 
let's allow passing a message and what I can do here is I can use the exception and say super dot underscore underscore init of message so whatever message is passed in we are just passing it to the super class now you can actually pass in the message instead of pa passing in currencies do not match it might be good to pass in let's say self dot currency and other dot currency so that it's much more clear why the exception happened so if you run this right now you'd see that we are throwing a currencies do not match exception with usd and inr so whoever looks at this knows that the problem is because the currencies are different and the specific currencies are also listed down here in this quick step we saw how to create a custom exception it's very simple to create a custom exception. all that you need to do is extend the exception class and what we also did is we looked at how to add a message to it all that we needed to do was add a constructor and call the super dot init taking a message as the parameter and passing it out to the super class creating custom exceptions will help us to handle them right so whoever is calling this code and using the features that we are building in here they can have a catch block with currencies do not match error that's much better than having a catch exception and trying to find out if it's really a currencies do not match error I would always recommend if you are creating exceptions try and create a custom class and try to throw it so that you can make it easier for your client to handle it i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this quick tip video we would look at how you can do mathematical calculations accurately and also look at a few important things from the math module earlier in the course we learned that the default float class is not really accurate if i do 4.5 minus 3.2 what is the value that's printed mm -hmm. it's printing 1.299998 that's not really accurate right that's where the decimal class comes in so you can create let's say a decimal value decimal of 4.5 important thing is you have to pass the value as a string you can see that it's throwing an error that's because decimal is in a specific package let's import that package in import decimal let's go one step better and let's say from decimal import directly the decimal class into the current namespace so now i would be able to use the decimal class directly and i would be able to say value 1 is equal to decimal of 4.5 and let's say value 2 is equal to decimal of 3.2 now if you see what is the value of value 1 minus value 2 you'd see that it gives you a decimal value of 1.3 this is pretty cool right so whenever you want accurate calculations it's better to go with the decimal class the built-in floats are not really accurate now let's look at another important module which is present in Python related to math so it's called math module and it has a number of things that are related to mathematics typically all the trigonometric functions are present in here you can also find out the value of math.py it's a constant and math.e all these are defined in here so if you want to do any mathematical operation like trigonometry or logarithms things like conversions to radians there's a power operator in here you can find the GCD the greatest common denominator or you also have the factorial function typically for any of these operations you would go to the math module if you want to get help on any of these functions all that you need to do is say math dot factorial and you get the help related to that so you see that it's factorial of x you can pass one parameter and it says it raises a value error if x is negative or integral i'm typing in colon q to exit and you can find out about any of the things that are present in here let's say you want to find out about math.seal what does math.seal do so it returns the smallest integer greater than or equal to x so 
let's type in colon q and get out and call math.seal with 5.5 what would be the output it returns 6 smallest integer greater than or equal to 5.5 what is this 6 now if i pass in minus 5.5 it's minus 5 so it returns the smallest integer which is greater than this when we talk about negatives minus 6 is actually less than minus 5.5 minus 5 is actually greater than minus 5.5 so it returns the smallest integer which is greater than minus 5.5 which is minus 5 similarly you can try and get help for other functions and try and try them out in this video we looked at a couple of important tips regarding mathematical functions right number one if you are doing any financial calculations do not use floats use the decimal class decimal class gives you accurate results the second thing which we looked at is using the math module if you want to do specific mathematical operations like trigonometric operations or logarithmic operations or even the basic mathematical operations like seal floor factorial and things like that until another tip that's bye from ranga at in 28 minutes i'll see you in the next step welcome back in this video let's try and understand the statistics module in python the way you can use the statistics module is just say import statistics and if you look at the statistics module there are a number of functions which are present these are related to finding statistics what is the mean what is the variance what is the median and things like that let's create a simple list and try and play around with a few of the functions which are present in the statistics class let's create a simple list of marks and let's say the marks which are present in here are 1 comma 6 comma 9 comma 23 and let's say 2 so it's a simple list of marks and I would want to find the average mark what is average called in statistics it's called mean statistics dot mean and pass in marks so what it returns is 8.2 is the mean there are other statistical functions which are present in here so let's say I would want to find out median I'm not a statistical expert but median is when you arrange the numbers what is the number which comes in the center that's called the median and over here the median is 6 if there are even number of numbers let's say there was a 7 in here and I call now statistics dot median it returns the average of the two values in between so 6 and 7 are the values in between when these are sorted so it returns the average of them 6.5 and if you want to get the higher of those you can use median high which returns 7 and you can also use median low which gives the lower of them the other interesting function is variance how much do these values really vary by 63.2 don't ask me to explain that it returns a value of 63.2 i have no idea what it is all about but the idea behind this specific tip video is to show you the statistics module and see a variety of things that you can do with the statistics module i'll see you in the next step until then bye, -bye. welcome back in one of the previous steps we understood the fact that a list can be used both as a queue and a stack but we also learned that a list by default is not the most efficient representation of a stack and a queue the most efficient representation of a stack or a queue in python is something called a dq it's a double ended queue that means you can remove values from the start or at the end very efficiently let's get a brief idea about the dq in this specific step you can create a simple queue by using dq and passing it a list so i'll have a list of values passed in i'll pass in 0 1 and 2 so this creates a simple dq from this queue i can either get values from the left or the right 
So if I want to start processing values from the right, then I can do q.pop. You can see that the value from the right comes in and you can add values as well. So I can say q.append a new value. So I can say q.append three. And if I look at the q right now, it would show zero, one and three. And you can add append more values as well. So I can say append four, append five, or you can even append at the start of the queue as well. The way you can do it is append left and you can add in, I'll say minus one. Actually, the name of the function is append left with a small L and I can do minus one. Now, if I look at the queue, minus one would be the one at the start of the queue. So with a DQ, you can either insert at the start and the end or remove values from the start and the end. This is much more efficient than the typical list when it comes to processing values at the start of the list or at the end of the list. We already looked at the queue.pop. What does it return? It returns this one. The other operation is queue.pop left which returns the first value inside the queue. In this quick step, we looked at DQ. DQ is one of the collections which is implemented in the collections module and it's very useful when we would want to have typical queue processing or kind of a stack processing. For these use cases, DQ is much more efficient than using a list. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this quick tip video, we will look at how to handle dates in Python. Let's get started with importing the module which has most of the date time functionality. It's date time. And let's say I would want to get the value of today's date. How do I do that? Date time dot date time dot today. So this, this returns the date of today. So it says 21st May 2018. Let's take this into a variable. I'll say today underscore date is equal to date time dot date time dot today. So if I do today underscore date, what would be printed? It prints the current date. The structure is very simple. It's year, month. This is the day of the month, followed by hour, minute, and second. The last thing you see in here is a microsecond value. So the, the structure is really simple. And let's say from the date, you'd want to get some information. How do I do that? So I want to get the year. So I can say to date dot year. Or if I want to get the month, or I would want to get the day. So these are different properties which are directly present inside the date class. So year, month, day. Obviously, you can also get the hour, minute, and also this second as well. So this is how you can create today's date and get information about it. How do you create a specific date? So let's say I would want to create a specific date of a specific timeline. So instead of saying today's date is equal to this, I would want to say some date is equal to, I would want to specify the specific date. How do I do that? If you want to create a date with just the year, let's say 2019 and the month, May, and let's say the date is 27th, you can do this. Then you would see that some date has the day. You can also try and create date with a very specific time. So I want to create a date with 9, 15, and 25 seconds. And if you do some date right now, it would have the time information as well. By default, if you see this, this was only initializing the date and it initializes the hour and the minutes to zero. If you want to track seconds and microseconds, then you can actually create specific instances with those values filled in. So now you'll see that we are tracking up to microseconds. 
for any date you can get the date information alone so you can say just date and it would return just the date information back or if you want just the time information back you can do that as well so this would give you only the specific time information now that we looked at some of the basic things you can do with a date we'll look at a few operations to manipulate dates let's say i have a date this is uh, currently 2019 527 right so to this i would want to add a specific number of days or weeks or things like that how can i do that that's where a concept called time delta comes into picture what i'll do is i'll make it very simple to myself so i'll say day is equal to some date so we have a day variable which contains the value of the date so to this day you can add a time delta so i can say time delta of how much you'd want to add so i would want to add 90 days so i'm adding 90 days to this oops it should have been actually date time it's not time so time delta is a thing which is defined in date time module it should have been days so day plus date time dot time delta days is equal to 90. once i do that you'd see that a new date is printed 2019 8:25. when you add 90 days to 27th may what you get is 25th august in 2019 so that's what we are doing in here one of the important things is that the original value of day is not getting modified so the original value still stays there however what we are getting is a new value it returns a new value with the change that we asked for so 27th may plus 90 days is 25th august similar to this you can add weeks as well so let's say i would want to add three weeks to a specific date so 27th may plus three weeks is 17th june you can also try and do things like adding number of hours so let's say i would want to add 48 hours what would be the value you can see 27th may plus 48 hours is 29th may in this quick video what we looked at were the basics of the date time module in python it is used to define date and time so over here we have the date component and over here we have the time component we can either create dates with specific dates or you can use a specific date to manipulate it you can add number of days number of weeks number of hours and things like that I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Methods in Python are very, very powerful. There are a variety of things that you can pass to them. In this specific step, let's focus on understanding all the different things that you can pass to a method. Normal arguments, default arguments, variable arguments, and keyword arguments. Let's create a very, very simple method. I'll call this example method. We would want to define a method. So let's start with def. And to this, we'll have different kinds of parameters. The first one, I would call mandatory parameter. The second one, I'll say it's default parameter. And the value I would give it is default. For parameters, you can assign default values in Python. So that's what we are using in here. Default parameter is equal to default. So if this parameter is not passed, the default value will be default. The third one is something called variable parameters. So variable parameters, variable arguments. So what I'll do is I'll say it's a variable parameter, but the important thing is the star before it. So I'm putting a star before it. We'll see what it means a little later. The last one is called keyword arguments and let's put a double star before this typically instead of the variable parameter these are also called args so i'll say star args so we have star args star star keyword args and we have a mandatory parameter and a default parameter defined and all that we do in this method is very simple we'll print all the values out so i'll say i'll use a formatted string and print each value so mandatory parameter and the value of the mandatory parameter let's use a triple quote so that we can actually 
print this string as is. So triple quote is very similar to double quote, except that with triple quote, you can split your text over multiple lines. So I can do something of this kind. Mandatory parameter is equal to this and things like this. So the string can be split over multiple lines if you use triple quote. What I'm doing now is I'm actually printing out all the values that are passed in. Cool, isn't it? Now, we have a simple method. Let's look at how I can call this method. The idea behind this video is to understand the, all these things which are being passed in. How can you call this method? And what gets passed to this method when it's called in different ways? So let's get started with the basic way of calling this, right? Example method, there's a mandatory parameter and all the other ones, this is a default parameter and this is variable arguments and this is keyword arguments. What would happen if I just say example method? What do you think will be the output? Run. Mm -hmm. It says missing one required positional argument. The thing is, this one is something called a positional argument. The mandatory parameter is a positional argument because this does not have a value. So you should definitely pass a value to it. So you can see that it's giving a compilation error. Now, let's say I would want to call this with a value for that. The way I can pass a value to this mandatory parameter is by saying, let's say 15. What does it do? You can see what are the values that are being passed in. So the mandatory parameter is getting a value of 15. The default parameter, because we did not pass any value in it, it's getting a value of default. The arcs is an empty. One of the things you can already see is arcs is a tuple. So that's why it's represented with parentheses. And you can see that the keyword arguments is empty as well. And you can see that this is a dictionary because it's shown with the curly braces. There is another way you can do exactly the same thing. How can I do that? The other way is to use the name of the parameter. I can say mandatory parameter is equal to 15. And what would happen is exactly the same. There's no change. It exactly is the same. So in, in Python, you can also use name of the parameter to set a value to it when you are calling it. This is called named parameters or named arguments. Let's now look at other ways of calling this method. Let's comment this out and let's call this now example method. And let's say I'm passing in 25 comma, I'm passing in 45. What would happen? You can see that the mandatory parameter is 25. The default parameter is 45. So it's not using the default anymore. It's using 45. Arcs is this and keyword arguments is this. One of the important things is Python does not really worry about the type. You can see that the default value is of a different type and the value I'm passing in is of a different type. Python does not worry about it at all. It does not worry. Unless you are doing something specific, calling a method of that specific type, the execution would be continuing without a problem. So over here, we are able to pass in 45 or you'd be able to even pass in a string. So I can say sum string and run it without a problem. So you can see default parameter is some string. Now let's get to the interesting part, right? So we want to see what's getting passed to arcs, keyword arcs. So I'm getting this a call with 25 comma string one and we'll pass a set of other strings as well. I'll say string two, string three. What will happen? What is happening now is mandatory parameter is matched against this. So 25 becomes mandatory parameter. String one is mapped against default parameter. And the string two and string three, you can see are in the args tuple. You can typically use args when you want your API consumer to be able to pass multiple values. So over here, he can either pass two values, he can pass more number of values as well, right? So let's say he wants to pass four values, string four, string five. Now you'd see that you would have arcs having four different values. So star arcs here allows you to pass any number of parameters. So you can pass the arguments 
one argument, 10 arguments, 15 arguments. They would match against this and you can use them in your method as a tuple. Take a pause here and in the next step, let's look at keyword arguments. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we started looking at this example method. We have a mandatory parameter, we have a default parameter with a default value, and we have a variable args and a keyword args. We started passing multiple values to this. We saw that when I call it with an empty method, it does not compile because mandatory parameter does not have a default value. So it says, okay, you need one argument at least. And we saw that you can also pass the mandatory parameter or any of the parameters by using mandatory parameter is equal to 15. This is what is called named parameters. After that, we looked at the fact that we can pass variable arguments. Whatever values after they match the values which are present in here. So this signature is matched against this signature. And you see that mandatory parameter matches against 25. The second one matches against the default parameter and all the other values after this get matched against arguments. So all these are passed as arguments, variable arguments, and we would be able to read them in the method as a tuple. In this step, let's focus on the last one, keyword arguments. So how do I get some keyword arguments passed in? So I'll say over here, key one is equal to, you can pass a value. So key one is equal to A. I can say key two is equal to B. Now let's see what would happen. Let's comment all this stuff out and let's run this. What is getting passed in? You can see that the arguments are string two and string three. These are matching against the arguments and these values are put into a keyword argument and sent out. What I'll do here is I'll enhance this a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll say type of all this stuff. So let's print the type of each one of the things which are being passed as well. So I'll say type of mandatory parameter, type of default parameter, type of args, and type of keyword args. Let's see what would be the type. So you can see that the mandatory parameter is of type int, default parameter string, args, is of type tuple and keyword args is of type dictionary. So this is a key value pair. This is similar to let's say a hash map in Java. So you can see that key is A and key two is B. That is what is being passed in when you are passing keyword arguments. Let's see what would happen if I don't pass in any of the variable arguments. So I'm passing nothing as a variable argument and I'm just passing the rest of this stuff. So let's comment this out. What is happening? You can see that the args is empty. However, keyword args gets populated as expected. Let's see if what would happen if I reverse stuff in here. Can I do this? You can see that it's already giving you a compilation error. You cannot do that. You need to use the named parameters to use everything. So I need to say, mandatory parameter is equal to 25 and I sh should say default parameter is equal to string one. So if you use all parameters as name, the order does not really matter. So what would happen is the same thing as earlier. However, if you don't use name parameters and you are actually depending on positional parameters, then this will not work. The order typically is the positional and the default arguments first, followed by the variable arguments, args here, followed by the keyword arguments. One of the things that I would recommend you to do is now that you have this method, try to play around with it. Try to understand the different ways of calling it. Make sure that you are trying different combinations and try and understand what is happening in the background. I think having a good understanding of what are the possibilities that you can do with your method signatures is one of the most important things to be a good Python programmer. So spend some time with this and get a good understanding of what's happening with the different kinds of parameters that you can pass. The positional parameters, default parameters, the variable arguments, 
and the keyword arguments. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. Welcome to another very useful tip about how to pass values to a method in Python. Let's say I have a simple list. So I have a list with a set of values 1, 2, 3. And I would want to use the values from this list to call this method. So I would want to pass exactly these values as the parameters to this particular method. How can I do that? One of the ways I can obviously do it by doing, let's say, list of zero. List is not really a good name because it would shadow the existing list. So let's call this example list. And let's use example list of zero or one or two. That's possible. And if I run this, what would happen? one becomes the mandatory parameter default parameter is two args is a tuple three and so on so that's what is happening but let's say there are variable this might be having four values five values or six values and i would want to pass all of them to this particular method how can i do that you can use a very concept called unpacking what we can do is you can say star example list what happens is all these values get passed as arguments, as parameters to this specific method. Let's see what would happen. You can see that the mandatory parameter is 1, default parameter is 2, and the arguments that get passed are 1, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is almost as if you're calling this method with values like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you can use this when you have all the values for your arguments directly defined in a list. Then you can use example argument star example list. Now, there might be other data structures where you might be having the values in as well, right? So let's say you have a keyword arguments that you would want to pass. They are all defined in a dictionary. So let's call it example dictionary. And let's say inside this dictionary, all the keyword arguments are specified so a has a value of one b has a value of two and so on and so forth let's use single quotes okay now if i would want to pass this to match the keyword arguments for the example method how can i do that the way i can do that is similar to example list however over here i would need to say star star example dictionary so what would happen now you can see that the keyword arguments get whatever values are present in the example dictionary so all these are passed in as the keyword arguments so each one of these are appended to the list of keyword arguments this is called unpacking and this is one of the useful features in Python. So when you have the parameter values that you would want to pass in a list or a dictionary, then you can do something of this kind. I'll see you in the next step. We would be talking about a lot more details. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this specific step, we would try and understand the Python concept of module. So I'm trying to create a new Python file, module underscore one dot py, and I'm saying OK. So this now contains a empty file. One of the things in Python is your specific code file. This is the Python file, right? So this file can contain methods. So you can directly define a method in here. So you can say, I want to create a method one over here. And let's say it just prints something. The other thing you can also do in a Python file is define classes, right? So I can say class, class A. And you can have the methods belonging to class defined in here, right? So this is class underscore method underscore one. And you can say print. You can call this class method one, right? So I can print class method one. 
So what we are doing here is defining a method, defining a class, and within the class you can define a method, or you can even call these methods directly in here. So I can say method one. I can create an instance of the class A and directly call the class method one. So all this stuff you can do in a single Python file. If you are coming from an object-oriented programming language like Java, where each class is defined in its own Java file, then you need to change how you think about it when it comes to Python. In Python, a single Python file can contain multiple classes. So the way you organize classes in Python would be to have all the things which are related. So if you have a group of classes which are related, you take them and put them in a single module. And this module also can contain methods. Now, let's see what would happen when I run this. You'd see that it's printing method one and class method one and method one. So whatever code you have directly outside the boundary of a class or a method would automatically get executed. Here, method one is getting executed. Class A dot method one is getting executed in here. Whatever we have in here is something called a module in Python. A module is nothing but a set of methods, set of classes, and all this code that you have in that specific Python file. Now, in Python, you would want to reuse one module in another. Let's see how to do that right now. So I'll, I'm going to create a new class. I'll call this Python file, and I'll call this module2.py. And over here, I'd want to start using the code from module1. How can I do that? The first thing I would need to do is import. So I can say import module one, and now I can use all the features from module one. So I can say module one dot method one, or I can say module one dot class A. I would want to create an instance of it, and on that, I would want to call the class method one. Now, if, I, if you run this, you can see that you get using the code from module one. One of the things you'd see in here is method one, class method one, method one is printed twice. Why is it being printed twice? The reason it's being printed twice is when you are importing the module one, the code which is present in here automatically gets executed. So this is something which you need to always be careful about. When you import a module from another module, if you have any code that's not within a class or a method, then that code is executed automatically. One of the things which we can do to prevent this from happening is just type in main and you can see what is getting printed. So if underscore underscore name is equal to main, then only do this. What I'll do is I'll print the value, right? So let's print underscore underscore name. So what I'm doing right now is I'm directly running the module one dot py. So if you'd see that now, it's printing main. So it's sending main. Now, what we would do now is module one is being imported into module two and I'm running module two. What is getting passed as name? you can see that the name which is getting passed in is module one. If I run this Python file directly, then the name gets a value of main. However, if I run this as part of another module, then you are getting the module name as the name. So what we are doing in here is if name is equal to is equal to main, what we are doing in here is we are saying only if this module is directly run, then print these. Otherwise, do not execute this piece of code. So what would happen now when I run this? Only the code which I directly put in here is executed. Now I can also comment this one so that this import of modules does not execute any code really. So if you run this module two right now, so it shows module method one and class method one, method one. So the important thing that you need to remember from this is a Python module file can contain any number of classes, any number of methods. Typically, what we would do is when we want to use this module in another one, we would do a import. So import module one, and I can start using everything which is present in that specific module. 
the last thing which we looked at is more of a best practice if you are creating a module and if you have some test code to test that module in directly there then put it in a if block so this would prevent the code from getting executed when you are importing the module in some other module i'll see you in the next step we would talk about other tips related to python until then bye bye welcome back in this quick video we'll be looking at how to compare objects in python let's create a simple class class student and let's say it's an empty class let's create a couple of instances of it student 1 and let's say student 2 is equal to student as well are these two two students equal how do you define that right now these classes don't really have any content as such right so if i do an id of student 1 it gives you an indication of where it is stored in memory and if i do id of student 2 you can see that it's written 768 and this is written something else and these two are different objects so these two are completely different objects so when i do something called ease ease this is one of the ways you can compare objects student 1 is student 2 what we are really comparing is where they are stored is it the same object is student 1 the same object as student 2 that's what is compares is checks if both of them are the same object if both of them are different then re this returns a false let's say student 3 is equal to student 1 what would happen now so i'm assigning student 3 the same object which is referred to by student 1 so if i do id of student 3 what would it have it would have the same id as student 1 so if i do student 1 is student 3 what do you think will be the output it's true because both of them are the same object in python you can use is equal to is equal to to check the content of an object so student 1 is equal to is equal to student 2 is typically supposed to check the content of the object so if i say student 1 is equal to is equal to student 3 this would return true is equal to is equal to student 2 this is returning false one of the things is this class does not have any content really i mean there's nothing present inside the class as of now but the default implementation of is equal to is equal to typically uses is directly so whenever you don't provide an implementation for is equal to is equal to what happens is by default is is used but sometimes you would want to provide a implementation for is equal to is equal to to check the content of the object what kind of situations let's create a simple example right now let's create the student class again but this time let's have a constructor so i'll say def underscore underscore in it underscore underscore and pass in self and comma id so i'll want to pass an id and let's say self dot id is equal to id so we are creating a simple class which can which has a constructor accepting an id so let's now update the definitions of our students i'll say student one is equal to student of one student two i'll say is student of two and i'll say student three is equal to student of one and student four is equal to student 1 if you look at these objects student 4 and student 1 are referring to the same object right so if i do id of student 1 and id of student 4 it would return the same value so student 1 is student 4 is that right yes that would return true however if i say student 1 is student 2 false student 1 is student 3 what do you think will be written false because those are different objects altogether however one of the important things that you would see here is student 1 and student 3 have the same content 
right? They have ID of one student with the ID of one. So, what do you think will happen when I say student one is equal to student three? It returns false because the default implementation of is equal to is equal to does not check the content. It is very similar to is. And if you would want is equal to is equal to to check the content, then we would need to implement it ourselves. So let's get back to the definition of the student class. And I'll define a constructor underscore init underscore self comma id colon self dot id is equal to id. In addition to this, we would want to define a method called underscore underscore equals. All these methods which are starting with underscore underscore are called under under methods or they are also called dunder methods, d-u-n-d-e-r. So let's define a dunder equals method. So the equals method takes two parameters. What is the current object? What is the other object we would want to compare against self, comma, other. And typically you would want to actually compare the type so we would want to check if type of self is equal to other or is instance of self comma super of other you might also want to check the super class instance but let's keep it very simple for now and i'll return self dot id i'm only comparing the ids so i'm returning self dot id is equal to is equal to other dot id so what would happen now let's redefine the instances student one is equal to student of one student 2 is equal to student of 2. We said student 3 is equal to student of 1. And student 4 is equal to student 1. Is student 4 and student 1 equal? They are pointing to the same object. So they are definitely equal. Is student 2 is equal to, is equal to student 1? False because they have different IDs. However, let's see if student three is equal to student one. It's written true now. Because we have now provided our own implementation of equals. This is one of the important things that you need to remember. So if you are defining a class and you'd want the equality for that class to be looking at the content of the class, then we would need to override the underscore underscore equal method we need to override the dunder eq method once you override it whenever you do a student 3 is equal to is equal to student 1 whenever you do a comparison between the objects is using is equal to is equal to the equals method would be called in this quick step we looked at how to implement a custom equals method for your classes until the next step bye bye Welcome back. In this quick tip, we would be talking about something called none. What is none? When do you use it? And what are the best practices with it? Let's look at all of them in this specific video. The way you can think about none is very similar to how you think about null in SQL. In SQL, if we say something is null, it means that it does not have a value. So whenever a column is null in a table, it means that there is no value for that specific column. Java programmers would be familiar with null as well. So when a variable, when object is null, that means it's not pointing to anything. Python, none also is very, very similar, except for the fact that none actually belongs to a specific class. So if you look at type of none, there's a specific class called none type. So none is the only instance of this specific class. Let's now look at a simple example using none. So let's create a simple method. I'll call this email. I would put a subject, content, and I would say to CC and BCC. So let's say this is the definition of an email. And let's just simply print everything out right so i'll say print f 
double quote formatted string and I'll sub print subject content to cc Oops, I pressed enter by mistake, but that's okay. So we are printing up to CC, that's cool. Now, if I do email of subject and content is great work, comma two, let's say I don't want to send it to a specific email and CC and BCC. Right over here, let's say I don't want to use CC at all. What should I do? Would this compile? Would this work? Nope. Actually, one of the things I should fix first is this should be a okay value. So you can see that email is missing two required positional arguments, CC and BCC. But I would want to be able to allow CC and BCC to be not passed. What I can do is I can assign default values to them, right? So to BCC, I can assign a default value. But what should be the default value? It should be nothing. That's where we use none. So CC is equal to none and BCC is equal to none. So we are assigning a default value. And now I can say over here, let's add the BCC as well. So BCC and we can call the email again. So now you can see that subject great work in 28 minutes at gmail.com and none and none become the values for CCC and BCC. The fact that we don't want to have CC and BCC is indicated by none. If the method signature did not indicate it, what we can also do is we can send none as a value. So we can send none as a specific value anywhere any of these things are accepted. So let's say I don't want to have a subject. What I can do is subject is none. So you can see that none is printed as part of the subject. So none basically is used to indicate that there is no content, there is nothing. Later, we will also see that when you call a get method on a dictionary and the value does not exist, then the dictionary returns back a value of none. Using none is considered to be good programming practice because we can compare variables against it. So let's say I have a variable and its value is one, two, three. You can have something, a condition defined of this kind. So you can say if where is none, you can say print do something. This statement would have been executed if where had a value of none. You can see that now do something is. So you can use none to indicate that a value is not present and the same thing can be used for a checking it in a if statement as well. In this quick tip, we looked at how you can use none. None can indicate an absence of a value. So we saw with the email example where CC can be none and BCC can also be none. One of the best practices is to avoid passing in a blank value or an empty string to indicate that something is not there. It's better to pass in explicitly none to indicate absence of something. I'll see you in the next tip. Until then, bye-bye. Congratulations. Hats off to you for completing this course on Python. I'm sure it would have been a lot of hard work and a lot of fun as well. This course was quite a long journey. If you are new to programming and this was your first programming course, then you would have learned a lot during this course. One of the most important things for you to do is to continue this learning journey. Programming is not learned in a day or a week or a year. Programming takes a number of years to master. Make sure that you continue learning 
and I'll see you in another In 28 Minutes course very soon. Good luck and bye-bye.